All right. Why don't we call to order this session? Um, I'm excited everyone's here. I uh, hope we get a chance today to really delve in and take some time we often don't have to ask questions and learn from all the experts that are going to be talking with us today. So I look forward to a, a long but fun and informative day. Um, I guess we can dump right in it, huh? You want to yes. introduce our guests? Yes. Can we, should, I think we should take roll call. You want to take roll call? Please. Let's take roll call. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Avila Frias. Mr. Schaefer for Treasurer Chung. Present. Ms. Gallagher. Here. Ms. Gunn for Dr. Ambassiani. Here. Mr. Hunter. Here. Ms. Johnson Hall. Here. Mr. Metcalf. Mr. Prince. Present. Ms. Von Cook Liebert for Secretary Podesta. Here. Ms. Sotello. Mr. Russell. Present. Mr. Gunning. Present. Mr. Alex. Ms. Onodera for Mr. Cohen. Present. Ms. Patterson. Here. We have a quorum. Should we do that in the next session? We can. Let's do it then. Okay. Yes. Let's, get, let's get into it. Let's get let's into see it. see who these distinguished gentlemen are in <laughs> front of us. <laughs> so it, it really is quite exciting. Um, we have tried to do um, policy workshop retreats for the last couple of years in preparation for our business planning and our mid-year reporting. And so it gives us an opportunity to, uh, for the board to be able to hear what's going on in the industry, hear what tr some of the national trends are, and kind of set the tone for the, uh, the next fiscal year. And so I am very, very pleased to have uh, Daryl Carter, Chairman and CEO of Avanath Capital Management with us, and Dan Dunmoyer, the President and CEO of the California Building Industry Association. And just briefly about Mr. Carter, he is the Founder and Chairman and CEO of Avanath Capital, California-based investment firm that acquires, renovates, and operates apartment properties with an emphasis on affordable and workforce communities and has 37 years of experience in the commercial real estate industry. Mr. Dunmoyer serves as President and CEO of the California Building Industry Association with a wealth of experience in both public and private sectors. As the President and CEO of CBIA, Mr. Dunmoyer oversees and manages all aspects of the association. And so the thought was is that we would get a background in industry trends on single family and home ownership and also get a background and um, industry standards and be able to have uh, uh, question our distinguished uh, guest about um, multifamily and workforce housing, since we, those are both programs that we operate here at um, the California Housing Finance Agency. So thank you to our first panel, and we can go ahead and jump right in. And did either one of you have a preference of which one would like to go first? We started with Dale. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, good morning. Uh, great to be here. Uh, first thing, I'd like to just compliment uh, uh, your executive director, who has been incredibly visible in the industry and who has really made a difference. And uh, she uh, continue, and her team, they continue to be uh, very creative and resourceful, and we've been engaged in, in various ideas. So my compliments uh, to her. Uh, and also good to see my good friend, uh, Mr. Gunning, who's had a, actually a lot to do with what we're doing. Um, <laughs> But anyway, just if we have, I have a pre short presentation that I've handed out. Uh, can we put it on the screen or? Um, uh, just to tell you a little bit about us and the first slide. We own about almost 10,000 apartment units across the country. We buy um, project-based Section 8. We buy um, uh, naturally affordable properties and we buy LIHTC properties, all with institutional capital. And we have about, um, we've done three institutional funds. Our latest one was $400 million. And uh, let's see, how do I do this? Uh, this? This is where we own, primarily on the two coasts, but a lot in um, California. Um, and again, we have, uh, uh, our last institutional fund was about $400 million. And uh, ironically, uh, one of the ways that we launched this firm, we have a number of, in Mr. Metcalf, how are you, sir? Um, we have a number of institutional investors that came out of the uh, COIN program, the California Organized Investment Network that uh, 
Michael, and I just learned that you had a little bit to do with uh, back in the day. And we have uh, TIA CREF um, Prudential and assurance, insurance companies. We also have a number of pension funds, including New York Common Fund, um, <coughs> uh, City of New York, State of Michigan, and then we have uh, what I call more impact investors like Ford Foundation and Kresge Foundation. And then we have some banks that fits in the CRA bucket. Um, but anyway, in, in the affordable and workforce space, we find that there is virtually unlimited demand for what we do. And to talk a little bit about some of the affordability challenges and, and, um, and, and the next slide, which really is, is kind of a tale of uh, the, the property on the right is one of ours, which is Castellar Apartments in downtown L.A., really close to the train station. Uh, it's 110 apartments, and we have a waiting list of over 400 people, and we had two apartments turnover last, last year. Uh, and, you know, it, it could be 500 units and it would still be full at the rent levels that, which range from 600 to 1300 a month. Um, the Emerson, which is not one of ours, is what's typically being built in downtown LA, which is, you know, which is only about the, the irony. It's about three or four blocks away from ours, and it's twenty-eight hundred to five thousand a month. Um, again, affordability. If you go to the next slide, you know, the the people often forget that the 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 when you look at we're building a lot of high-end product. Um, but the median income of a renter in the United States is 38000 a year. Uh, that's the median income. And, and so, um, you know, that, that's the challenge. Now, our business, we acquire and renovate. We do not build ground up because we think it's very difficult at the construction cost to build to, to serve to that market. Our renters generally make, uh, our, our market is 30000 to probably 70000 a year. And in places like Loudoun County, uh, Virginia, or of course even in places in California, you know, that is a, even at the higher end of that, it's challenging to find affordable rentals. Um, when you look at our, um, you know, this is kind of in, in some of the, the 10 most expensive markets, many of which are in California, uh, you can see you know, kind of the rent levels and then where we play and why um, there is considerable demand uh, in the space that we're in. Um, if you go to the next page, this is our California portfolio. And, and I highlight this. It's a little less than 3,000 units. And um, our overall occupancy, and these are 2017 statistics, were, was 99%. So it's basically turnover. You know, by the our vacancy is getting people out and, you know, and who move out and then the per we have a waiting list of uh, across our California portfolio of 7,200 people. And we're required because many of the affordability restrictions to maintain the waiting list. And as you can see, our aggregate turnover was about 14 percent. And, um, you know, and literally our vacancy is the time, sometimes there are voucher residents where uh, HUD has to inspect, and, and there may be a delay there, but we've even gotten that time frame down, and thanks to a lot of good things Mr. Metcalf did a few years ago where that time frame has been uh, shortened as well. Um, the, the four properties that are highlighted are, are properties that we have Cal HFA debt, um, and uh, we are also working on a couple of new uh, uh, potential financings and I'll get into a few ideas we have as to maybe some program things that <coughs> would make sense. If you look at the next page and what's happening in the market, and one of the things is we find that while there's a lot of discussion about the millennials, and, and candidly, there's too much in my opinion, uh, uh, you know, having a couple of kids who, uh, <laughs> who are highly entitled, but we won't go there. Um, <laughs> But the real demand that we see is larger apartments. I mean, it's a fascinating thing. Since the year 2000, we've built only 8% of the apartment units built are three bedrooms or larger. And that's where the demand is. And so we, 
um, we, we see that that's the strongest part of the demand. And most of those, and if you look across our three bedroom portfolio, and we have properties that have four bedrooms, those rarely turn over. And most of those are multi-generational families. And I always like to say, what's that um, show, um, Modern Family? But that's what our country looks like today. Our families are comprised of many configurations. They're multi-generational families. There's blended families. There's all kinds of configurations. And, but the demand is for larger apartments that are reasonably affordable. The other thing, which uh, the fastest growing segment of the apartment market, while the, there's a lot of discussion on, on millennials, are people over 50. And that, you know, generally, that's also part of the other demand for larger units is that is often the strategy for people to age in place. And, and that's the way, you know, I grew up in Detroit and we always had a grandparent that lived with us. And that was just the way that, you know, we handle senior care. Uh, and I think that trend is, is happening again. Um, the other thing is that there is, within the state, there is continued migration to more affordable areas. <coughs> I mean, one of the, we have seven communities in Sacramento, and there's just been a huge outflow of people from the Bay Area to this community. Um, you know, we, we have two community, two properties in Elk Grove Village, right close to the new Apple call center. And we see that, and we see that in places like Northeastern San Diego County, uh, Long Beach, which has just, you know, the, it was relatively affordable relative to Orange County and LA. So um, the other thing is our rent population, just like the state, is highly diverse. And it's very important as a company, we are highly diverse. Um, the other thing, which I think is a positive, much of the affordability challenges have been on the income side. And there is growth in the median income. And, you know, the one thing that we have noticed, and if you look, um, th that incomes, in fact, much of the affordability challenge has been tied to incomes and the fact that incomes were flat for many years. But we're now seeing that incomes are going up. Uh, at the lower end, and I think one of the, the when, when Walmart, for instance, there, when they went to 50%, uh, they gave all their lower paid employees a 50% increase in their hourly salary, that, picks, that pushes up the AMIs. And so when you look at the projections for area median income, um, I think that's one of the positives that's happening. Now, will that catch up to where the rents are growing? Probably not sh not sure, but there is some some positives with with incomes growing. Uh, just to talk a little bit about just quickly our strategy. One is we try to do smart rehabs, meaning that we do things that have an impact on the resident without adding more costs. One of the things that you won't see this is a before and after, uh, and one of the, one of the things that uh, we do when we renovate apartments. Um, is, for instance, those cabinets are exactly the same. We just resurface them and we put new hardware on them. Uh, and, and a lot of things like that, we put washers and dryers in the unit because they're better they're, and people will pay a little bit more rent for washers and dryers. What you won't see there, which is I have a couple of investors that will, they'll walk into one of our communities and they'll say, wow, can you get rid of that 1970s popcorn ceiling and uh, I, I always respond, everybody can afford a $300 big screen TV from Costco. They're looking at their TV. They're not looking at the ceiling. And if we have to remove it, it's $50 in rent. And most people would rather not look at their ceiling. So uh, that's one thing. The other is that, you know, in many communities, and, and you know, I thought it was interesting. There have been comments made about um, people who are getting, like, Section 8 uh, working, which uh, I, I don't know why there's a lot of commentary and I don't want to talk politics even though I'm in Sacramento, but that's happened for a while. I mean, our, our uh, voucher residents and Section 8 residents, 90% uh, of them work. Um, the only 10% that don't are either disabled or, or elderly. So that means that when parents come home, you know, they, the, the school bus pulls up and this is a community we have in Long Beach, which is one of the largest uh, uh, HAP contracts in it's a 600 unit apartment and we had over 1600 kids there and then we bought the community next to it which was 400 apartments 
And so we have a total of about 3,000 kids in this community, and there was no recreational amenities. And I said, okay, what in the heck are they going to do when they get out of school? So we have after-school programs and things like that. We built this basketball court. We have active volleyball, uh, I mean basketball, volleyball. We have a variety of activities to engage the kids. And uh, we particularly uh, love that we have a girls basketball program that uh, – focuses, you know, uh, we, we noticed that we weren't getting many young ladies, and I have a daughter who's a basketball player, so we decided to do one just for girls. So, you know, that, those are some of the things we do. And to talk, to sum it up, um, you know, we've explored a number of ideas and, and uh, with Tia specifically looking, potentially taking uh, non uh, 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 properties that are older that are not rent restricted and maybe doing a tax abatement program for affordability limits and we talked about 80 percent some places we may need 90 percent of ami but i think that's a strategy for taking some of the older stock which believe it or not is still expensive to buy um the other is you know i was a big proponent a few years ago of the tax exempt bond programs that we did in the 80s uh, and that's the great thing about, you know, when you have a lot of years in this business, you get to see things kind of but over and over again. But that was a program that, to me, worked very well. And that would be one that I would encourage everyone to kind of pull out of the shells. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, we, everything, I mean, one the, 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 we do most of our primary first mortgage financing with Fannie and Freddie. They are very efficient. And, you know, I would encourage that you continue to work on streamlining loan process and also to develop um, programs to complement Fannie and Freddie. For instance, we have a large project that is that we inherited a Fannie loan. It would be great potentially where we need more capital. It's a very low leverage loan, and we put a lot of equity capital. And it would be great if you could figure out, for instance, a, a a second mortgage or something like that or maybe buy the existing you know we have a huge prepayment penalty embedded in that so to, to, to uh, potentially add more capital and figure out places where Fannie and Freddie can't play that maybe you can step in and then you know we have been very big on doing things and, and Fannie and Freddie have created certain incentives in their financing for green uh, investment and other services that support the residents and I'd encourage you to look at that uh, but again thank it's a delight to be here and appreciate the opportunity to speak to you thank you thank you it's uh, hard to follow that that profundity <laughs> but um, I always say don't follow somebody who's more handsome and smarter I'm afraid I struck out so, so I, too, want to kick off my uh, presentation. Uh, Dan Dunmoy with the California Building Industry Association with compliments to Tia and your executive director. A little bit of my background, just because of its connection here with CalHFA, when I was uh, chief cabinet secretary for Governor Schwarzenegger, unfortunately, this organization was actually in the press and not for positive reasons. Um, the executive director at the time had the highest compensation of everybody in government within the agency forum and had the lowest production rate. And it was an embarrassment to the administration. And I'm pleased to say those are days far behind this organization now, and T is a great reason for that. And so just compliments to the governor appointing her, but also just her consistent leadership and all of you taking the time and energy to make this a priority, uh, which makes this organization successful. So just that connection point, and um, thank you for the changes you've made to you. So a little bit about uh, B um, CBIA and kind of what's going on there. I've been with the organization for three months. Um, so I'm new to the association, uh, but not new to the home building industry. My father built the first affordable housing. It wasn't called that back then in the 60s. I was about two years old. Um, but he built the first apartments in the city of Hemet. And so for those of you who don't know California in its uh, uh, intimate stages, it's about 97 miles southeast of Los Angeles. Uh, my dad uh, was born in Hollywood, which everybody, of course, has heard of, but very few people have heard of Hemet unless they go to Palm Springs and look over the mountain. On the other side of that big mountain <laughs> called Idlewild or Tockwoods is Hemet. And um, this newfangled concept, really, the city council went out and visited. They wanted to require these amazing things called sidewalks and also street lights, which Hemet didn't have back then. And um, what we found at that time, I was two, so I don't remember all these details, but my dad speaks eloquently of it, which was a lot of school teachers and law enforcement were living in motels. Um, and so that was the way you would have find a place to live and housing. And as a result of that, 
um, apartments were, were groomed there in Hemet, and uh, my father and mother and my sister and I, you know, worked on those, cleaned them, um, and it was around, you know, building a number of those and just kind of creating a different environment. So, um, but today I'm going to focus a little more on the single family side because you've heard eloquently on the multifamily and just give you some statistics and facts. Now, the one thing there's general agreement across the state, no matter who you ask and who you survey, and we do a lot of public opinion activity, is that we have a housing crisis. And uh, Governor and, and the Director over here have done a great job in bringing this issue to the forefront. There were 15 measures last year that were enacted in this space. And I'd like to say many of those are positive and many of those the Director is working to implement the uh, requirements regulatorily. Uh, but that is only a step in the right direction, but not enough for us to really address this issue. So how bad really is it? So one of the things we provide, and it's, it's not through CBI, it's through our foundation, CHF, is actually a count of permits pulled. And so when people talk about housing, and there's a lot of numbers, and the LAO put out a report that we need about 1.8 million in housing stock. Uh, McKenzie put out a report uh, saying we need 3.5 million. And um, I'm not sure which number to pick. It's probably somewhere in between those two. But just some permit numbers that I thought were interesting last year. So last year, permits pulled. So you can't build in California without a permit. On the single family housing side, um, builders, for ranging from one home to those who build 5,000, pulled 56,243 permits last year uh, for single family housing. Um, that's up from the year before 2016. Um, of 49,208. So we saw an increase of single family housing pull up about 14.3%. And all this toss out the multifamily numbers. We are seeing an, an, a greater interest and increase in pulling permits for multifamily housing. That too went up. Total multifamily housing permits pulled as far as units built um, for, I should say, facilities was 58,385. Now those are the number of units. And that was up from 51,753. So we saw a 12% increase. So I guess the good news is we are moving in the right direction, although the first two months of 2018 have shown those numbers actually going down slightly. Um, so multifamily is still pulling more unit uh, permits than single family, um, but we in California are still seeing a relatively slow based on the stated need of you know, 1.8 million, which you know, you'll hear of governor, uh, gubernatorial candidates ranging the smallest uh, gubernatorial candidates promise 200,000 homes a year. Um, the largest is uh, Mr. Newsom at 425,000. Just a little history on that point. In 1963, we built the most homes in the state of California, and that was just over 300,000. So the number of 425 has never been contemplated. And um, I, I enjoy the aspirational goals of the future governors, um, but those are going to be challenging numbers to hit no matter what the state does or how it changes its policies. So just to kind of build on some of the things my colleague here said, but on the single family side, so the average home in California, and I gave you a, some, a little fact sheet here, but um, the average basic um, home in California statewide is around 529,000. <coughs> What's amazing is pulling the LAO study of just two years ago, that number was about 100,000 less. So I mean, this is again average, and part of this is, you know, the Bay Area is just driving housing prices to stratospheric level. So as a result of that, and we are seeing housing prices move, and some of the homes that were purchased in the Bay Area, San Francisco specifically, have gone up almost a million dollars in value in the last four years. So they were purchased at a high price, but they're continuing to, to escalate. Um, just kind of building, too, on the single family side, you know, 29 percent of California households earn sufficient income to afford this median price. So in other words, you know, it's a very small percentage now that can actually afford what we refer to as the American dream. And obviously there are parts of the state where if you're making the median income, I mean, it's impossible. I think the percent in San Francisco who qualifies in making the median income is about one-tenth of one percent. So, you know, if you go out to the, my old neck of the woods in Hemet, Riverside County, and San Bernardino, it's a little more manageable. The housing prices are not at the median area, but they're still relatively high. And generally speaking, we as a state are about two and a half times higher than the, the national average for housing prices. So, and that's kind of part of our, our compelling challenge. I think a couple other things just to keep in mind, and I'm always reticent to compare with other states and being a native Californian, loving this place and, and growing up here, nobody likes to be compared to other states. And when I work for governors, they really hate that. So I'll, be, I'll say this cautionary note, but since our builders, some of our larger builders do build in pretty much every state in the nation, a couple things that I think drive the housing costs that we're still working on, working on and looking at. So I'll give you the three biggest growing states from a housing stock perspective. It's California, Texas, and Florida. And so just to kind of do a comparative analysis, I mean, the similar homes, and we build identical homes in all three states. 
So you can't say, well, you build a little different. We actually use the same standards in California, which are far more uh, strict than other states, but it's easier from an architectural design perspective to duplicate the homes. So in a suburb of Los Angeles versus a suburb of Houston versus a suburb of Orlando, or pick any of the cities in, in Florida, you're seeing a difference in housing price for the identical house. The only difference is you get more land in the other two states, and I'll ra basically ranging at 280000 to 320000 for a large home in Texas and Florida, and that same home in California is about 850000 So part of what drives that, you know, land costs and other things, but a couple key factors, and we are the only state that puts such a premium on adding fees to developers. <coughs> So our fees in California range in the low end side of about $18,000 to get a permit to build. The highest is, um, and probably makes sense, is Torrey Pines, which is the fees there are $170,000 per home. Um, so that's our range. In Texas, it's about $6,000. The high is nine, And in Florida, it's about $15,000. The high is 20, 20000 So fee component, um, just the process um, for us in California, we have a lot more process-oriented requirements. Um, you can call it CEQA. You can call it just the overall entitlement process. But the entitlement process in, in Florida and Texas takes roughly 12 months, and the process in California takes roughly, if things move smoothly, five to six years. The average for our large members right now is over 11 years. So that gives you a sense of the process of, of time and entitlement. And then the last component is just the actual cost of the materials and labor. So labor in California is about 20% more for single-family residential than the rest of the country. And uh, basically bringing in supplies and materials costs more as well. I can't fully answer why that is other than transportation costs, gasoline costs, but just looking at what we pay for a home, it still costs us more to build here, even just for raw materials. So, I mean, those are some of the key components. And from a legislative perspective, you know, our job for advocating for supply development in the state, um, to talk about re repealing CEQA, um, you don't even get Republicans to agree to do that. So, you know, for us, we're not talking about those things. Uh, this is a very, very environmentally friendly state. Um, I was part of the negotiating team that did AB 32 for Governor Schwarzenegger, and that was pr probably because I was the most scared about what could happen to the impact of the state. So I was the, the canary is what they referred to me as um, <laughs> in the coal mine. Um, but looking at some of these issues, we're not, we're not going to repeal our environmental laws. So the question is, what can we do to expedite them, create understanding, create review? Um, make sure that we can get to yes or no uh, more quickly. So what we call is regulatory certainty. So when you're building a project like Tejon Ranch, which is just uh, as you go up the, uh, the grapevine, that's a project that's still in play after 18 years of development efforts. Ninety percent of the land was granted to the state of California and the federal government in the largest land grant in the history of the world. Um, and yet, even with 90 percent of the property being uh, transferred, in a sense, to environmental protected state, we're still not seeing a single family residence built there. And so, you know, you look at, you know, it's missed meeting with the uh, assembly member from the, La the uh, Palmdale Lancaster area. He has 100,000 residents who commute. Many of those would not be required to commute if we could build in some of those areas. So that is part of our challenge. Um, that being said, I mean, steps have been taken. The legislature is very keen on the issues of dealing with building more, more housing. And uh, some of the issues are provocative and controversial. Others are kind of straightforward and just uh, positive but minor steps. So from the CBIA perspective, you know, we very much see the need for housing at all levels um, and very much would like to continue to partner with CalHFA in this space. I'll, I'll kind of conclude my comments so we can open up for questions and comments and, as I always say in politics, snide remarks, um, but give you a chance to, to, to ask us some insights. But I'll conclude by just saying that we have taken a position at CBIA that when you look at housing policy, it's all of the above strategy is what we need to do as a state. And CalHFA plays a key role in that component. Um, and as we look at it across the state, we need high-end housing. We need middle-class housing. We need entry-level housing, workforce housing, as we call it. We need to build apartments. We need to build homes. We need to build high-rises and everything in between. And um, two things that we're seeing, and this is personal for me, and my colleague here touched on it with our entitled millennials. I've got three of them. And one of them is uh, actually graduated, God bless her, she's completely off the payroll. Um, she lives in Oakland in a small place that, you know, is nowhere near what we would rent in Hemet. Um, it's an indoor-outdoor carpet, it's 100 years old. Um, she and two other women live in a place that I can pretty much stretch up my arms and touch all the sides of the wall for 2400 a month. Um, and so she's right next to BART, she's about 80 yards from BART, she takes it into San Francisco, has an amazingly high-paying job, and still finds it difficult to make ends meet. 
And that's, you know, her question to me and the question that I think we all as policy engaged people need to ask is, do we want to give our children the ability to view California as an opportunity and an option? Clearly it was for me and for my, and my parents, and that's just a question. My daughter is very, very good saver, very, very capable individual. Uh, she's got more money invested at 23 than I had at 33. But her perspective is, so I penciled this out, Dad, and at the rate I'm saving, I'll be able to buy a home when I'm 34 in this neck of the woods. I didn't have the heart to tell her that she didn't factor in the average increase of housing. <laughs> and so it's more like 41, and she's saving about 20000 a year. So, I mean, that's a dynamic that for me is compelling when people ask, why did you step into this place? One, I love California. Two, I'm passionate about housing. But three, I do want to make a difference. And it's not just for millennials, the entitled. It's also if we look at our housing stock, a lot of it is minorities. So we, you know, we partner with a lot of different coalitions, but we're finding more and more people of color even more disadvantaged in this housing space. And so we very much are partnering with a lot of social justice groups who, amazingly enough, and community groups will say, we need more developers, which in my life I never heard from social justice leaders. But I mean, that's how profound the issue is. And so in partnering with a number of different folks, we are trying to find some positive ways to bring this issue to conclusion. So with that, I'll, I'll be glad to turn it back to the chair and, and let him facilitate any questions. Before I do do that, just for the record, um, Mr. Gunning, I do go way back. I had the honor of hiring him at his current position. So I have made some good decisions in life, and that way I would say that's right. right. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, awesome. That's good. Um, you know, I'd, I'd just like to have free flow this morning. I'm, I think as questions hit, feel and go. I don't, well, let's try to get engaged. Um, if anyone wants to tee it up. I have a few questions. Go for it, uh, so I'd, I'd be interested in, in your perspective, because I, I work in the San Diego region, and so I'm very familiar with a lot of the stats there. So statewide is kind of, it's, it's really helpful for me to understand the context. Uh, when you compare California to those other regions, uh, you didn't really give much depth on the land costs. I'm curious as what, what you're experiencing in terms of the differential between those three markets when you talk about land. I mean, it's substantially much more expensive here in California. I don't have the hard specifics to San Diego. I know last year we only pulled 550 single-family permits in the San Diego area. So and yet the growth in that capacity is great. I know there's also initiatives that are being placed in the belt to pretty much stop housing, which will just drive the cost up for the land that's already entitled. But, but generally speaking, we're saying right now in California that if it's a prevailing wage property that the cost to prepare the plot, not the land cost itself, is $311,000 on average, where the home average home cost in Texas of a high-end home for us is 280 for the entire everything. So to give you the sense, land on top of that um, you know, is pretty much two-thirds of the cost of a home completely built out in Texas and about 55% of home built out in Florida. So we are still seeing substantially higher costs. I mean, so uh, that's a great number, though. I'll try to get you more specifics. I'm glad to get that to you. But uh, generally speaking, because of the time, and you know, we've got an, an investment expert here, but if I came to all of you and said, hey, I can double your money if, on this investment, you're all interested. And then when I tell you it will take 25 years to double your money, you look at me like I'm a fool. <laughs> so it's like I can do that in a Capital One you know, CD account at 1.4%. So that's the challenge. Is it's, the cost is more. The land itself, we may have bought at a reasonable price, but when you have to hold it and you're publicly traded, um, that's where the cost really doesn't get borne out. It may, may look at the land where well, you bought that piece of land for a million dollars, but if it took you 21 years to develop it, then we get to the point where you, when you include inclusionary zoning and prevailing wage, the land cost is negative. So in San Francisco, where we are doing some inclusionary zoning, we're saying the land cost of one of our developers was negative three million because of the devaluation due to inclusionary zoning. So, I mean, that's, that's part of the component. The land value, I should say, is negative three million, not the land cost. So I mean, that's part of the challenge for, for the state. Well, so in further uh, disaggregating, um, you, you talk about labor and materials kind of in a lump. Can you disaggregate that a little bit for comparison purposes with those three market areas? Sure. So we, we don't have prevailing wage requirements in the other two states. But um, for single family residents, um, you're looking at an increased cost of prevailing wage, and, and Robbie Hunter, if he's here, would be glaring at me, but from our quantitative analysis, we're looking at about $84,000 in differential in cost between prevailing wage and market rate wage in California. 
So we build Fort Ord. We're building right now. We're building the identical home and homes um, about 40 miles south. Of that the differential in price there is about 8,500 a structure. So from a labor perspective, um, you know, a hard number for, for labor for us. Um, you're looking at 40% to 42% of the cost of building is going to be labor related. So when you add on, um, you double the labor cost, triple the labor cost. We're paying electricians as much as 99 an hour in parts of San Francisco right now. Um, that's just going to add substantially to the cost. In some cases, it's going to uh, double the cost um, if there's prevailing wage. If there's not, it's probably going to be more like 20 to 30 percent differential between the states, and mostly because we have to pay our laborers more to live here. So part of our challenge, we have a labor shortage, and part of our challenge is you get paid pretty close to California wages if you live in Texas and Florida. You don't have pay income tax and you can rent a really nice place for a lot less. So we're just trying to bring labor over and lure them. They're like, well, where are you going to house me? So if you don't house your labor, or there aren't already existing owners of property here, a house, um, it's really hard to attract the same labor from those two states, or even Arizona or Utah, which sure. are two other production states for us, too. Sure. Well, no comment, you know, $99 an hour for an electrician still doesn't allow them to buy a house here, unfortunately. Correct. To totally correct. Yeah. Um, and what, what is can be done on the labor supply side? Because I think that's something I hear from, from my sector all, all the time is that labor is just, there is not enough young people have gone into the sector and a lot of people have retired out of it. What, what can we collectively do to address the, the shortage of skilled labor? So I'll say this you know, publicly for the first time, but I'm reaching out directly to labor. I mentioned Robbie Hunter. I've sat down with the operating engineers this week laborers this week, those who build the infrastructure and sidewalks. It is our, our crucial issue. We have shovel-ready projects 15 miles from here we don't have labor for. Um, so they've gone through the entitlement, they're ready to go, there's no bureaucracy standing in the way of it, but we can't even move a laborer to that position to build it. So two things we're doing, career technical education, the governor's done a great job in this space to try to work on this. Um, we're partnering with K 9 through 12 to try to make it hip and cool to be somebody who builds homes, men and women. We have a Professional Women's Builders Association. But for a long time in our state, we said that if you didn't get a college education, you weren't the right person. And that's just not true. And college education is great. I have one. A lot of all my kids are going to have one. But some people just aren't wired for it. And my mom doesn't have a college education, stunningly successful realtor, broker, builder. So, you know, but it's right now to say you want to build homes or you want to build high rises, you want to be an engineer, et cetera, for, homing, for home building is just not hip. And yet um, your chances of making a living wage are much more than a living wage in California. It's actually, I mean, the best example, Tykert Construction is engaged with bringing labor in. You, they will pay you for four years to work for them. They'll pay you close to $22 an hour. They'll educate you, and they'll guarantee you a job that pays $88,000 in Sacramento. And you're, you don't have a degree, but you come out with um, a certificate that pays you $88,000 a year. You have no college debt, and that's not a bad life. And because they're moving heavy equipment, you can move heavy equipment until you're 80 because you don't have to move a shovel. So, I mean, you can you know, move cranes, you can move scrapers, and so we are trying to make it okay for some kids who aren't wired um, for a college to do that. The other thing is have the kids that take our 9th through 12th grade program do go into college. They become mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, nothing wrong with going to college. So I mean you can take that path of training in, in high school, get certificates and then build from there, literally, um, go into college or you know go to San Luis Obispo and get an engineering degree or go into an apprenticeship program and make eighty five to ninety thousand dollars when you're twenty two years old. Not a bad income in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree. We need to invest more in the education side because, it, it, as you said, it's not considered hip. Last couple of comments or questions. Um, you did say uh, that we need housing in all sectors right now, and I would say from a San Diego perspective at least, in the upper third, we, we've overbuilt the local demand, at least according to our arena numbers. We're about 130 percent of what the local demand is for the top third. Our understanding of the market is that because we are a national and international market in a place like San Diego, uh, and I'm wondering if there are things we should be doing. And there's a lot of unoccupied housing. Uh, by one estimate, there's approximately 5% of all rental housing in the city of San Diego is not occupied on a full-time basis. And when you look at a 5% being a natural healthy vacancy rate, they've essentially moved, that, that, that keeping it off the market moves that. Have you, I mean, what can we be doing to, to stimulate more, in, I don't want to say discourage any part of housing, but how can we encourage more of that middle? Because the middle 
our folks are bidding up the housing that's naturally affordable to our lower income folks because of the crunch in the middle. Any thoughts on, and I would ask either of you, where we can either protect existing affordability or increase the, the middle income housing bracket? Well, one of the challenges on the apartment side is that we have too many um, people who are out there who are taking C's and trying to make them A's, you know, where they are naturally affordable and maybe their the rent levels are uh, $1,000 a month and people are trying to, you know, renovate them, put twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in renovation and try to get the rents to 2500 We've actually found that that's a riskier strategy. We would take that same property and if, you know, and, and do a more moderate rehab of maybe <coughs> ten or 12000 I mean, one, one little comment, the property I showed you that we did the, the renovation, the interior, that was in Orlando. Um, that same spec, that spec cost $11,000 a unit to do. That same spec in California is about 15,000 a door. So it's about, you know, um, almost 50 percent, 45, 50 percent higher. Um, but one of our challenges is, you know, mo trying to move the, the lower end up to the A market. That's in the apartment sector and, and you know, which is causing a lot of, of, of turnover. I mean, one of the things that, you know, I mean, there are a lot of challenges in the, the lower end of the apartment business, and one that our investors repeatedly, they say, well, what about safety? What about, isn't there just, just harder to manage people who are lower income? And we actually find that, um, you know, one of the things that is bad when you start trying to get higher rents is you are perpetuating a lot of turnover. And you know some apartment communities that have undergone that they have go through 50 or 60 percent turnover a year, and turnover is your enemy when trying to make a property safe. You know when you have 10 percent, when you try to keep residents there and have a cohesive community, it becomes safer because people know their neighbors. So one of the challenges in the apartment sector is that we have too many people who are trying to get you know, three and four times rent, uh, which also puts them in a riskier position where new construction is being built at a, 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 a higher spec. Just two other thoughts on this. We charge the same for entitlement fees, whether you're building a $300,000 home or a $2.2 .2 million home. So in order to get the math to pencil out, it does push things higher. Um, we do require prevailing wage in all public housing. so. We build a prevailing wage public housing project. We will pay as we will we'll, it'll cost us as much as five hundred and thirty five thousand dollars a unit to build an affordable housing unit. We do it privately, it'll cost us about two hundred and forty thousand. So one of our, our vice chairman's done this, he's done both of them. And so part of it is what's built into those costs. And the final component, this is very controversial in each community and, and the by right or concept of the governor, when you are saying we're gonna bring in low-cost housing to a neighborhood and in a neighborhood that doesn't have low-cost housing the nimbyism is very profound and so the neighbors will really push hard to say no we want higher end we want nicer we want to attract a different elements very unsettling terms and so we're finding too that just having community support to bring in you know a, a, a new project is just those projects will take us a lot longer than we say, hey, we're gonna bring in some high-end condos and we're gonna build some really nice units, we're gonna charge $850,000, and those will sell, by the way, but it's not anywhere near affordable. So we are trying to find ways to break through that. I mean, there's an editorial in the Sacramento Bee that I thought was profound. We still charge all entitlement fees for a Habitat for Humanity home. So, I mean, that's a piece that I don't fully comprehend why we do that other than cities need that, but when somebody comes in and actually uses free labor and free supplies and free materials, we still entitle that at the same rate as we would a million dollar home that's built privately. So those are some policy issues. It's, 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 these are tough issues, but those are some things that would help if you, if you didn't have to pay the full entitlement for lower cost housing, that would keep the cost substantially lower. Okay. Well, I thank you and appreciate you letting me dominate the uh, first part of comment here. Mr. Thanks, Chair. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I, know. I know Steve took up all 45 minutes. Air out. <laughs> I, think we, I, I think we do have a couple of questions, Mr. Chair. Good. Yeah. Ben. Right, go ahead. 
Um, wow. Thank you, Ben. Um, so I just had a couple of follow-up questions. Um, I, I work in the Los Angeles region, represent that area. Um, Daryl, I liked your idea about tax abatement and the idea of maybe incentivizing owners um, to keep the units affordable or a certain percentage of units affordable mm -hmm. under tax abatement. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit more. And then um, relative to your experience uh, in San Francisco on the, on the inclusionary zoning, I wanted to talk a little bit more about that, Dan, to, sure. to kind of explore that a little bit. So on the tax abatement, you know, the, board of, the State Board of Equalization is the one that uh, dictates the regulations around that. But to the extent that um, there's public funding in projects and that there's covenants restricting units uh, for a longer period of time, they have certainly recognized that that's an important, you know, vehicle and, and uh, an important policy, and they support um, the abatement of those units. How would you as a private developer, I guess, um, recommend or advise us around policies uh, relative to, to how to how to make that work for your product, right? Because there are in your portfolio only four projects that have CalHFA money. I assume that the other projects may have HCD money, but don't really have a lot of public money. How would you be incentivized without getting more public funds to, um, um, I guess, save on, you know, your 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 property taxes? Well, and what could we I I would start off by saying that. Um, you know, when we again, our business model is to acquire and renovate. So mm -hmm. we often will buy, and it has existing financing in place. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. And we've bought some that have existing uh, Cal HFA financing in in in, in place. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd say that um, you know we don't you know we don't have we don't use tax credit equity. All of our money is is private equity. Mm -hmm. If you in the sense that is is we have to deliver. A market rate of return, mm -hmm. uh, and so you know, the, for us, I mean, and, and we also have learned uh, that you know many of the things that we, for instance, in the tax credit business, when we buy tax credit properties, if you have a nonprofit partner that delivers certain services, you get that's part of the tax abatement. Mm -hmm. Have no issues with doing that on properties that that we buy that are market properties that are older, and having a nonprofit partner to do different things for our residents because we think that's just good business and it helps us on turnover and occupancy and things like that but I would say that um, you know having uh, you know one of the challenges again is you buy something existing it has debt on it that may be locked out for five six years mm -hmm. where you can't prepay it mm -hmm. to, to potentially do something that would be subordinate financing or something like that would be helpful uh, to have a layer of debt where our equity, and generally speaking, we don't ever um, borrow more than 60% of a project cost. So there's a big equity cushion that we have with our investors, and, and our company, we put in equity as well. Mm -hmm. But I would say, you know, a, 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 a pr you know, if, if to advise you that coming up with some loan products that work with existing uh, capital. I mean, we we just recently acquired uh, something in outside D.C. that was locked out. It was a, a HUD financing that was locked out for 20 years, and we had to put a lot of equity in it. So mm -hmm. that would be to be able to come up with same things around that condition, because in many of these, you know, that part of the capital flows in communities, particularly communities of color, is that many. You know, we, we have looked at properties that were financed in the 60s and never got any other type of financing um, other than kind of government financing. And so what we've tried to do is bring private capital, but more importantly, a, a, a private mentality, in turn, not pri but a, a taking, you know, part of what we do is take the best practices of the A's mm -hmm. and we bring it to that level. For instance, you know, we do, a, a, people say, well, you know, technology. Many of our, our residents are on electronic pay where they do use their phone. And you think, well, okay, does that get adopted at the lower end? It really does. Mm -hmm. uh, so th those are just a couple of ideas. Okay. And then, Dan, uh, thank you very much, Cheryl. Dan, relative to the inclusionary housing experience, um, Los Angeles just adopted its own inclusionary housing uh, policy. and. You know, we went through it for about 10 years uh, debating it and whether or not it was the right result for the, for 
uh, the type of policy that we wanted to advance as a community. Um, so I'm curious to, to hear, I mean, I, I can assume why higher um, income communities don't want low cost housing, because to me, you don't describe something as low cost housing, right? right? So it's, it's you know, you, do, you don't define something by the amount of rent that somebody can pay, you define it by the experience that they have. But that's, that's a whole other matter. Um, tell me about the inclusionary housing requirement, because part of the philosophy is that it's supposed to pay for itself. It's, you know, the developers profit from the higher market rate development, and that in turn should offset and pay for um, the affordable housing component, and it somehow should all balance out, and your experience is that it doesn't, and that you have to discount the, the lands as a result. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, the example I was given at a dinner I was at last week was somebody who was trying to build in San Francisco with mm -hmm. the 10% inclusionary zoning requirement. So the math he gave was pretty profound. I mean, two things that happened. This goes to Stephen's comment. You know, how do you find that more middle class housing? So to build the, the structure, so it's a small unit. They wanted 10%. So it was seven units that had to be uh, effectively uh, inclusionary homes. And so the homes, to cost to build the homes were 700000 per unit. The sale price for them ended up to be around 900000 per unit, but the inclusionary zoning price was to be provided at 200000 So each of the inclusionary homes or apartment rentals, kind of condos, you basically had a $500,000 subsidy built into the actual cost of building them. Mm -hmm. San Francisco, at the last minute, flipped it to 20% inclusionary. So you had to come up, pull out $3.5 million for 10%, and then you had to pull out $7 million and that's where I gave the example of a piece of property going to a negative 3.5 million in value. Mm -hmm. Now, this builder was able to do it because the demand in San Francisco is so high, so he just pushed the price up. Mm -hmm. So you do have homes in the inclusionary. You have 14 selling at 200,000, and you've got you know the, the remainder of those homes, I think it's about 52, that are selling at about 1.8, 1.9. So if you get housing prices high enough and forget mm -hmm. about the middle class, you can use inclusionary zoning in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. The only way you offset that is through tremendous subsidy. Mm -hmm. You know, if government wants to come in and give you tax incentives or other advantages, but then the cost to society is still there. The taxpayers are still paying for that differential. Mm -hmm. And with the JJJ measure in Los Angeles and inclusionary zoning requirements, I mean, we're, we're just not moving in LA the way we were before those. Mm -hmm. So it's just to pencil it out. Now, if the price of the product goes through the roof, then, and you've held the land for a long time, you might be able to get there, but you will not have a middle class housing stock when you mm -hmm. include inclusionary zoning at prices of $1.9 million. Mm -hmm. So we haven't found a way to do inclusionary housing and create a middle class housing stock. And to us, that's still where, if you look at the numbers that Dell provide, very similar to what we have inside of our organization, it, that's where people are. Most people don't make 480000 a year. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's the place that we're trying to missing middle as it's called I mean how do we create that and we haven't found a way to pencil out through the inclusionary zoning process without tremendous subsidy and tremendous like hundreds of thousands per unit Great. Okay. thank you very much Can I ask, are those dynamics the same we're talking about for sale housing are those dynamics the same in the rental market I mean because that's right. probably less less dramatic well, certainly the cost yeah. 700,000 unit for construction I don't know if that's uh, typical or not but I mean, it's typical in San Francisco because you're building up, and when you build up, you're doing steel, which means you know seismically you're you're building down to. So it's very expensive, just the infrastructure costs. But no, that's I mean, in California, being the average price of a house being 529, that's not typical. It's typical in high end areas. I mean, 1.6 million is the average cost in San Francisco for housing. 1.2 million in San Jose, average. It's a basic home. That's not a palace. So I mean, those are the numbers here in Sacramento. It's much more manageable mm -hmm. in the high threes, low fours, depending on whose study you look at. So it just depends on what part of the state. So my, my hey, hey, Preston, hang on a sec. Ben, why don't you go well, and then to your wrap up. <laughs> okay. I'll come back. Uh, hot, hot topic, and then we come back to it. I just first want to say thank you to you both for taking the time to join us this morning, and thank you for your leadership in different areas in the housing space. Uh, question for each of you if I can. Um, Dan, I, oh, first actually, Dan, I want to just thank you uh, as you know, uh, the California Housing Foundation for the uh, report cards you, you are putting out on permit data. Um, yeah, HCD finds that, and I think the industry is finding that really helpful uh, in terms of the snapshots of permitting. Uh, my question is actually, you, you brought up uh, sort of the, the fact that we're falling so far, far behind in production. One of the things that I've thought a lot about is 
uh, the cities in the Northwest that are actually doing comparatively well relative to our similarly booming e economic areas uh, like uh, Vancouver and Seattle. When you look at their permit data, I think Vancouver, 40% of their permits issued now are coming out of the accessory dwelling unit uh, space. Uh, Seattle, it's something like 20, 25% of their permits are ADU. We're just nowhere near there. Um, so there's a huge upside potentially. Uh, we made a bunch of uh, changes to state law over the last couple of years to really try and sweep away a lot of the discretionary um, local obstacles, parking requirements, impact fees. Uh, we're still not quite seeing the take up uh, at that level yet. And we're certainly not seeing builders kind of getting into that space. It's still very mom and pop-ish. Um, have you, uh, you know, have you focused on that at all? Do you have any thoughts? How do we kind of accelerate the production in that space? Because it seems to solve a lot of our, our problems. So quickly on that, totally agree with you. We There is a bill actually this year too that would make it easier on the ADU side. Um, and so we're supporting that Wykowski bill. But you're right, um, we're actually working with a group of female architects in LA who kind of partner with us to try to find ways to um, find the labor. And so yeah. um, working with the Los Angeles SoCal BIA, so we have 10 regional offices. Just the challenge is, is that um, labor right now is drawn more to the traditional housing construction because it yep. pays more than ADUs. And you will find you know, some really talented small builders that will kind of step into this space and can make enough. But as soon as one of our builders, bigger builders, find some, they'll offer them more and say, why don't you come build 100 homes instead of the ADUs? So the biggest challenge in LA right now working with these architects is just finding the talent. And so we've been trying to partner with them and our local builders, because we have builders that build as few as four homes a year, and some we build 4,400 homes a year. So we're trying to find those who build the three or four to partner with the ADU space, because they're comfortable, they know the local communities better. But it has been difficult to find the, the talent necessary to do that in the LA area. So that's partnership now, yeah. and just trying to yeah. really go out to our, our smaller members saying, even retired and say, hey, do you want to just kind of for fun build the unit? I mean, my dad was building until he was 80 because people would call him up saying, will you build us a church? He's like, sure, you know, because um, he was bored. So my mom wanted to get him out of the house. But that we're trying to find the 65 to 75-year-olds who are really talented and craftsmen mm -hmm. and to come in that space. But it's been a labor issue more so than a policy or permitting issue. Okay, thank you. And, and uh, so, Daryl, if I can, I, you know, your business model of ACK Rehab and the Class C, I think, is incredibly important for maintaining long-term affordability. Um, I, I know you're talking about the tax, tax exemption. I, I guess I wanted to ask you if you thought there was uh, an opportunity with the new income averaging provision and the IRS is offering through the low-income housing tax credit to be able to do those acquisitions and get tax credit equity for a larger swath of existing tenants to do that modest rehab. Um, I don't know, pair it with Cal HFA debt. I mean, is there something there that you think might be emergent, which could um, further the kind of work you do and help us preserve more long-term affordability in the multifamily area? You, you know, Ben, I think, and, and first I just have to compliment, you know, I, I complimented um, Mr. Gunning, but, you know, Ben had, has done a lot to help my business and some of the things that he did at HUD, and uh, which has really made a difference. Uh, much malign agency, but specifically, <laughs> you know, looking at the income averaging, I think it's good for perhaps a couple of reasons. One is, of course, the, the, the tax credit equity, the, you know, the, the, that uh, the average is, is better, is a better way of measuring that versus the specific um, uh, uh, income segregation. But I think the bigger issue as a policy, our most successful communities are mixed income. Right. You know, where we, you know, where I showed the picture of the, uh, it's a 600 u unit project based Section 8. When we bought it, it was a, just a very challenging uh, property and, we, and we've really transformed it. We bought the market rate property next to it, which was 300 and almost 400 apartments. And we were going to do an affordable execution potentially there. And the mayor said, you know, we don't want everybody concentrated lower income people and you know what they were right and we made that the next level up and I can tell you that that community is a lot stronger so I feel more strongly about it, that the ability to bring a have a more diverse income uh, <coughs> community because I think that's what that that's to me the benefit of the income averaging yeah great thank you Yeah. Hall, <laughs> representing the uh, Inland Empire of Southern California. 
Uh, and thank you, gentlemen, for uh, coming today and, and giving us a lot more information than I had before I got here. I appreciate it. Um, just want to just as a, I'll start with a statement, which is yesterday I was in D.C. and we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing, uh, the enactment of the Fair Housing Act. And so I'm just wondering in my mind what the the uh, the folks that developed that would think about some of the stats that you've provided today, because I think that they're both compelling and chilling for the state of California. Um, Dan, my question for you, um, as you're looking to the future, do you see any benefit in sort of changing the model, the traditional model of what a house should look like in California as a potential so solution uh, for the uh, for homeowners? And then, uh, d uh, Mr. Carter, for you, my question is opportunity zones. I mean, do you see that changing the um, the model for your what your the work that you're doing here? So very quickly, um, if you just go down the street here, you'll see there's some, um, uh, she's actually chairing the local BIA, um, Rachel Bartis, um, and she's building some smaller homes that she has found have exploded in the marketplace just here in Sacramento. So generally speaking, you know, with the entitlement fees and the time and energy it takes to build, it is pushing developers and home builders to look at higher higher, you know, basically higher cost homes to try to get their return on equity and return on investment. But we are seeing an openness to that space. And it's not just millennials, we're seeing seniors. As mm -hmm. my colleague mentioned, a lot of people want to kind of have a low maintenance place that's not too big. And then when the kids come to visit, they can stay down here at the hotel because that's where they want them anyways. <laughs> um, so <laughs> we're finding that starting to pick up more. Um, but I think part of it is, again, the entitlement fee for that smaller space is the same as building a new place on American River Drive at, sure. you know, a million dollars. So that's that's part of what we're trying to figure out if there's ways to incentivize that more. So yes, there's openness to that. Some out of necessity, but some out of positive design. So I mean, if you uh, look at the properties there, you'll see that we are considering that. Um, regarding opportunity zones, we've just started looking at that. I think it will have a very positive impact because certainly that enhances our investors' return, being able to have certain things tax uh, deferred. One other note about what has, is a legislation in Washington which is happening, and, and there was a group of, of us that met uh, the new or relatively new controller of the currency, mm -hmm. and they're in the process of rewriting some of the CRA regs. And everything that I've seen is very positive. Yes. The, probably the most <laughs> positive one is the, the elimination. M most the CRA regulations are tied to old bank deposit basis, which may or not may not have a correlation as where the need is. Mm -hmm. And so the new controller of the currency, who surprisingly is the first sitting banker who was in that seat in 50 years, everybody else came from somewhere else, but he, he has a very common sense approach, which I think will help capital flow into a lot of underserved communities. I said, why don't you wrap up? Yeah, I, yeah so, and I, I really loved the, uh, the recommendations and policy ideas about moving forward, but I, I've just been stuck on this other issue, which is I think that home builders come forward and kind of have their criticisms of what has happened, and they blame others, but never take their own responsibility, right? And I think we're all are reading now Color of Law. We're all seeing uh, Rothstein come to visit, right? We're learning. I think it's really Color of Real Estate and what's happened, but... Um, so 2006, a study was done with home builders in Fresno. They're earning 50% profit on every house that they were selling. I did a tax credit <laughs> deal in 2009. We paid $500,000 environmental impact fee. One would say, oh, it's the impact fee that's the problem. All of that $500,000 went to retire the debt north of Herndon in Fresno, which is the single family subdivisions being done by these single family home builders, right? So they're getting a lot of public subsidy uh, and as people know, Fresno almost went broke because of the additional costs from the city services that were being expanded out to these jurisdictions where the home builders were not paying the true costs. Uh, and this is in Fresno. They were not paying the true cost of operations, whether it was for the fire, police, uh, the maintaining of the roads. You look at the amount of surfaced 
roads that we have in Fresno per person. It's like double what they have in San Jose. That kind of thing just leads to these costs, and yet the home builders don't say that they're part of the issue, right? They were part of the issue that led to segregated communities. Um, and so to say, oh, well, we're here because we're now going to solve the problem, and these things that are being done are impacting people of color. Well, the home builders were doing that themselves for many years, right? And so I just, I, I'm just stuck on this. Uh, not the policy recommendations, I think, are really great to chew on, but I think we also have to be honest about what led to us in the situation that we have these highly segregated communities. You know, you go to Fresno again. We have a, uh, a city. We used to be Ashland, then it was Shaw. Now it's Herndon. 80 or 75 percent of the communities census tract south of Herndon have poverty rates higher than 40%, right? And that is intentional decisions that were made by the home builders as they continue to pursue their profits and we're saying, you have to let us do what we're gonna do because it's good for us, therefore it's good for you. I think that I would be really much more open to this if there was also some ownership of that, of what happened by the home builders. Um, and that, uh, so that's not a policy conversation, it's just much more of like trying to figure out how to, how, how to take ideas um, and not and not see that there's this lens. Obviously, I have a different lens, right? I mean, 90% uh, of the people that Fresno Housing serves make less than 10,000 a year, right? So I'm extremely low income. That's our focus. I, I I do have kind of comments and thoughts about the Class C going to Class A. I would love to do Class C to Class A without increasing rents, right? Because I think everyone should deserve the really high amenities and high property uh, value or, or amenities. Um, but I get it that you know, removing the popcorn ceiling for 50 bucks a month in rent, I, I probably would not take the $50 increase. So I'm right there with you, but I think we all like a smooth ceiling <laughs> ourselves. But anyways, I, it was more about the, just the, how do, we, how do we rectify these kind of social comments that we have and visions and, or values or, and misvalues that have happened over history uh, with the policies that we're trying to do. So anyways, I, 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 I was going to try to be quiet, and I just got like, really? I know. <laughs> that wasn't me quiet. <laughs> I'd like to make one quick comment to that. Please. You know, I do think that if you look at the apartment industry, that we have been our own worst enemy in many respects, historically, and, and some of the practices that have taken place. I can tell you that part of what why we've been successful as a company is number one we're highly diverse at all levels of the company where people understand many of these communities number two i think that you know we you know and and uh, what you know i grew up in detroit so i i've seen it all um and what's happened in a place like flint i mean you you'd be amazed that we have bought community par apartment communities owned by very reputable owners who never checked the water supply coming into that community where there have been lead pipe and there the, the level the, the water content in that community you know in african-american community was very very high and so you know ultimately uh, i think when you have companies that care it makes a difference and and that's why i think we're successful in serving those communities because a the residents know that we care, and B, we look at these things and say, you know, everybody deserves clean water. That's a, you know, they don't, they deserve not to have lead paint. And I think as an industry, and, and by and large, I've been very active in, uh, I was chairman of the National Multifamily Housing Council, the largest trade association. Many of the people who are institutional owners do it right. But there are a few that, you know, unfortunately, we do have Donald Sterling's out there. Uh, but it's a very few, and th that number, those people are slowly disappearing from the business, in my opinion. Yeah, well, and I really, I love what um, uh, HCD and um, TCAC are doing as they're looking at high opportunity neighborhoods. The way that we're going to be able to go into high opportunity neighborhoods, though, is that we have to have really well-designed properties, well-managed, and a great history, right, and a great reputation. So the city of Clovis, not to pick on them, but I will, has been kind of, you know, had a, when I came to the area 10 years ago, said we don't need affordable housing in our community. And now that they see what's happening, they want to, and it happens to be one of the few census tracts in Fresno County, 
that uh, meets the high opportunity definition. And now we're going in and doing a project, right? And, and uh, a housing development there. And it's because of design, it's because of the services, it's because of the way it's maintained. It's, uh, those things then overcome the NIMBY issue. So I'm a little nervous. I've been to a lot of tax credit properties throughout the country. I've seen the tax credit product in, in Texas, for example, and I think Texas is going to be in the exact same spot we were in public housing, where it deteriorates, and we're all going to say, why did we build that housing? Well, we did it for the lowest cost per unit, so we can build as many units as possible, and then it deteriorates, and then everyone says, well, we really don't want low-income housing in our neighborhood. So I think we do have to have high standards. I think we do have to have a high cost, so that, and then we have to maintain it so that then people say, yes, we do want that in our high-opportunity neighborhood, that I want that in my neighborhood. Um, and overcome NIMBYism. So, Mr. so Denning, I agree with you about the designs as being really important. Just one comment. So, President, I appreciate your candor. Um, I think you'll see my track record in this town is um, similar comments were made to an industry I represented for many years called the insurance industry. And I found that by sitting down with people who know more than I do and engaging with people who are equally passionate about solving problems, that things can change. So whether it was creating a low-cost auto policy with Gilbert Cedillo and Martha Scudia, um, the COIN program with John Garamendi was something I negotiated. Um, I'm committed, and you know, my passion here is to create solutions. So I, I do well because I many times will shut up and listen. Today I talked a lot, but I would love to listen more about things that we as builders can do. Unfortunately, none of our builders are making 50%. You know, my big guys are all publicly traded, 6.2 pre-tax last year. The 50%, I'd be putting my money there. but. That being said, I know people within every community will take advantage of communities. So my, my commitment to you, though, is to be available and accessible as we move forward. And under Tia's leadership, Michael's leadership, I'm here to listen and to learn and to do better. Great, thanks. Awesome. Good. Gentlemen, awesome. Way to kick it off. That was Thank very you. good, very <laughs> Thank helpful. You very Thank much. you. Thank you for having us. So if Michael wants to come up and bring the next panel up, and that would be great. And then Michael, if you could introduce the next panelist. Just to clarify, are we going to get a chance to talk about um, kind of the resulting policy discussion or recommendations? Okay. You know, I think you're right, although the agenda's packed. Yeah. We probably ought to think about that. We may have to cut lunch short. Okay. To, to get some time, because it feels like we ought to do that. Right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Because there's Cause too much good information ideas. flowing not to be able to mm -hmm. talk about it. Right? Mm -hmm. um, we'll try to get it. Okay. Mr. Carroll, go ahead, sir. Good morning. Um, I'm very happy to introduce a group of distinguished panelists in the field of multifamily finance. <clears throat> Our purpose uh, for this session is to learn from their respectives their perspectives, the high risk, the high level risk factors that they use in evaluating multifamily projects, how they view them individually, and then how their perspectives intersect uh, for all of us to make a deal come together. Um, we, you know, one of the issues we'll be looking at is uh, the issue of reserves and protecting, mitigating risk in that, that way. Uh, but we want to get an overall look at risk analysis from each of their perspectives. Uh, each of the panelists has been a, a partner with CalHFA on uh, multiple occasions, and um, this, this discussion should be a good background, uh, we hope, and, and you know, as, as, as you as a, a board, uh, look at our loan, loan requests as they come in, you know, to think about the different perspectives of different players around the table. So with that, uh, let me introduce them uh, from my left, uh, Debbie Ruane is uh, the senior, or excuse me, executive vice president, chief strategy officer with the San Diego Housing Commission. Uh, she has a wealth of experience both in the private sector at Bank of America and as a developer at Fairfield Residential and her current position in the public sector at San Diego Housing Commission. And then next is Matt Gross, who also has a wealth of experience both as a developer at Chelsea and in his current position as Director of Acquisitions at Redstone Equity Partners. And then finally, uh, Cecile Chalifor is another one of those people who has experience in, in various uh, uh, perspectives in the industry. She uh, is currently the Western Division Manager for Community Development Banking at Chase. 
uh, but she has worked as a, a lender in, in, at Lyft, the CDFI. Uh, she has been a developer and uh, senior program director for Enterprise Community Partners. So uh, the three of them bring a wealth of experience and uh, multiple perspectives to the table. And with that, I think we, as a group, decided mm -hmm. that the public sector was going to go first. Do a quick introduction turn it over. Sure. Good morning, everybody. I'm Debbie, and I'm so happy to be here. Uh, Tia, Melissa, Michael, thank you for inviting me to be with these fabulous people. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, San Diego uh, Housing Commission is a very unusual housing commission. We're actually the last one in the country that was created. We're only 35 years old. And we are a lender. Uh, typically, we're the gap lender, uh, the last piece of the um, capital stack. And, uh, but we're all usually the first stop from developers when they're looking to put together financing. We also are a uh, voucher uh, company, so we administer over 15,000 vouchers in the city of San Diego, and we're focusing a lot on homelessness right now as well. In the real estate division, we own and operate over 160 properties. We have a loan portfolio for multifamily and single family of about $350 million. And we've uh, issued approximately a billion dollars worth of bonds to create affordable housing in the city of San Diego. And the developers come to us for the bond inducements and the TEFRA hearings, which we then move from the Housing Commission to the Housing Authority. So I have two separate boards that I report to. And it, uh, it's kind of wonky, but it, it does work well. And uh, we uh, also have a development arm. So we are a developer. We have a, a nonprofit that uh, tackles deals that typically don't earn a developer fee. These are the ones that nobody else wanted to do in the city, uh, but still deals that need to get done. So great team that uh, I oversee. And as we talk about uh, risk and reserves, Housing Commission staff underwrite the deals with the developers, and we work very closely with them preliminarily and then all the way through. We are responsible for the ongoing compliance of affordable housing for the long term. So we have a very critical eye when we look to this. My team consists of people who came from the private sector as well as public sector with banking, development, and legal backgrounds. and. As I was on the plane this morning with Matt, we were talking about uh, how we do what we do. And a big way, a big component of our work is third party review. We don't keep as many staff in house to do the same job the developers do. And we outsource reviews a lot. And when I first came to the Housing Commission from um, the private sector, I was surprised at how much we spent on having third-party review of our work. Why don't we just have those employees on staff? We know how to do this. Found that the risk of uh, uh, to the politicians was so great that it was helpful to have an external third-party review a lot of our work and make sure that there was somebody else who had a critical eye on it. So we work with consultants who drill down uh, into our numbers very deeply. And we also have a board, two boards, that are exceedingly sensitized to the high cost of affordable housing development. So there is a tremendous amount of push down on us to get the approvals for these loans and bonds uh, by our boards. So with that, I want to turn it over to Matt, because he's more on the front line. Sure. Thanks, Debbie. Um, and thank, thank you all for having me. Uh, our role in the industry is uh, as a, a syndicator, and as a syndicator, you know, effectively what we're doing is we're a market maker in the tax credit equity market. So, our primary role is a as a, is as a fiduciary to our upper tier investors, um, which are primarily uh, very large insurance companies and uh, national and regional banks. So, the largest risk to our investors is a loss of the benefit that they would receive. And the, the main benefit in the developments we invest in um, on behalf of our investors is the, the delivery of the low-income housing tax credit. There's two ways that that tax credit would not be delivered to the investor, and those are either through a foreclosure event or through a, um, you know, a compliance issue where you know, a property or a, you know, a property falls out of compliance because there's a resident that's over income, for example. 
Uh, so you'll see the investment community is really laser focused on two major issues. One is debt, uh, because the debt is what could cause a potential foreclosure. And two is experience. Uh, the lack of experience either you know, on the development team, either from the sponsor themselves, the property manager, um, uh, or really those two mainly. Sometimes you have an asset manager involved, but lack of experience generally could cause a compliance issue. Uh, it could also cause a foreclosure event. So when we're looking at transactions, you know, there's, a, there's, there's kind of a, a methodology uh, that, that everybody goes through um, in the investment community when they're looking at transactions, but those are really the two big things. So when we look at deals, or when I look at deals, you know, the first thing that I'm looking at is the sponsorship. Uh, do I know this group? Have we done business with them before? Uh, what was our experience with them? And if, if we haven't done business, are they known in the industry generally? And what is their reputation in the industry? Have they worked with other people that I know and other financial partners? So it's really uh, a process of me uh, calling uh, folks like Cecile, uh, you know, if I haven't worked with a particular sponsor, and, and getting a good sense for what kind of actors they are and how they've reacted in tough situations. So that's number one, above all else, you know, above the real estate and above the, the population and all that, those things. But the second thing that we look at to evaluate risk is the market. Uh, generally speaking, in California, you know, you even at the maximum tax credit rents, which now could be up to 80% AMI, um, you you generally have a significant enough discount to market that you won't have a problem leasing up. And in fact, my experience on the development side, uh, we actually we, we did this deal in conjunction with Debbie uh, when I was at Chelsea. It was a 150 unit uh, deal in uh, Mission Valley and in, in San Diego, an inclusionary housing project, senior deal uh, that was literally. Pre, was fully pre-leased before completion and literally moved in every single resident over one weekend. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we, and it maintains probably a waiting list of 2,000 people or something like that. Um, you know, a lot of times when we put together these projections, you, we have, you know, a three, six month lease up schedule. And in California, that's just doesn't happen. You know, you, you see there's such a high demand because of such a, the, 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 the discount to market that these units are, are generally pre-leased before construction. Um, and they all, you know, maintain very good waiting lists. So I, if I'm looking in California, market is, is almost always pretty solid. So that's not, not a major risk point, at least from our perspective. You go to some other states and, and it can become an issue. And we'll see how this whole income averaging plays out with the 80% AMI units in some of the rural markets in California where I could potentially see that. Um, you see those 80% rents really bumping up to market or maybe even exceeding them. Uh, so then after that, you know, we look at the transaction, transaction structure, right? So What's the leverage look like? You know, is, is this a tax exempt bond deal with all maximum rents? And uh, is there a section eight contract that has contract rents that are at market or in excess of it? Uh, and and is, it, is there other public money in the transaction or is this really just all debt and my equity coming in? And how much debt is there relative to my equity? That's a really big key concern. You know, we look at that ratio. Is it, is it a one to one ratio? Is it a two to one? Is it three to one? Um, and depending on what that looks like, it's going to uh, drive our decisions on how we want to structure the, the, the uh, transaction from, from a risk perspective. So that's a key thing. Um, the population being served, uh, as, as you all probably know, it's become in vogue now to serve uh, a greater, greater proportion of, let me back up, greater, greater proportion of uh, tax credit developments, particularly 9% deals are serving special needs populations. So, uh, along with it, that population um, comes a couple addi additional layers of risk. One is uh, the, the, the capture rate or the depth of that market of that particular population in a given area. You know, how many homeless individuals with HIV and AIDS can we really find in this one submarket of Los Angeles, for example? And then usually those populations also come with a very, very heavy service burden. Um, so, you know, there's typically when you see that population being served, you're going to want to pair that with a uh, some type of a rental subsidy contract or some type of a uh, subsidy to, to service uh, those individuals and provide for services either within the partnership or outside of it. Um, and then the last thing I'd probably say I look at is the uh, as the is the construction type. So is this a new construction deal? Is it an ACA rehab? And, and what level of rehab are you um, are you putting into the transaction? So. After we go through all that and we say, hey, this looks good, we want to get engaged, then I would say we have an additional up to four layers of review and uh, guidelines in, that, that we have to 
fit within internally. The first is uh, AHIC, which is the Affordable Housing Investors Council. They publish kind of industry-wide guidelines, pay syndication investment community. This is generally what you guys should be doing. Off of that, we have our own internal guidelines that we have to adhere to. If we are placing a transaction with a specific upper tier investor, they have their own set of guidelines. So that's our third layer of review. And then after we close on a transaction, whether it's going to a specific investor or into a multi-investor fund, that fund or that, that investor has a post-closing review of the transaction. So I say all of that to, um, to just lay out that you know, these deals that are getting done with tax credits have a significant amount of oversight. Um, and that's just from the investor's side. You know, set, setting aside the public sector, the public funding, and also you know, the, the debt side of the business. So um, I think with that, I'll turn it over to Cecile, and then if I have time, I'll come back, and I want to run two different types of deal profiles by you, one that I think is a relatively low-risk low transaction, and the other that would be kind of a higher-risk transaction that we would consider. Thank you, Matt. Um, so I'm Cecile, I'm the West Division Manager for Chase, and I represent, as you heard, the, the debt side, the conventional debt side of the deals. Um, just to give you a sense, uh, we issue about like 1.5 billion nationwide a year in terms of construction loan. Um, I think what What's important and will influence everything I say after that is to realize we do actually uh, target a variety of deals, not just the 50, 60 percent AMI in large metropolitan areas. We actually do a lot of deals that are extremely low income or with special needs population, and we do um, have deals all over the place, including like in California, I would say like in the Central Valley. So like really a variety of deal profile, um, which obviously have a big impact on how we look at risk. Um, not to repeat anything Matt said, because obviously we all look at similar things, but the big thing is when, when we get a deal the first day, right, that we immediately go into with a developer, you know, experience, reputation, financial strength, and what's the market? Is it uh, an area where the affordable rents tend to be at least 10, 15 percent below market or not? That, like, that's the big criteria where we immediately start, you know, filtering deal on how we're going to look at. Um, you know, rents, expenses, reserves, all these things. Because like people would ask regularly, like, does a deal fit the box? Well, it's really not about does a deal fit the box, it's how can you extend the box to address the deal? So there are a lot of uh, conversation we have about reserve requirement that are very deal specific, and that's how we want it to be, right? It's not just, oh, this is like our typical guideline, but like what makes sense for this deal? And again, you always come back to developer and market very much. Um, the last big criteria is all about partners. I think Matt and Debbie made that point very clearly. Everything we look at when we determine the criteria for a deal and the terms we're going to provide is about who the partners are. That includes the equity investor, that does include the public partners, because we do know a lot of the assumptions we make in terms of looking at income, expenses, you know, reserve risk, maintenance risk, um, transition risk for HAP contracts and all of that, a lot of it is going to come down to the partners. And that's not written in any of the boxes, but that's a huge component on how we make decision. Because we do know at the end of the day, if there's a prime, that's who's going to be at the table and how we're going to approach the deal. Um, Matt made the point, the debt side, you know, can be a small portion of a deal stack. It can be a huge one. Everybody has their eyes on it because of foreclosure risk. We do know that. None of us do the deals because <laughs> we could foreclose on it. So uh, the way we underwrite the deal, and I'm, and I'm being very honest about it, it's not like, oh, well, if it goes badly, you know, can we foreclose? Can we raise the rent? Can we actually get repaid? Yes, it's that. We have to look at it, but that's not how we actually operate. We look at what would actually happen to make sure we do not have to foreclose ever on any of those deals. And you know there are a lot of reasons that, that I need to explain about why we don't want to go there. So that's a major way we look at reserve requirements. So I'll go into reserve quickly, so then Matt can build on that. Um, in terms of operating reserve, we would typically say, um, like the basic baseline will be six months of debt service and operating expenses uh, for the term of the loan. That's a pretty good standard everybody has. Again, I would say we do look at what other parties at the table are requiring. 
And we do acknowledge as for stronger developer and stronger deal, it might not make sense. So like for us, we do um, in some case allow three months of that service and um, operating expenses with the ability to release the reserve after five years. Because one big thing is none of us want to have these huge reserves laying around for no reason on deals where we all agree it makes no sense. So having the flexibility to really think over time, I think is a key, comp key component. It's harder to do, right? We could all say six months and we're done, right? Um, no, it should really be tailored to the deal. Because we have seen those deals with like million of dollars when you go to your 15 or like literally everybody would be laughing. We know there is no risk and it's lying there and it's usually not our money, it tends to be public money. Is it better somewhere else? That's a good question. So that's for operating reserves. Um, I would say in terms of transition reserves, so of course when a deal has an operating subsidy and a half contract, it gets more complicated, we all know that. That's where the underwriting gets into a lot of nitty gritty about what is the actual contract. Is it the type of contract that is most likely to be renewed if all of Section 8 went away? Um, is it seniors? Is it special needs? Is it another population? Uh, what is the language around renewal? Like we do underwrite, um, for example, in LA, the LADHS, the uh, Department of Health uh, Human Services operating subsidy. It's a newer subsidy. We don't really know how it will have what will happen in terms of renewal because we have not seen it. So we do spend time on looking at renewal, but again, it comes down to partners. We really, again, we don't write it that way, but we think what's the likelihood the county would be put these people on the street, you know, versus renewing. So there's that's where it gets into a lot of detail. So like that's a great example of like our rules um, on transition reserve are actually fairly complex. We have this things that says if the half of a rank is more than 30% of the total loan amount and the term is you know far away from our term and there's a lot of subtlety about that we will require our transition reserve well guess what we actually never do um, because we look at partners we have an equity investor at the table we have you know public lenders who are going to have their own criteria and we surely don't want to add our own that's just make everything even bigger um, and then um, we do look obviously at scandal rent float, all of these things, right? So it gets pretty complicated. I would say um, we also have um, a rule that says if the overhang, um, if the hub contract, how to put that? If you cannot look at a refinance scenario without the hub contract, then you would require bifurcated structure or lower amortization. Again, we actually have not enforced that because we look at partners and we spend so much time underwriting the HAP contract that we actually say, well, either we are comfortable with it or we're not. We cannot just say, oh, we're comfortable underwriting it, but we have all of these things where we actually, we really not that comfortable with it because things could go really wrong at HUD and all of this thing. And then so we're going to put all those huge reserves requirements. So it's kind of a, it's a balancing act uh, but again, trying to be consistent with one part of the underwriting and not add a lot of requirement is a key component. I hope that makes sense on transition reserves. That either we're comfortable with HAP or we're not. And, and again, looking at partners, usually we on deals, we, when we underwrite, we, we do look at does the equity investor pay attention? Do they tend to stay at the table if there is a problem or would they just walk away as soon as something goes wrong? So like if they have a standard on, um, transition reserve and operating reserve, we do assume they make sense to us too and we don't try to layer something else on top of it. And then for replacement reserve, briefly, that's pr really probably the one where we really look at the public sectors because they tend to have much higher requirement than us. Um, HCD has really good ones, it's hard to get it. <laughs> so surely don't, we don't want to make it higher than that. Um, and we do underwrite because we do know that mandatory, so we don't ignore them. Like we don't say, oh, the deal would work with our lower requirements. Um, I would say reserve, uh, operating, sorry, replacement reserve is probably where private lenders tend to be a little bit more conservative, like on how we look at PNAs and what will happen over 10 years, you know, over the term of the loan and then 10 years later. So we kind of have this internal you know, fights, if I can say, to say, no, 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 let's not just add, you know, either the 
um, the new construction was well done and we, and we were comfortable with that. Either the uh, scope for the rehab is sufficient or not, but let's not add you know, requirement to look at what will happen when we refinance, which is a long time from now. And yes, if we start saying we need to underwrite the, reserve, the replacement requirement for 10 years after that, again, you end up with a huge reserve that makes no sense. So um, always, on all those reserves, it's a fine balancing act to be reasonable, to know we, we do want the deals to refi and be safe, and we want to be our piece of the puzzle to be safe for everybody's benefit. But um, it's not just about check the box. We, we do look at what everybody else thinks makes sense on that deal. I, I did. Um, we're, you know, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And, and, and I just wanted just to ask about the reserves for a moment mm -hmm. and then let everybody go back to their presentation. So we've been debating here how we develop our policy or our underwriting guidelines around transition reserves. Um, and one of the questions that I had is just to kind of give it a little bit of context. Um, what percentage of your lending does Chase do on the permanent side versus the construction side? We don't do a lot of perm historically because it has been a, um, a newer product for us. Um, I would say it's about, like in California, it's probably, it's not that high. I would say probably like 20%. Okay. Part of it, Delilah, is because we do really look at what makes more sense for the deal. So we do work a lot with KDHFA as a tech out. We work a lot with CCRC, which we also finance, right, invest mm -hmm. in. So um, it's... Yeah, I mean, it's not a huge percentage historically. It's probably growing in many ways um, because we do 35 year amortization, so people like that. But again, it depends on the deal. Like, we, we do not push the perm. In other words, we do not require to do the perm if another perm product it's makes sense. Product. Yeah. Okay. It's really about the deal. Right. So, so, as you're underwriting transactions and talking about setting up reserves, it kind of comes in the context of more. As a construction lender working with other partners like the investor and like the public it, sector. it does Delilah. i would just say though we do always underwrite um we d when we have another perm lender we do always assume the worst case scenario might be that they will not do the perm right we have a commitment from them but technically things could happen so we always look at could we do the perm ourselves oh, okay. so no it's really <coughs> like when we do even if we're not the perm lender we do that analysis about all the reserves because yeah. we do know what the minimum requirement will be for us mm -hmm. and if it doesn't fit the bill uh, you know we would be very nervous about the perm lender saying hey yeah i can do the loan and i don't care about any of that be right. like yeah but what if you're not there it has to work by our standards so we always do that analysis okay. no matter if we're the perm or not okay so um i guess M matt from an investor standpoint when you look at the overhang between the market rents right the market affordable rents and the section 8 contract um do you require do you look at kind of creating a loan based on that overhang that is amortized differently is sized differently or are you okay with one big loan and then managing the differential that may or may not happen if President Trump decides to make <laughs> project based aids? <laughs> how do you, how do you kind I of? I heard it, that? the program's increasing. It's, it's <laughs> huge. Um, so I, I, I think uh, th this is an area where the, the LP, the limited partner, and, and the lenders interests diverge. And Debbie and I were talking about this on the flight up. We're in the deal for 15 years. Right. Mm -hmm. So if, if we get a 15 or 20 year HAP contract, we're good. Um, not to say that we, we don't care what happens to that asset after the fact, but we're protecting the limited partner's interest for the time of the compliance period. Mm -hmm. So uh, different, totally different risk profile. Um, I would say if, if I was um, advising the Cal HFA board, uh, which I guess we're partly doing here, um, <laughs> I, I would say that the, the, probably the prudent thing to do would be have, to have a tranche loan structure where uh, you have your A tranche that would be sized based upon the tax credit rents and a B tranche that's sized based upon the, the quote unquote overhang um, of the HAP contract. So that if you ended up in a position where you needed to refinance out, um, you know, that tranche B loan is a 15 year, 20 year loan uh, commensurate, you know, with the HAP contract, and then you've eliminated your overhang risk. Uh, obviously impacts your leverage, so uh, impacts the feasibility of the deal a little bit, but it's probably better to take that approach than to size up this massive transition reserve that probably isn't ever going to be used. 
mm -hmm. um, and frankly, isn't eligible for tax credits. Um, so you don't get basis on it. You don't get any tax credit equity. Mm -hmm. So it's a very inefficient way, in my opinion, to um, protect against potential uh, subsidy overhang risk. Um, and, and I guess two follow-up questions. One is, um, and then Cecile, I, I think mm -hmm. the same question's for you, but is, is your perspective different on new construction, you know, from ground up versus acquisition rehab where you're coming in and doing an acquisition rehab structure, refinancing out the existing debt, paying out equity to the developer versus setting up, you know, reserves for the project. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how would you view that advice? in that context, mm -hmm. acquisition uh, First, one thing I would say is like, uh, interestingly enough, I feel like years ago, we used to do the bifurcated structure mm -hmm. uh, on overhang. Um, I know when I was at City you, 10 years ago, I used to do a lot of that. I actually think that industry did make some huge progress by avoiding it, so not to disagree with you, mm -hmm. uh, but I would say developers like the fact that we can now uh, underwrite a larger loan. Um, so I, I think to your point though, it might be safer to do it bifurcated, like to be cons logical, um, but I do think it would be too bad to walk away from those loans that can underwrite all of it as one piece, but that's my, my yeah. perspective. And I, uh, I'm sure my credit person would say, oh no, that's great to do bifurcation, but <laughs> take that risk. Um, you know, again, I think it does work well for deals and I actually think the risk is actually pretty low. You know, and to your question on construction, new construction versus um, rehab, it's an interesting question because I would say, from from our perspective, um, acquihab deals uh, tend to be actually riskier, even though you have that long term history, because there is always that concern that the rehab might not be not have been enough. So it's actually harder to project what will happen over time. And we have long conversation internally about that because we might not all agree on that. What's actually riskier between the two? Um, however, I would say some of the hub contract for. Um, for acquisition, some of them are liquidity like preservation deal where you have this long-term mm -hmm. HUD contract. I would say we all assume these ones are very likely to be renewed. We all know those contracts, have, there are a lot of different ones. They can get very complex on what the developers actually can do. Um, they can be very tricky to underwrite, and we do hope the consultant are actually really carefully looking at them and looking at the, all the HUD rules related to them. Mm -hmm. But there is an assumption that the long-term contract will be renewed. The, on new construction where you have um, more like, you know, housing authority type of project-based section eight, even 15 years, or a variety of contract, but not that long history. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think we all assume they're more likely to not be renewed if funds were cut. Mm -hmm. um, so it's uh, an interesting mix of, um, criteria, you know, <coughs> it's not a straightforward <coughs> answer on what risk here. Yeah, in there. Mm -hmm. that's helpful. Thank you very much. Yeah. And, and any of these, do you have escalations? Do you mm -hmm. require escalation over time? Or, or on the half contract? Uh, on on the either reserves. your replacement reserve, your, oh, your yes. operating uh, reserve, your transition. We, not on operating reserves, on replacement we do if it's only our criteria. So like, let's say our criteria is like 250 a year um, per unit per year for seniors, 300 for family. And we do require a 5% increase um, but only every three years. However, again, we we do acknowledge that if our partners have much larger requirement, I would say like HED requirements in particular, we would not require any escalation because we do know those numbers are bigger. Mm -hmm. And unless we find out something in the PNA that makes us extremely nervous, mm -hmm. and we do think the overall reserve will not be enough, uh, we do not require escalation in that case. So, so, and I, not to belabor the point, but I think that this is something we've been talking a lot about. And um, so, and going back to my days doing Hope Six developments in Seattle, I hated that there were these uh, transition reserves that were required. We worked our hardest to get rid of them, uh, and so that we kind of talk about the transition reserves feels like we're backsliding. But the world is very different. So, and there's a difference, as you just pointed out between project-based vouchers through the multifamily side of things versus project-based vouchers through housing authorities, right? Mm -hmm. And throughout California, I don't know the numbers in San Diego, uh, but throughout California, housing authorities are at 60% utilization rates for, for uh, Section 8 uh, on unit count, but 100% for budget authority, right? So mm -hmm. they're spending 100% of the dollars, but on like 60% of the number of vouchers, right? And that's happening not in Fresno or in the Valley, but it's happening throughout other parts of California. And that's where I think the danger is, is what's gonna to happen to the housing authority funded 
vouchers that are coming into a development. And, and I get it that we should be thinking as a board about the transaction if we're investing. Our investing tends to be for 30, 40 years, so maybe it's a little bit longer. Um, and, and so I, I think we are asking the question of how do we protect the asset, but I know that uh, we are also talking about how do we protect the individual? How do we make sure uh, as the board that we're thinking about what happens to that individual? Uh, and I think the uncertainty of what's happening in, at the federal level is making us a little bit more nervous of what, what we should be doing here in California. So I think this is a great conversation. And I can't wait. To, I think you have two samples, you said, or examples you're going to walk through. So I can't wait to see those. Sure. I, and Preston, for, I you, for you, this is maybe going to be no, no new news. But um, so, so I'll start with the example or the sample of a uh, deal where, you know, this is one where we would consider it a very low risk deal and would require little to no reserves. And, and I can also talk about some of our reserve requirements, too, if that'd be helpful. So you know, we've got an experienced repeat developer that, that we know. Um, they're they're well capitalized um, in in the industry. Um, the AX standards would tell you if, if a developer has a million of liquidity and five million of net worth, that generally meets people's uh, guidelines for guarantee requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've got significant discount to market rents, uh, and again, in California, that's usually not a problem. So most California deals fit that profile. Uh, we have low debt leverage, so that's either a nine percent transaction, tax credit transaction, or a four percent deal. Uh, that's heavily subsidized, let's say, um, you know, a, a cap and trade transaction, for example, that has multiple layers of soft financing. So it really looks and operates more like a nine uh, than it does a four. And it likely has deeper income targeting than a traditional 4% transaction. Uh, and it's new construction or substantial rehabilitation. And I'd say this day and age, substantial rehabilitation probably is 85,000 a door um, or more. Uh, used to be 50, um, but that number just seems to continue to creep up. So that's a profile deal where if, if that was kind of the initial uptick uh, of the analysis, I would say, this is a deal we wanna do, we're gonna bid it up, we're gonna get aggressive um, and, and, and try to secure the business. So flipping over to the other side, uh, I would say a deal that would quite require high reserves or one that we would just outright pass on is a deal where we have uh, an inexperienced or potentially an experienced but a new sponsor to us. Uh, somebody with limited financial capacity. Uh, so even those that are experienced, if you know, if you're maybe a smaller nonprofit that's done a handful of transactions, but really the balance sheet just isn't there to support the guarantees, uh, that could be problematic. Uh, questionable discount to market or rental subsidy that is far in excess of the uh, the maximum tax credit rents. And in some cases, we see contracts that are far in excess of the actual market rents or the FMRs. Uh, so that's definitely problematic. Uh, light rehab, where I would consider that to be less than 35000 a door, probably, this day and age. Um, and a developer that's assuming that they're going to take a property that's operating at, let's say, 6000 a unit in operating expenses, and because they're so great, they can do it at 3500 bucks, and they're leveraging debt off of that. Um, so when I see that type of a profile, you know, the, the, the kind of the red flags go up and it's, we're gonna take a really deep dive into this and, and we're gonna ask the question as to whether or not this is a deal we wanna do. And if it is, then we're probably gonna be pushing in all sorts of different areas to reserve the deal, not just with the reserves themselves, but adding in contingencies like underwriting to, you know, a higher debt service coverage ratio, for example. So instead of a 115 cover, maybe we're at a 120 or 125, uh, maybe higher vacancy assumptions. Um, so things of that nature. Uh, but in terms of reserves themselves, I think in California, it's pretty standard uh, these days to have a three month reserve. Um, although I would say the industry is probably six, but to be competitive, uh, I, I feel that on most California transactions, we land at three, unless there's some other funding source that's forcing it higher. Um, on the replacement reserves, Cecile had mentioned that, that the, um, the HCD uh, reserves were good. And I think that depends on whose perspective you know, you're, you're, you're looking at those from. I mean, I, I would say that they're probably uh, inordinately high. Um, <laughs> and and, and HUD, HUD you know, has similar type of requirements. Um, I think College FA has similar type of requirements, but I don't really see, and I think that's a reaction to really some legacy products that, or projects that have had issues um, and haven't been well maintained. And, uh, so when you when you have a portfolio of that, it's hard to you know look to see what the market's doing. But the market's really not there. Um, you know the market will do new construction deals at 250 a unit. Um, they'll do rehab deals at 300. 
uh, and you get anything up above that and, and that starts to feel like um, like it's, it's a little bit of an onerous requirement, I would say. Um, and then in transition reserves, again, because of our time horizon in the deals, um, I generally don't underwrite deals with transition reserves in them unless, again, there's another funding source that's requiring it. Um, and then we'll just mirror the terms of that other funding source. But um, my, my, my general position on it is I, I just think it's, uh, it's pretty inefficient. Mm -hmm. I'd like to chime in that uh, at the Housing Commission, we, we move our guidelines, our underwriting guidelines, to meet the market. It's important for us to facilitate the creation of housing. And often, as a public agency, we can put the rules and regulations onto the developers that actually increase the time for delivery, which is not a good thing. So we focus a lot on streamlining, and we try very hard to, to be reactive to what's going on in the market and what's needed. So we have great partners, and to both Matt and Cecile's point, as far as picking the team, when we are the first stop, I mean, you, a developer can't get the tax credits or the bonds without local buy-in. So for us to put our skin in the game, per se, uh, we have to get a board approval. And once we get that board approval, that money gets held until the developer c can cobble together all the other funding sources. So that money goes into an account that's reserved, and it sits there on our books. We can't use it for anything else. So the surety of execution for us from the developers is so key. The team has to be tight, they have to be experienced, and they have to be ready to go. Uh, because we don't want to be sitting on that money and not deploying it as quickly as we can. That was important for me to say. Just a quick follow-up question if you don't mind. On the, on the sizing of the guarantee, um, you know, uh, I think that if we don't establish a transition reserve, you're obviously looking to the developer to come up with whatever deficits um, um, are created. And as Preston said, you know, we're interested more not in the asset itself, but really the individuals and not having the individuals get kicked out because they can't meet, you know, the base rent of 50 or 60% AMI rents. So um, how, do, how do you establish the guarantee for the developer? Is it a dollar value? Like, is it X percent higher than you know what it I, like how do you measure and how do you how do you formulaically um, require transition um, guarantee from the developer mm -hmm. for us we don't have a specific ratio mm -hmm. it's not that straightforward mm -hmm. I would say um, mm -hmm. I think we obviously look at the financials in general it varies from nonprofit to for-profit especially in California where you know the guarantee on the nonprofit for a lot of reasons as we all know is not really there um, on the for-profit we do pay a lot of attention to principles that you know and making sure they cannot move money around that's like our <laughs> bigger concern um, I would say it's really hard to do a deal if you don't have at like at least a million or a million five in cash somewhere. Uh, but we have done some where it gets very, very close to it. So, and then part of it is we do need to know there is something there to your point on the worst case scenario, but we do know it, it would never be quite enough to make it work. Um, you know, and we could do like a very in depth analysis of any unsecured debt and all these good things, but realistically, it's more like to know there is at least, it, the, more importantly, we want to see that, um, that the organization, whichever it is, is managed in a good way over time, right? So like you don't have like a big gap ongoing and their, um, their real estate on schedule makes sense. And you know, so it's a, like a larger picture analysis. It's not just a dollar a month. Again, because obviously we do know we, it would probably never be sufficient um, to fill the gap. But, but I do think like a minimal num number is pretty standard. But again, it's not a ratio per se. I just want to thank the, thank the panelists here because I, I they are part of my brain trust and so I turn to them all the time and I learn something every day. I've got more pages of notes from this than I do from a board meeting usually. Um, and I just want to ask Mr. Gross since you're offering candid advice to at HCD. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any for CalHFA? It's just between us. <laughs> I keep doing what you guys are doing. The 40 year M is great. Uh, developers love it. Um, you know, to the extent yeah. that that product is, is available um, and the risk can be properly mitigated against for you know, certain deal profiles. 
you know, I think that that's a, a product that um, would be very helpful in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, and will definitely make College of A competitive. Um, even if there are some reasonably, you know, more, more onerous, you know, reserve requirements, I think with the additional leverage, it, it would still, you know, uh, be a competitive tool. Mm -hmm. And from the housing perspective, uh, Housing Commission, our developers are thrilled with uh, TIA and the team and your innovation. It is so refreshing to have a, a fresh look at what the market needs. And uh, we greatly appreciate the fact that we've been invited to participate in brainstorming with you. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen every day. And to have the local groups uh, want more control on their own areas, but recognizing that the money comes from Sacramento and we've got to make somebody or something that has so many disparate regions in the state happy, it's just refreshing to, to participate in an evolution of a product such as the 40 year that, that is uh, really needed in the market. So thank you for that. That's it's two bribes you paid today. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I have a comment that probably reflects my age more than anything else. Um, but one of, one of the common themes in risk management is this thing about the experience of the developer. Um, so I first started trying to develop supportive housing in 1989. And, and part of the reason it did not happen then is because we didn't have the experience necessary to access public funding, mm -hmm. but nobody else was willing to develop that housing. So it took a long time to develop a supportive housing industry because the only organizations that were willing to risk housing special needs populations couldn't meet the experience criteria to access the tools to finance the housing. So. Now I think you know it's less of an issue um, the, all these years later because we have developed organizations now that are that are doing that kind of housing and have the experience, and also because we've managed to seduce mainstream developers <laughs> into including those products in their in their product line, um, and and so I think you know it, this is less of an issue now than it once was. However, I'm sitting here wondering, you know, there are still populations that are in desperate need of housing, for whom housing is not being developed, in part because there aren't developers who can access public funding, who who are the developers that are willing to risk housing those populations. So, for instance, sex offenders. Uh, people with other kinds of <coughs> public violations that make them hard to house, but for whom, you know, our communities would be a lot safer <laughs> if they were in housing rather than out on the riverbed. Um, so there are still those special needs that, you know, do we have any developers willing to risk uh, trying to reach them? And if so, do we have any public agencies who are willing to risk financing those developers. I, I would just say, Jonathan, from the private sector, we, we don't have a perspective on certain populations versus others. Um, to your point on experience, yes, for developer, if it's a new population, it's a new population. Mm -hmm. But the fact that the developer has handled other population with um, a variety of challenges would matter a lot. In other words, do they understand that the design might need to be different? Do they understand that the property management staff might be different? The asset management approach might be different. You know, like, is other people who are just jumping on the source of money, or are there people who actually know that different populations have different needs? That's what we look at in terms of experience. Not necessarily experience with that specific population. Does that make sense? But, like, just you know, because we all have seen developers who chase the money, and that makes us nervous. That, I would say yes. And it doesn't matter which population. Like, do they work with the right partners to make sure they address the need of that population is what we look at in terms of experience. Related to that, um, and I think it was something that you said, Matt, you, you used the term service burden. And I've always seen service as a benefit. Um, I'm just wondering, we didn't really get delve into the risk associated with services, 
Um, but I do want to hear a little bit more about how you address risk associated with services, um, if you could share. Sure, and it's probably a bad choice of words on my part. Um, so I, I guess when I'm when I'm referring to burden, I'm I'm, I'm thinking of the the cost to the to the partnership, the financial costs to the partnership, um, and and what that um, requires in, in terms of funding for to, to provide the services that are needed for that population. Uh, so we see those transactions done in really one of two ways. Um, one way is. Uh, and actually, the San Diego Housing Commission has really pioneered this um, in, in the city of San Diego and specifically in downtown uh, mm -hmm. with permanent supportive housing and the, the homeless initiative um, that they put forward where uh, you know, they're providing 100, basically 100% project-based Section 8 uh, contracts to, uh, to developers who are willing to build 100% supportive housing with uh, high intensity uh, levels of services. So uh, when you do that, you, know, you can you know, obviously <coughs> get all the operating income from the Section 8 contract and utilize a portion, a good portion of that to, to pay for services. Um, and when you pair that with a 9% tax credit and a high level of tax credit equity subsidy, uh, those transactions generally work fairly well. Uh, the, the other thing that we see uh, from time to time is uh, projects that actually ca capitalize a, a uh, services reserve, uh, which, which again is, is maybe not the, the most efficient way to do it. Uh, but if, if that's needed, then and you know that you're going to be paying, you know, let's say, for example, um, you know, uh, 150,000 or 200,000 of services a year, uh, you can capitalize a $3 million services reserve, and then that reserve is just released over time and, and brought into the project to, to fund it. You know, I think from our perspective as a limited partner, we do a lot of permanent supportive. Um, you know, we have no objection to that, um, but for, you know, uh, the manner in which it's structured and making sure that it's really a, a sound financial structure and the, the potential issue with recapture is protected. Uh, one of the big things that we do look at that's probably important for the board to hear is in the event of a loss of a HAP contract, what then happens? And we're usually always looking for language that allows for the rents to be float, uh, to float up to the maximum allowable tax credit rents and that the service requirements become uh, 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 you know, made or that they're made on a best efforts basis instead of being a, a hard um, you know, compliance uh, foreclosable uh, event in the in the event that they weren't delivered. Um, so that's the way that we look at those type of transactions. If that's an answer, yeah. For you. yeah. Yes, but you just hit the nail on the head about what our concerns are, right? Mm -hmm. That those are the two kind of market responses, <laughs> and we think that there should be something else, right? Yes. And that's mm -hmm. so you, you just hit the nail on the head. Yeah. Well, and I think the only way that you could really protect against that uh, would be to do a relocation analysis on day one, you know, yeah. before you close. So, um, yeah. you know, if the deal is going to fall apart, which a lot of Section 8 deals will, and there's no way to restabilize it or reserve against it, uh, then you're really left in a position where you're probably cutting checks to the tune of fifty or sixty thousand dollars per resident to find them housing elsewhere in order to salvage the the existing tra the pr project without the presence of subsidy, and that number is going to go up and up and up and up over the life of the uh, the, the compliance period. Um, so, you know, I, maybe, maybe you have some sort of a relocation guarantee that's, that the, the developers are agreeing to, but I, I'm afraid if you put that, impose that upon a developer, it's going to make the um, folks want to utilize the, the financing products much less. It's going to make it much less attractive. Yeah, and I, I think that's why the transition reserve yeah. works to a certain extent, right? Yeah. Because you're, what you're doing is you're analyzing the difference of someone who's paying rent at a 30% AMI level versus someone who could pay rent at a 60% AMI level. And there's a, there's a dollar value to that. And the assumption of a transition reserve is that it will help migrate and transition a resident out of the housing over a two year period that allows that unit to go from a 30% AMI level up to a 60% AMI level and says, okay, you have two years to slowly find housing, get placed somewhere else, so that we can convert that unit to 60% AMI, 60% AMI unit without changing your rent during those two year period, that two year period. Mm -hmm. So it's not kind of the catastrophic, you know, pay off all the debt, um, you know, analysis that people have in their heads, and it's also not the catastrophic, um, you know, eventuality of having to relocate everybody mm -hmm. and pay for a relocation because you're actually working with them for two years to actually get them transitioned out. 
So if I, if I can add on that, Elana, because I think we all agree that's why the thinking around transition reserve was bad. And I think what you're talking about is that tension between we have private partners at the table, yes. mm -hmm. yeah. we have to carry worry about the credit, we have to worry about the debt, and have requirement that technically allow for foreclosure at market level, mm -hmm. right, or close or 60% AMI. Um, and the fact that obviously nobody wants those projects to transition to something else. We all know that. Like literally, we want the long term, all the parties at the table want the long term, you know, want the long term to be exactly what it's planned for. I think that's what I was trying to say earlier. That's the nuance between what we require on the book and what we know would actually happen because realistically, if the HAP contract goes away, yes, we have a major prime, and you would say that would absolutely call for transition reserve, right? That would be the logical thing. I think Matt made the point earlier, we all know that's a very inefficient way to deal with the risk, actually, because it's so huge reserve that most likely are not going to be used. Again, the way we look at it is we look at the partner, what is the actual, in, in practical term, what is the risk that those contracts will actually disappear? Mm -hmm. And it's actually pretty low, historically, even though there's always drama you know, at the national level. Um, so like we really, that's why we decided not to enforce the transition reserve requirement, even though we could in most cases, and maybe we should, you know, but that's where the tension is. And I think um, it's hard to say never require them, mm -hmm. but it's really, it, it would be too bad to go back to like, let's require Always, them right. all the time because yeah, we yeah. do know they're very inefficient and not you know, needed in Well, you cases. said it earlier, every deal is different. And exactly. you've got to look at them in yeah. a unique manner. Yeah. I think we have time for one more. Tracy, you've been waiting. Do you have a? Thank you. I just <coughs> wanted to follow up on uh, Jonathan's question about experience. Um, having been brought into the affordable world, I work for the Veterans um, Administration uh, here in the state and work closely with Ben and Tia on the VHHP program where we're now trying to help stabilize uh, veterans and their homelessness that are way overrepresented in California and the homeless population. Um, it's been frustrating for me and probably very frustrating for Ben's team as I've been advocating for veteran service organizations who have experience serving veterans but are woefully lacking in the development experience that they should be at this table. They should be in here serving and getting bites at that apple. They've got 40, 50 years experience in housing developments and serving veterans, but they can't cross that threshold of developer experience. So how do we make room for new developers into this industry? Because they have something to offer, especially to a variety of newer populations. But even if we ignore the, the unique populations, if we have a closed group, we have closed off opportunities yeah. for the state to find new ways to improve our services or improve our developments and things of that nature. I'd love to start addressing that one if I could. Uh, the, the Housing Commission, when we make a loan, we are a public agency and how can we reasonably say we're giving X million dollars to somebody who's never done this before? Uh, it, we would not, it would not go well. However, uh, we are finding strength in partnerships, and there are a lot of um, smaller CDCs and newer populations that are coming up. Uh, we're working closely with the, the Center Star, which is formerly incarcerated, uh, and finding housing for them. What we're doing is we're partnering smaller groups with more experienced developers until you get your feet wet. The, I mentioned that surety of execution. It's so critical. Uh, we have such a housing crisis in the state, and we need to make sure that our money gets used well. And building capacity is part of our job, and we need to do that. We need to make sure, though, that we find agencies that have common cultures or common missions and that recognize you are going to be working with another team that needs, needs to learn um, and you bring something very valuable to the table as well that we need to learn. And I would like to add a point about that. Jonathan and I met years ago at CSA, when he was at CSH and they created the Open Door Institute, remember that? And the whole point was about bringing a permanent supportive, no sorry, supportive, uh, supportive services um, provider to the, to the table with affordable housing developers to partner them, to your point, it's all about partnering 
and make sure that over time the providers could learn how to do development. Um, but having a, a fair, the, the whole point of the institute was to make sure there was a fair negotiation between the developer and the providers and everybody would get what they wanted. And I would say like some group like Bath and Weingart have a perfect example because I remember like, what was it, 12 years ago or 14, 15 years ago almost, um, we had this, these two groups of people and they were not speaking the same language and they were worried you know the developer was like i need to make sure i deliver my project and i need to make sure the tenants stay in place and you know and the devil and the provider was like but my population has different needs you cannot just move them out because they stop paying the rent you have to work with them big 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 conversation and on developer fee and all of these fun things and again fast forward 10 15 years later those providers learn to do development through those JVs, and they can do it on their own now. It does take time because development is not an easy thing to get into. To this point, you just don't wing it, right? We all know that. Um, you have to deliver. It's very important to all the partners. But there is a way to build those relationships so over time people who care about a specific population can learn in a safe way to do development on their own. So how do we incentivize those partnerings? without the goodwill of your organizations, that partnering isn't been something that I've seen readily coming to the table through the VHHP program. It's been a kicking and fighting and dragging and pulling Definitely. to get those partnerings <laughs> happening. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think the state can only do so much in pushing and pulling that. How do we incentivize the communities and the investors and the bankers to help us pull and drag in this We support CDFI, so go well, ahead, Jonathan. <laughs> well, and actually, and actually, in that case, where the incentive came from was from private foundations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the private foundations put up the money to help incentivize the partnership that built the experience for um, new developers to come into the process. And uh, in our budget, we have a capacity development grant so we actually try to facilitate that within uh, smaller development departments where they need to add the bench strength to do those tough deals. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think this topic is a, a law, thirty year topic, right? Oh, I mean, I saw yeah. yeah. small faith based organizations in Seattle building housing, right? And now I bet you many of those organizations wish that they didn't have that small portfolio of housing that they have, right? And so, so I think that there are pros and cons as you go along through it. I, I've been a strong supporter of housing authorities being developers and, uh, you know, starting back in 2000 was on a, a nonprofit that was looking at bringing debt and equity to housing authorities. And one of our big things was how do we bring capacity? And now here it is, you know, 20 years later and through RAD, we're seeing a lot of housing authorities are having to give up their portfolios because they don't have the capacity to develop. And, uh, but it goes, it is, uh, and I was part, I, I am part of NOAA, the National Organization of African Americans in Housing, because their focus was getting uh, people of color to be developers, right? And there's a, a huge glass ceiling on that, uh, I think, throughout the country. And so how we build that capacity is so important and yet not put the dollars at risk. Um, you know, we uh, have partnered up with community development corporations that we've helped co uh, create and have them be part of the ownership of a tax credit deal and they get some developer fee and uh, and it's kind of interesting because we put no strings attached to it. We just want them to have some dollars and to see what they do with it. This one nonprofit went out and bought some other properties that cash flows and helps the organization. I mean, it's really kind of amazing to see that happen. So it is about capacity building of the nonprofits and the community-based organizations. It, it is really hard, I think. And I do think that, um, and I was actually going to put you on the spot uh, about whether H HCD or TCAC has looked at, has the pool of applicants for funding shrunk over time? Has it grown over time? My kind of sense is this probably has grown. We just don't know it. Um, so I mean, is this capacity building a real issue or is it? Well, di didn't TCAC just recently expand the, the, the definition for partner experience, GP experience, to include key members of a development team? Right, they did that, right? For, right. So, I mean, it, th there are things happening, um, I think, that, that to help encourage uh, more participants in, in the various different financing programs. But at the end of the day, you know, you need to have somebody that can execute. And I think everybody, you know, on our side is, is definitely looking at that, whether that's one key team member you know, that an organization hires a project manager that came from 
an experienced developer or a partnership where they're working in conjunction with it, it'd be one of those two that we would look for. And I think the lesson learned is can we at Post College FA have the, is that part of our mission maybe to do that development capacity building within nonprofits and organizations? So. Well, you know, to the extent that BHHP is such a critical element, mm -hmm. you know, it might be a good idea to use some of our discretionary money to create a capacity, well, I know we don't have a lot of discretionary money. Where is that? <laughs> 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 where is that fun? You know, like, you know, just operating grants, right? Just like um, capacity building operating grants to be, <laughs> if anyone look at you. There ought to be, I know. <laughs> 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 My question is it specific towards VA? Right, it was right, right. in general, right. I mean, just from an outsider, a new person coming in, yeah, looking coming in. and trying to absorb all yeah. of affordable housing and just hearing the difficulties, going through a few different funding rounds, having the different conversations and the development mm -hmm. of VHHP. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's unique to VHHP. But, but I, I think, think you're right. There's organizations. Bigger issue. Um, and I understand you've been doing it, and I totally get the ability to bring a project to fruition. I run our home loan program at CalVet, and I totally get the concerns over getting a project actually completed. And I would just add, if, I want to underscore what uh, my brother over there said, um, because I sit on the board of trustees of a church that is now dealing and grappling with the facts, not just uh, executing and getting the deal up, it's maintaining it for the 30-year obligation under um, whatever the guidance is, and that has been a struggle. Um, they, there, I sit on the board of trustees. We are basically struggling with the fact that um, the folks who initiated this are no longer with us. Um, Literally. Literally. Uh, and uh, it really takes a village to maintain these transactions for 30 years. And we're not even thinking 30 years. Our, our idea was in perpetuity. And so who's going to be around to actually monitor and manage these long terms? It's, it's a struggle. All right, we, we, we've exceeded our time limit. I apologize. And Jonathan, you do have the final word. Yes. Yeah, and so I'm going to open up a whole new can of worms. Oh, oh, oh. Get it. Yeah, yeah, there you go. But, but actually did get a, at least brief mention from Matt earlier, and that is when we talk about the, the risk assessment over time, particularly as supportive housing units, frankly, the likelihood of the services funding disappearing is far higher than the likelihood right. of the HAP right. contract right. disappearing. Right. And if the well services stated. funding disappears, well that property is going to be, it's going to have the same kind of transition issues. Um, and one of the things that I did appreciate, well, I'll mention later, is, is seeing in uh, one of the Chelsea loans approved, not just a generic statement about the services funding, but exactly what was in it, how much was in kind, where, where the funding sources came from, which then gives us a little bit of ability to assess the security of that part of the funding for special needs projects as well. Good. Let's give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate your comments and education. Hey, we're going to make a little agenda change here. I think um, this is too thrilling a conversation, and Delilah, to pick up on your thought, why don't we do a, a couple things, do a working lunch, um, take a 10-minute pause for the cause right now, and then come back here and let's sort of talk about what we've heard this morning. I think Melissa will circulate some menus and we'll order from downstairs, and we'll hear the business plan discussion over lunch and try to take a half hour before to sort of just re discuss what we've heard from this morning's presentations. Does that work for everybody? Yeah, sure. yes. All right, 10 minutes. Call back or various parts. Um, I want to sort of reconvene and, and take an opportunity to sort of, I know we've had individual discussions and it's great conversation, um, but let's sort of talk about what we just heard and a couple of the concepts. Uh, let's take about a half hour and then figure out if we need more time. Um, Don's presentation is pretty much in our materials, so we can save some time um, by asking 
smart questions or and save a, the, the presentation, but he is available to present if we need to, um, if we need more time. So with, with that in mind, there's some fantastic stuff. Um, Delilah, I think I'll let you lead off. Um, before we get started, yes. are we back on Curtis? Yes, okay. I checked All right. with him. All right, very good. Go ahead. Yeah, I, let me compliment this, the, the team for putting together such great speakers because yes. I think it really mm -hmm. gave us a, a huge um, insight into really what we're, what we're looking at and what, what role we can play. And it's hard, you know, it's always hard to, to, to sit at, the, at these meetings and understand that Cal Chaffee can only do so much, right? Like we can't like change X, Y, and Z, um, you know, as much as we want to. And we can't use any funds to do capacity building, <laughs> crazy things like that. But there's, there's, I think for me, three, three things that I would like us to discuss if we can. Um, the first, obviously, is the transition reserve and kind of where we are philosophically around the transition reserve and without getting so micro uh, into the weeds around underwriting guidelines, just kind of just a round table just to see whether the presentations today really changed our minds or not around how we're looking at transition reserves and what we're, you know, what we should care about. The other thought that I had was around tax abatement and what we as a public agency, quasi public private agency, could really do uh, relative to recommendations around tax abatement to incentivize developers to set aside some of their maybe class C buildings transitioning to class A buildings as affordable and whether they could record a covenant and whether we would be the entity without giving them any money that would do that and then that would make the board. So just, just some ideas around the tax abatement that I have that I wanted to talk to the group about. And then the last is I think that it would be really interesting to talk also about the innovation housing type and what, if, what can we as Cal HFA do to encourage innovation and a reduction of construction cost uh, by innovation, I mean by innovative product type um, in terms of our loans and what we could do to, to kind of create maybe a pool around that. So those are the kind of three things I cared about and, and also what Ben was talking about in terms of, you know, whether we can marry our, our, our product, our loan product with the new IRS leg uh, legislation or reg regulations. So that, that was kind of my thoughts. Before we get into the weeds of the transition reserve issue, because the, the commentary that came up again and again is what's the likelihood of that the HAP contracts will be renewed? You know, and I have some general historical knowledge of the preparation process for the Section 8, et cetera, but I'm, I'm not current on what the landscape looks like in terms of contract renewals and likelihood and, you know, how those issues that they're underwriting to seem like they're pretty es essential to this conversation about the transition reserve. And so I don't know if anyone in this room has that, like, Didn't we have can a give team a little that just went to Washington? Just, yeah, just, just a little bit of uh, the kind of current moment on that and what, mm -hmm. it, what, it, what, it, what the landscape looks like. And I'll, I'll let uh, Preston uh, chime in as well. But the, the, there's two different type of HAP contracts or housing assistant contracts. There's the HAP contracts that come from HUD's multifamily that are that go to a particular development or a project and they are renewed regularly and then there are rental subsidy or project based mm -hmm. um, vouchers that are assigned to a development that are administered by at the local level it is our belief and understanding that the HAP contracts that are administered by HUD multifamily are pretty much guaranteed I mean we haven't seen cuts or non-renewals and those type of rental subsidies. I think the more difficult to manage and the harder ones to try to, uh, are a little less certain, would be the project-based Section 8 vouchers that are coming from housing authorities, and I'll let Preston speak to this, but that's more of a, 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 a because of the way they're administered and how they have to keep their lease up rates and some of the management, but that's our understanding, and I'll let Preston take it away. And just, you, you mentioned the 60% utilization versus 100% budget authority, and that's the part. That yeah, so I think that I, I agree. So there are two different vouchers, right, and so we've established that, and I think that there are different pressures on each, and um, <clears throat> so it is true historically, the multifamily side of HUD and Ben actually worked there, so he knows things much better than I do about this, but it seems like that has been 
protected and feels like there's been um, uh, appropriate funding annually for that. Um, but the president's proposed budget for this year was a 16% cut within the program, right? And a lot of that was home and CDBG, but it does also impact the housing choice voucher program. I think both on both multifamily and the, the public Indian housing side, the project-based vouchers. So I think that there is pressure coming that way um, that is unknown, right? And, uh, and then the second part would be that pressure that you're seeing locally. And it's really the rising costs of housing in the Bay Area or the, uh, or the coast or LA, right? Where you're seeing the HAP contracts just are growing and you're not seeing the allocation of funds. So um, I, um, the, for Fresno, we're at 95% of our utilization. So of the 13,000 vouchers, we're at 95% of that, whatever that number might be, 12,500 or whatever it might be. Um, uh, but we're at 102% of our budget authority. And so we are spending our, all of the half dollars we get plus whatever we have in reserves. Um, so I think that there are housing authorities throughout California that are that really are at that 60% utilization, but 100% of their dollars, uh, and they're just going to continue to see the pressures. So the, uh, the response that you're seeing at the federal level is to increase the tenant paid portion from 30% for housing costs to 35%, right? Which doesn't sound like a whole lot, um, but it does start, it is a lot when you're that household. I know that Santa Clara, um, uh, as a move to work agency, has kind of played around with um, increasing it. I think they're at 32% just to see what will happen if they increase the tenant paid portion of, uh, of the rents. Um, and, uh, I, I, and I think there's probably some interesting lessons from them uh, uh, as a result of that. The pressures around work requirements, um, which um, have not historically actually worked uh, in terms of having long-term impact on families, um, but that might all of a sudden start changing what happens in the dynamics of these properties. And so I, I think that, uh, as I said, I tried to get away from transition reserves, but uh, I'm really with the Lila on this one now, trying because I think that the world is really not upside down, but it could become that way very quickly. And I don't necessarily want two years so that family can then think about where they go. I want to figure out how do they get to stay in place for a long period of time. And I don't know if that means slowly increasing the rent versus overnight increasing the rent is somehow better, but somehow that transition's got to be not just about eventually they're dislocated, um, but are displaced. This is an important topic I'd like to Way, way, way in um, and offer my thoughts. N number one, on the PBR race, the HUD administered contracts, you know, the, the, the Trump budget, which was a slash and burn for HUD, in, on that line item did propose a modest increase. Um, so even the sort of worst case far end of the spectrum on the PBRA did, 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 did propose fully funding it. I think that speaks to its incredible sort of bipartisan support there. Mm -hmm. um, on, the, on the PB. PBV question, so the public, the Housing Authority administered voucher contracts. I, I press, I think you kind of got around this, but I want to just put a pin on it. Um, I think there is a real possibility that we could see significant cuts to voucher programs over the next couple of years. I just think that's, a, that's something we need to be ready for. That said, for almost every housing authority uh, in uh, the country, the, in the state, uh, the, the share of their overall voucher portfolio that is project-based is not more than 25%, with a few exceptions. And because those housing authorities have entered into contracts with uh, developers, owners, with those contracts, it means that those are going to be the last to, to get abrogated. So the first thing, even if you've got massive cuts to your voucher line item coming from HUD, the first thing the housing authority is going to do is stop reletting new vouchers. That's going to be the first line of defense. Second line of defense, I suppose, would be to start terminating voucher outstanding individual housing choice vouchers. Mm -hmm. Only once you've done all that would you then go back and start abrogating, I think, these contracts that you've made as a housing authority with the owner. Now, that said, there is, there is some variability out there in terms of what those contracts actually say and what the terms of those contracts are. If, back in the old days, the best you could do was a 15-year contract on your PBVs. Um, now, I think the industry standard has moved much more to the, f to the 15 times 2, so 30 years. And so I think the, the risk, if there is a risk point, is, is just at the end of those contracts, not during those contracts. And what we need to make sure we're doing 
is that those housing, housing authorities are at least given the full 30 when they're going in and Cal HFA is underwriting behind them because that pushes this transition risk way the heck down the line uh, to a place where we don't really need to underwrite it. So I'm in the camp of let's not spend a lot of time underwriting big reserves. Let's march forward. Um, so. Well, so, yeah, so I mean, just my, my one kind of comment on that, because so I agree with you, but the contracts the housing authorities are signing say subject to appropriations, right? And so it's 15 years or 30 years subject to appropriations. Under sequestration, almost every housing authority in California did adopt a, a termination policy and many housing authorities actually start terminating families because under sequestration, there were no dollars. I've, I've always advocated like what you just said is that those contracts are gonna be protected. But I also know that the, the industry standard is about 75% of the voucher dollars that come to a housing authority go to small mom and pop landlords, right? So what we're talking about is we're going to protect a large multifamily owner versus someone who has two units of Section 8. And, and, um, and uh, when it push comes to shove, I would, uh, even though I'm a, uh, all of our project-based vouchers in Fresno have come to the housing authority, uh, um, <clears throat> we, haven't, we don't have the private owners yet, though we're considering and talking about it. Uh, when it push comes to shove, I, I'm not so sure my board was, is going to protect that property, the large property owner over the small mom and pop, right? <laughs> and so I think that you're totally right that that's the dynamic, but when dollars actually get cut, who knows what, what boards will decide. And, and for me, yeah. what, what, uh, I don't want to take us off of reserves because I have a, something different I'd like to set up for the vote. Yeah. So, so just to kind of add a, a, a different uh, you know um, lens on this um, you know one of the things that Tina had mentioned earlier was the idea that at the end of the day and you heard it in the private uh, sector conversation you heard it when they kept referring to partners they really really meant that they're not going to take the project they're not going to take the project risks as lenders or investors and while they expect their developer to take the risk you know and be capable of taking the risk on a guarantee basis because they have good financials at the end of the day they're looking for their partners to help absorb that risk and so that means the public sector right so that means us as a public sector lender it means the the locality it means that you know if something happens like Cecile just basically bluntly said you know the county's never going to kick out their clients from these DHS operating subsidy units they're just not going to want to do that so i think that this is more it, it's a dynamic that protects the for me protects the residents first and foremost and then secondly protects our ability as public lenders to you know maintain maintain our our loans in place and keep them healthy and maintain you know kind of our our security and, and mitigate our risk now, if the project doesn't have any money and can't do it, then that's, I think, a different conversation. But when we're looking at the ACT rehab deals that we've been doing and the refinancings that we've been doing, where people are pulling out, you know, 40% of the, of the equity out as cash, in those situations, I think that from an underwriting perspective, we should take a look at how to protect ourselves as a public lender. Um, as well as the residents, as well as the project, and not let that equity kind of, you know, leave the leave the project. Um, and I'll just uh, underscore that that the bottom line is is that uh, if they are looking at us, they didn't mention that, but they are <coughs> looking at the public entities. Bottom line, um, as the saviors of these projects, and the banks. I'm talking about public. I'm representing Cal HFA, not mine. Uh, but I'm talking about the public entities. They are, they are, I've said in all, th yeah. yeah, I've said in all three of those the seats. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, bottom line is, is that they are, they will, if in the event of, of, of a disaster, um, the first uh, entity that they'll go to is the public entity um, to, to save the project. So that in mind, when they were talking about the reserves, the first thing that came to my mind was, and them letting that go, they didn't say who that money was being let go to. 
but I can tell you who it wasn't being let go to, which were the public entities. So I think we need to think about, in our developing a solution related to those reserves, think about how that money could come back to us. Because ultimately, when things go really badly, they're looking for the public entities for a bailout. And even if we don't bail out that particular project or help those particular folks, there are lots of other projects that we're working on where we could use that money coming back to leverage other properties that might be in dire need that may not have a uh, big fat uh, operating cash flow in the end of, at the end of the, the day. I mean, what they, I heard again and again was the inefficiency of locking it up at a project level. Yeah. Yeah. And I know the advantage of the Cal HFA is your, the portfolio we have, the ability to do it on an aggregated level is presumably much more efficient mm -hmm. in terms of the risk and matching the risk. Cool. Yes. <coughs> well, the so idea is that you would, you, would, um, you, you would scale it, right? So on an acquisition rehab transaction like we've been seeing, where where folks are pulling out cash, um, and you know, deservedly so, and there's a cap contract, then we uh, underwrite the risk and you know look at it from kind of Ben's perspective. Like the HAP, the HAP contracts administered by HUD have a very low likelihood of not being renewed, right? And you look at the terms of the contract. And in that case, you know you wouldn't necessarily you wouldn't develop a transition reserve, but we'd all have to know that if it did happen and those half contracts went away, then you know our mortgage wouldn't be paid. And, and are we gonna be in a position to enforce our mortgage being paid? Um, and the only way to do that is to increase the rents, which means to kick out the, the residents living in, in, the, in the place that they <coughs> Right, so that's one of the things that we have to analyze. And then in the deals where it's an acquisition rehab and there's equity that's gonna be paid out, and it's a local housing authority that's issued the contract, and it's a 15-year renewal, but it's an on, you know based on and it's subject to annual reappropriation or annual appropriation. Then for me, that is a no-brainer. That is something where we should establish the reserve, and if the project has the money to establish the reserve, I don't mind burning off the reserve, saying like, you know, day one, at 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 permanent at at permanent conversion. It is five hundred thousand dollars, but then every year that the contract is renewed, it burns down so that, you know, it burns down to a point where it can get eliminated and then, you know, reestablished. Um, so you're not holding just five hundred thousand dollars in cash and just leaving it there for fifteen years. So there are sm much smarter people than I that can actually figure that out, <laughs> but that's conceptually something that I would be okay with. And I, I was thinking the the PBRA contract, the multifamily site section eight, did get an increase, but there was um, there were people who argued that was the shift from the public and Indian housing for the red deals that now have PBRA contracts, and so, um, but there's no no doubt that it's stable, much more stable than PIH. So, um, and I'm I, I think that I agree with you that it, this is kind of seeing something that might happen that isn't happening because the reality is if the budgets are cut severely. It's not just Cal HFA's portfolio that's it's in everybody. trouble. It's like the whole industry's in yeah. trouble, right? And um, uh, I mean, sequestration kind of sent those shock waves of what was going to happen to us if that stayed in place for a long period of time. Uh, there are ways to do it. I mean, uh, so we do transition as much as I so as a developer. I don't like them as a as a Cal HFA person. I think they're interesting and maybe worthwhile, right? So it's kind of. Um, but we do exactly what you talked about. We, we put dollars into the transition reserves, and after five years, the funds get released or whatever um, back to the housing authority. So there are ways to, to set it up. But what we're really worried about, what happens in year 10. And then the last thing, because I know you raised it, and I just think it's really important, is VHHP really is putting um, reserves for services up front, right? Because we, uh, uh, um, CSH is actually doing a, a review of the three permanent supportive housing developments that we did in Fresno to kind of think about have we done the right level of services, have they been successful, and, um, and to think about our service, uh, services being provided, or are they funded at the right levels. With VHHP, we did fund services up front, right. but I gotta tell you, added 60,000 
per unit, mm -hmm. right, in TDC because we capitalized a bunch of services to make sure that as we serve homeless veterans for the next 30 years that we're not going to run out of money. So I, uh, you know, so we have this high cost, but this high reason why it's there, and um, it's just it, everything we're doing is driving costs, lowering production. <coughs> Can I have Michael and um, Deborah come up to the um, table, and as we're talking about this res uh, reserve issue, you all—they've been working on this internally, and if they could lay out what their thoughts are so that that can the board can hear where you think you've landed on some of these issues and so we can have a little bit of dialogue about that I think would be helpful did any of the board members have anything else while we're still on this reserve issue okay I, I would only just say I'm sorry Tia, I would only just say that if, if the project can afford it I think we should consider it if it can't afford it then we shouldn't consider it um, and that happens at the underwriting level as opposed to the board level okay Right, I agree. Can I ask one more question? Yes. Um, it's just, I know that, I don't know, whatever it was, eight, ten years ago, there was a huge priority and a lot of the state money is coming down for specialized services, populations, and housing that serves special needs and homeless veterans and these other, you know, we're however, however many years past that big push, what has been the experience on that stuff to date? Is, it, is there enough of a track record to look back and, and I don't know how meaningful it is as a percentage of the total of housing that we're, is either in our portfolio or, or generally um, on the services side. Let me, make, let me get some clarity on your question. Are you saying how are those permanent supportive housing units, um, what's their track record? In terms of the services funding remaining in place or how, how the ser levels of services have endured. And uh, Deborah may want to speak to this, but when we've done our special needs housing, it's mostly been with MHSA <laughs> dollars and those services go for the life of the project. But that's how they were, okay. that's how the program was created. So we, CalHFA can speak to its special needs housing, but special needs housing that is either MHP, supportive housing, or e, I don't know that we could speak to that. We might, Ben might be able to have that, but we could probably see what data we can find and get back to the board on that. Was that accurate, Deborah? Yes, that's okay. correct. <laughs> well, but but the underwriting, if you wanted to do like say five units of MHSA within a larger development, the underwriting was happening in such that some of the reserve requirements were applying to all of the units, which then made it the cost to the project equaled or uh, was greater than the MHSA dollars coming in. And so then I know private developers opted out of doing MHSA because of the reserve requirements and, and instead of just and applying to the it. reserve requirements that MHSA was putting on it or <laughs> the reserve requirements that who was putting the on it? MHSA, the MHSA. The, and I understand MHSA does what the local jurisdiction wants and there's like all kinds of, conf, uh, not confusion, but conflict and tension over that. But, uh, but some developers who wanted to do a small number of units we're finding that uh, investment of MHSA was going to cost them a lot more in terms of reserves uh, and therefore opted out of doing MHSA units. And so I do think there is experience around uh, uh, whether you get the no place like home, I have no idea where that goes. Um, but uh, I think it would be worth looking at reserve requirements with your MHSA. So did our reserve requirements on MHSA change by jurisdiction? Like, do My different jurisdictions have different reserve requirements? Well, it depends on if you're speaking about the MHSA program or the special needs housing program that replaced it. Under MHSA, it was $500 per unit for the replacement reserve for and all units. And that applied to all units, yes, not just MHSA is. units. Ah. Which is, so if you have a 100-unit yeah. development and you want to do five units of MHSA, it. it applied to all units, and you went from 250 per unit. Right. For but that changed when we went to the voluntary program? Well, under the special needs housing program, the local jurisdiction can dictate the program parameters more so. They create their own term sheet, their own RFP, right. select the projects, et cetera. So what Preston is identifying is an issue that no place like home needs to actually put on their radar to make sure that we don't get into an issue in the future. Especially since uh, no place like home is saying it can't be 100%, so you're going to have a lot more <coughs> mixed Mm -hmm. income developments mixed population that's correct okay right. you're on okay <laughs> well we since we're talking about transitional operating reserves I thought I'd start with just the basic operating reserve requirement which 
you heard our panel this morning talk about six months as a standard that is pretty much a standard and that's what we use um, we haven't moved to go into three months for good developers or strong projects at all um, at this point um, replacement reserves we have a, a, a standard of uh, $350 a unit for senior projects $400, $400 for family and 500 for special needs uh, rehab we treat more uh, tailored to the, the uh, physical needs assessment we start out with a, a thousand dollar per unit capitalized operating uh, replacement reserve um, and then we add to that uh, based on the, the PNA and what the projected life of all the basic elements are and are these higher than TCAC standards yes they are and that's because we're the lender and tax credits are different you know they're they're not okay, they don't have the debt on then the what property. are the industry standards on replacement reserves well they were uh, spoke about those this morning uh, most of them will defer to the local lender or public agency that's financing the project we're kind of in the middle ground between the public sector and HCD's requirements for the reserves um, are, are that you that referring to the HCD I'm sorry is lower or higher? No, HCD higher. is higher typically on the replacement reserves and then, than we and then local government mm -hmm. local governments it depends uh, city of Oakland and some of the others theirs are actually higher than Cal HFA's they're at five to six hundred a unit it, it depends on which program of course you're looking at financing locally um, each of them have their own parameters but so affordable private perm lenders what are their replacement reserves in the industry I would say 250 to 300 right currently so 250 to 300 compared to our what 400 350 to 400 yeah yeah 350 for seniors 400 for family right so we're a little more conservative okay and uh, just as a side note I, I would imagine TCAC and HCD have looked at their assets Based off of based off of some analysis, so I mean, I, again, as a developer, I wanted it at 250. As an owner, I wanted it at 500, right? I mean, so it's kind of a. And ours are higher than TCAC, correct? Correct. Yes. But not, but not HCD. Uh, no, we we we, we actually revised our regulations late fall, last fall. You allow you to to our actually line up with Cal HFA so we are down to 500 per unit level. Uh, with the with the qualifier saying that um, you know if there's a third party you know if it's an act rehab and there's a third party um, uh, P and A that's done then we'll when, then we'll underwrite to that low, that level if it's lower than 500. So you're 500. Yeah. Three fifty and four hundred. Oh. And then well we're at five hundred for permanent supportive housing. Correct. Right. Okay. Special needs. Right. So on uh, you know I the industry used to have it as. 0.06% of the cost of the project and it wouldn't have an escalator in it um, we don't escalate right our, our reg agreement allows for us to escalate over time we underwrite where it under it will escalate at 1% per year so that we have the capacity to increase the reserves if needed over time yeah so so when the underwriting when our underwriting guidelines were I think that we should just take another look at our underwriting guidelines relative HCD and and what the industry is saying because what Cecile is talking about perm lenders tend to do is they escalate at tranches of five years and release so it sounds like you know catch and release but you know they 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 escalate every five years and then they reevaluate every five years and then release uh, if it's not sized right. I don't know that they release their replacement reserves over time. They might release their operating expense reserves. Mm -hmm. they, no, no, they release it if it's overfunded. That's what I'm talking about. If it's overfunded. The overfunded portion. Overfunded, oh. or they may they may reduce, reduce. the monthly payments. Or right. right. I don't know that they release it, but they'd reduce re future <laughs> payments. Correct. Right. Like, and if you use it, you have to replenish. It. Correct. So I think we're in line with the industry standards. It, we're in between the, you know, conventional lenders, and then HCD and TCAC. You know, we're kind of in the middle ground. We're we're at the high end. I would say that we're at the high end. We're not at the middle. 
if, if I may, I just pulled up to double check. So, so we do have it at the lesser of 0.6 or 500 per unit, except in so far as there's a third-party P&A which we can rely on, or if there's a, we're with another party. So if if we're in with Cal HFA, then we defer to the Cal HFA standard. I would be curious to know if you have looked at your existing portfolio to see how it's actually performing uh, in terms of the reserves. I don't think we've done it systematically, mm -hmm. but I mean, anecdotally, I, there are very few properties that reserves are an issue in terms of maintenance and ongoing repair, but we do have a, we have a handful. Because mm -hmm. that might also be a barometer to look at to determine whether you're too high or too low. Yeah, absolutely. We know what our right. portfolio is. So. Yeah, we have a lot of data there, exactly. just taking the time to, re to analyze it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> So on to transition reserves? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, um, the discussion earlier uh, about the source yeah. in, in, in of the, the reserves is you know, very much in our thinking in that the project-based rental assistance that comes from multifamily to a project specific, uh, we view as a least risky and the least, you know, place where we probably don't need an operating reserve. Uh, they tend to have a 20-year contract. <laughs> a transition reserve. Tran transition reserve, I'm sorry. Um, they tend to live on 20-year contracts and they historically get renewed. Um, what we are looking at is uh, the next level of uh, operating reserves that are locally based. And, and by that we mean they could be HUD money, you know, the ultimate source, but they're coming through the housing authority. Um, and, the, and therefore, the term is typically 15 years, I think, what we're seeing. And, uh, and then we're also seeing new, new locally-based subsidies like in LA and some of the bond, recent bond uh, passages that have uh, that kind of a program. And so there's not a lot of experience around that. So we're tending to think that we need to do transition reserves for projects that have less than a 15-year term if they're locally administered. And so we would base our decisions on that and uh, size the reserve for a year, a year's worth of uh, the difference between the Section 8 rents and the, uh, the market rents. Did I get that right? Uh, the difference between the regulated rents. Regulated rents, right. <laughs> Correct, Excuse me. and the Section 8 subsidy. So it's the overhang, essentially, one year's worth of reserves. And then, we, of course, we look at the other partners in the deal and their requirements, and so we're not going to double uh, require if, if an investor or, or another lender or local partner has reserve requirements. We will take that into account in our underwriting so that we're not doubling up on the, on the uh, developer. Mm -hmm. And we'll be looking at the, any partnership agreements or agreements such that if the project was to go south, that we would be able to utilize those Right, reserves. who controls and, and yes. where they stay the project or go to the To go prevent to the displacement of tenants. Mm -hmm. Okay, correct. So that's our current state of the art in terms of our reserve standards. Any questions by board members? Real, just real quick, so the scale of this, and when you to hear um, Matt speak, he's talking about this big chunk of money that's just sitting there doing nothing that just galls the private yeah. sector. If I, am I describing it accurately? Yes. How, okay. how big galls of us too. <laughs> <laughs> how big, I mean, what, what, what is the order of magnitude we're talking about here on a singular and collective level? I mean, on our portfolio, how much are we asking to, cumulatively is being, yeah, is being held in these reserves? I haven't thought about the cumulative level, but yeah. it, on the project level, you know, it depends on the loan size, of course. Um, but we're seeing reserves of a couple hundred thousand to four to five hundred thousand for project. the larger projects. For project, yeah. And, and I'm trying to think on a recent RAD transaction I that, that we did a couple of years ago um, that our as either the lender or the investor wanted a transition fund, and it was somewhere around 20000 per unit um, that then did get released after year five. And do our operating reserves stay with the life of the project? They do. And um, capital reserve, do they stay with the life of the project? Yes. Uh, well, they typically get used over time. Right. And then there's a point in time where they need to, they're either going to recapitalize or, or we're going to have to take a look at 
the remaining useful life of the project and do they need to adjust for that? And I did a math error, it's 2,000 per unit. I was trying to divide the number in my head, so I missed it by zero. Okay. Not 20,000 okay. per unit. <laughs> that meaningful, that's meaningful. Because I'm just, I was sitting here next to Tia hearing that discussion as to whether this is a pooled risk that we should, how much money do we need to be keeping how is it, is it being, is it unused yeah. money? Cities? That concept of a pooled risk is an interesting one. We've talked about it internally, and of course, if, if we were to pool it, then it wouldn't be uh, built into the loan. Uh, we'd be setting capital aside that would not be earning interest, basically. Um, it, it, you know, the, the risk to the state's portfolio, both at HCD and, and here, is, is such that, you know, it, at a conceptual level, having a state reserve to, to mitigate against that is, is something to consider. I mean, I, that would be a legislative change, and you know, that's not my position to recommend those changes. But it's a uh, it's an interesting concept to, to, to pool the risk and, and have a pool available for that could be done on a project specific basis, or if we have a national reduction in funding that hits everybody well so, and so that's the counter argument of course is it, uh, pooled risk works if you're only if you're only having liabilities come in individually if we collectively everything defaults right. those contracts yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah then, then, then you're dealing with a much more catastrophic <laughs> issue um, so again do we distinguish by the type of project and the type of loan that we're making or is it this across the board that you apply this standard um, type of project, whether it's like seniors or? No, no. Um, yeah, well, that and also, is it a new construction oh. loan versus an at rehab? Well, we have different replacement reserves standards for new construction versus? No, no, I'm just talking about the transition. Transition. Reserve. I'm sorry. That's really related just to the, the source and the term of the subsidy contract. We don't really distinguish between the type of tenants or whether it's a new construction or act rehab. And whether or not there's there's cash to fund it or not to fund it. Correct. Right. I, I think what I would propose that the board consider is that we keep it all the same for across uh, that that we establish it based on you know we support staff in terms of how they're doing it now um, but that the concept of whether it actually gets implemented or not depends on whether the project can afford to pay for it or not. And, and that's how you guys are doing it, right? I mean. Well, essentially, yeah, you look at all the available cash to develop the project and. For example, there was a project that came recently to the board and based on the developer's experience and the cash flow, we did not recommend a transitional, and I think this was Sabrina's project. Is Sabrina around? Yeah. There, and, and was that a HAP contract rental subsidy, or was it a project-based? It, it was project-based. From the local government? Yes. And, we di and did it have other subordinate debt financing in that? Yes. And so after you looked at everything, you did not recommend, yeah, come on, come up to the front. <laughs> You did not recommend a transitional operating reserve, and then you had some things that you used to try to mitigate what you thought were the risks. So remind the board what it, how you structured that deal. Um, I mean, I, I think you've covered the main the main points that we found. Um, it, you know that we we um, there, there there was some discussion and some disagreement. Um, all, you know, I mean, among staff, I would say as well, uh, um, in terms of you know what what was necessary. But I think that's why we're hoping to get you know a more um, uh, developed guidelines here. Um, but it was so it was in part that the county of San Diego um, they were only able to put uh, it was a 15 year um, project based voucher, 100 percent. And um, they were not able to give a 20-year um, uh, term, and so, but they were providing, uh, uh, I think, 1.5 million dollars in soft debt, um, and um, then also the developer was uh, experienced developer who has projects with Cali Jaffe, and we've we've worked with quite a bit. Um, it was also serving. Um, 
a, 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 a lower affordability level um, that we wanted to make sure we supported. Um, I will say also that it was something that um, I hadn't included in my original underwriting, and um, at that point, um, I don't think we had it in our, so it, it was fairly late in the process um, for us to be, for me to ask the developer to include this extra cost. Mm -hmm. There was also some additional reserves that were required by um, the investor. And so once we sort of took a step back and looked at the whole picture, it seemed like they had adequate um, reserves for that um, for that uh, overhang for that year. And remind us who the developer was? Chelsea. Okay. So in that particular case, we did not require a transitional operating reserve. Correct. It was a partnership with the county, mm -hmm. which the county was bringing project-based vouchers. They were also bringing in a subordinate debt. Mm -hmm. We had experienced developer and portfolio. Now, what you would be, if that project was coming now, given what Michael and Deborah have kind of outlined as kind of these are our standards, mm -hmm. you would be deviating from those standards? Yes, that request was a deviation from would have would be a, a deviation from because it would have because and it's because it was local rental subsidy as opposed to <coughs> federal well just be, because I, you know I, I I don't know that we we haven't discussed deviations other than if if the project can afford it which um, it, it is a bit nebulous well, I, to me as an underwriter I would just say that we've kind of refined our thinking in terms of the source mm -hmm. and the term. Okay. We used, to, we used to think that anything less than 20 years, regardless of source, required a, a reserve. Okay. What we're saying now is that 15 years, or if it's less than 15 years, mm -hmm. so in that particular case, they had a 15 year contract, okay. we would not require. Oh, so it wouldn't be okay. a deviation. Would it would fit with what Sorry. your current thinking, yeah. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you get your comment answered? Yeah, I'm just, I'm like, just sort of soaking all this in. I think yep. what I've learned today maybe is like the, the, the nuance of the varying risk between the local, local funneled project based vouchers and the federal contracts. And then the other thing that came up by the panelists, and it, we didn't have to address it yet, is the difference between the rehab and the new construction in terms of the level of, you know, how is it enough rehab? And I, I didn't get the chance to follow up with the question on the um, person that was here about what do you mean by that or how, what's what's the risk and the concern is that it's not is that other systems are going to you know fail or is it a marketability issue but so I'm just that's the yeah. other thing that's mm -hmm. putting them out of our I may be expressing my own uh, ignorance here but when we talk about physical needs assessment what is the what what is the horizon for that does it line up with the uh, with the contracts or not? Does it line up with the loan mm. or not? Do you guys want to take a stab at that or do you want me to answer? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it, you know the answer. The, the typical <laughs> physical needs assessment is over a 20 year horizon. Um, and we figure after 20 years the building's going to need work and another fresh PNA. Um, whether or not that lines up with the subsidy contract is kind of happenstance. I mean, it just you have c contracts of varying, and, it, and if, it's ex if it's a new construction and you have a new subsidy contract, then yeah, it would line up. But if you've got an act rehab, you know, you might have an eight year remaining on in a contract that would, we would hope to get renewed. Um, so they don't necessarily, the two things don't line up. Let, let me let me interject. He, I think he's talking about the perm loan right. and uh, as opposed to the subsidy yeah, loan. Right, right. So on an ACK rehab, when you get a PNA on an ACK rehab, you want to make sure that the, the all of the rehab that that project needs is going to be, a, uh, it's going to be to the standard that that rehab is going to last for 20 years. So when you have them saying, depending on someone who's coming in with light rehab, means maybe they've cut corners and that they haven't, done enough rehab to ensure that that rehab is going to last the length of the loan. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so when we are looking at this, we want to make sure that the rehab on our ACK rehab deals, that the rehab has been done so that it would be for the length of 
That's right. Deborah's grabbing her mic, so <laughs> we'll let her. No, finish that's it. correct. We we do require the twenty year PNA, and as part of that, there's a what's called a replacement reserve needs analysis, that specifically looks at the proposed scope of work, the findings from the inspection of the building systems, and determines how frequent or what the remaining useful life of the existing systems are, and when they'll need to be replaced, and. From that, we can determine what the capitalized reserve deposit needs to be in combination with the annual deposits so that we have adequate funds over that 20-year period to address everything that may need to be addressed. So it's a very complex analysis. We have construction inspectors that look at the site. We look at third-party reports. We analyze this. We make sure there's enough cash to accommodate the needs of the project. And if we find that we've overestimated originally when we bring the deal to you, we use set standards for the replacement reserve assumptions. And if the findings come in that they're doing a lot of rehab and we don't need as much reserves, then we will reduce those prior to loan closing. So I know there have been questions about how do all these rehab deals have the exact same replacement reserve deposit requirements. And that's because you're seeing our initial estimate before we've gotten the final replacement reserve needs analysis and scope of work identified. Thank you. Can I ask one more follow-up question? Since these reserves are at a project level, I don't know in terms of our asset management portfolio, do we have any view of like in aggregate what those project-based reserves look like? We do. I couldn't tell you yeah. offhand. Oh, yeah, no, I'm just curious. I'm just curious if that's is. something that we kind of is part of our. Okay. Yeah, we, we do. Okay. Thank you. So, if I may, a couple, few more questions on your case study, Sabrina. Um, when considering whether or not to allow that to, uh, to go without the operating or the, I'm sorry, the transition reserves, was the balance sheet of the developer one of the factors? N no. Okay. Um, was the fact that the county had dollars, other dollars in it, a factor that made you Yes, okay. definitely. Um, and I'm going to editorialize and say the county should bloody well step up with more money. They're hoarding cash right now. But <laughs> <Woo. laughs> record. Oh, are we on record? <laughs> are we on record? <laughs> Let me just say. Right. I just blew this under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whole county of San Diego, what the heck. Um, and then the, the, other, the other thing is that bothered me is the phrase you said, well, sometimes we will not do the reserve if a project can't afford it. And that the thing, and what that sets up is, does, are those not the very projects that should probably most have a reserve? Uh, yes. And uh, I mean, as an underwriter, and I'm, I'm speaking from my own, this does not reflect the. <laughs> but to me, I mean, none of the projects can afford it. So, uh, 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 and uh, how, how do we determine, you know, what projects can afford it and what can't? Well, the um, ones that are getting $13 million paid out in equity. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> I think equity out is, is uh, yes. So, so let's start, okay. let's start or, or setting up parameters. So right. our debt service coverage ratio is 1.15. Right. So someone who wouldn't even be, we wouldn't even bring that to the board, okay? <laughs> and if they're taking equity out, um, they have a smaller LTV. Right. And um, we wouldn't bring in somebody who was bringing and taking an equity out and ask you to not put in a transitional operating reserve. That wouldn't be coming to the board to ask you for that. So, so, so that's good because that, that starts okay. setting up parameters. Yeah. So right. there, to me, there's, there's five factors, right? The source, um, I think for, for the first time in a long time, it's been really crystallized, at least to me, that federal source versus the local source. So that should be one of the factors. The second should be this whole concept of the term, right? And I think 15 years is a pretty standard, you know, term uh, to evaluate it. Not 20, not 10, but certainly 15 is, is the right term. Um, whether it's a refinance versus a new loan, right? On a refinance, then you have the issues of LTV, debt coverage ratio, uh, equity, you know, distribution. So I think those are two separate products that should be looked at separately, whether it's a brand new loan that's originating uh, for a new construction or, 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 or an act rehab deal, or it's a refinance of an existing loan that we have, or somebody else's loan that we're re refinancing. And then the other is whether, you know, the factor is a subordinate, you know, there's a subordinate lender or not. If there's another partner involved in this that can actually help take on the burden 
of paying a debt, you know, paying our debt service, if the HAP contract goes away, then we don't really have a risk, right? Because there's a subordinate lender in the transaction. May not have a risk. Or, or may a not have a risk. mitigated risk. Yeah. Right, it's a mitigated risk. So I think those are the five factors that we should look at for exemption of whatever underwriting guidelines you have. And if we can look at those five things and how each of the how the projects deviate in each of those areas, then I think there's a better comfort level that the assessment is, you know, thorough and thoughtful and consistent across the board. Um, and then in terms of sizing the actual reserve, I don't think that we should size it. I don't know how people are sizing it, and I I, I keep hearing different things, so I'm really a little nervous about it. Um, but again, the sizing is. The differential between, you know, the max regula regulated rent that we could charge versus what is actually being collected from the from the resident, right? So if someone's at okay, so 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 we have to define that, and then do we do that for six months, twelve months, eighteen months, two years? Like, what is the transition period? Okay, well, the transition reserve is the difference between the regulated rents, which may be at fifty or 60% or lower, and what we're getting from the subsidy provider. So it's not the difference between the tenant's payment and what the regulated rent is. It's the regulated rent to what HUD or the project-based vouchers are paying the project. So that's the difference, the shortfall, that the project would realize if we bumped, if the Section 8 vouchers went away, the tenant had to start paying the regulated rent, we'd still have a shortfall of the difference that HUD used to pay for that owner. Okay, so then that becomes the issue because the way you're, from an underwriting perspective as opposed to, and I'm sorry we're getting in the weeds on this, I really apologize, but I think that part of it is that we should be up underwriting to break even operations of the project as opposed to um, the fair market value that we get in a Section 8 rent. So if break even operations for a project is at you know, uh, 1,200 a unit, but we're actually yielding 1,400 a unit, we shouldn't set up the reserve to do the differential between 500 and 1,400, it should be between 500 and 1,200. Okay, the overhang that I've described is the industry standard. Of the for, overhang. Yes, yeah. of the overhang. Yeah, and I, I, I got a message from one of my staff, and for us it's two years of the operating subsidy. So it's not even like not even it's it, not even the differential. It's, not, it's no. like two years oh, of the operating subsidy, subsidy yeah. and then it does get released after a period of time. Right. Uh, and then um, the sixth criteria, because I, I I was reading did, my email. Did, did I do five? No, I, I know you did five. I was going to throw in six if it, if you didn't do this already, which is lo Source location. Term, uh, refinance versus new subordinate loan. So it was well, five. okay. Well, I, I was going to throw in another one saying mm -hmm. location, because I I mean I. I was really impressed by one of the presenters who had very low renovation requirements because they were doing what was needed as the property, as the operator, right? Um, but that also is a factor of getting the annual adjustment and five-year adjustments to the Section 8 contracts, right? And they're able to get more dollars than what, and uh, maybe people at this table don't know, but the people over there know that, you know, two properties in Fresno with College FA finding, uh, fundings are really difficult because the amount of subsidy we get to operate is just not enough to cover what's going on and those properties are in trouble. So I think location might be another issue um, that... Uh, right, now are you talking about capital reserve or are you talking about transitional reserve? Uh, I'm talking about the capital reserve. Oh yeah, no, we're just talking mixing transitional reserve. Oh, I'm mixing, mixing, We're just sorry. talking transitional. My bad. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, Preston. <laughs> well then my third thing is, is that I'm not the... the the, the the Brown Act person, but I don't think you made a resolution. And is this like no, this is just discussion. Yeah, this is just discussion okay. for, for to what give is that, is give no staff no guidance so that we, we don't, no don't have to. Yeah, I mean that's kind of and then yeah. the sizing then becomes whatever the industry standard is for the sizing, which is what we're doing. Which right. is what you're doing. We're currently at one year of okay. the overhead. Okay, Jonathan. So part of my personal failings is I keep trying to think of these issues in terms of projects I've known and loved and or known and hated. <laughs> and I'm trying to, and, you know, in all, my, in all the years that I've been digging around with this, and it's not, I haven't been directly, I haven't followed all that many projects, but the only project that I know of that really had all these issues went bankrupt three times within 15 years. 
and it was not a problem with the capitalization or anything. It was just a really crappily designed project that nobody wanted to live in. Mm -hmm. um, and so it got beat up unmercifully, and it just mm -hmm. was a total tragedy. Um, so I'm sitting here thinking, well, what really has been the experience on the utilization of any of these reserve funds? Right. And I, I hesitate to raise the question because I don't think our staff should spend, I think it's a, yeah. an interesting project, but I'm not sure our staff should do it. But I think our staff should look for an enterprising uh, intern in a graduate program somewhere to look at the history of our here? portfolio and bring some like kind of analysis to us. Uh, you guys didn't get to meet my mentee. I'm yeah. sorry. I meant to introduce you to her. But Adra was she was floating around. We yeah. actually put her to work. Yeah. Did she have class? She class? Yeah. Okay. So McGeorge has a mentorship program, and I was supposed to introduce you to her. So it would just that. it would be interesting <laughs> to see a case, an actual case study over the last you know 10 years of our portfolio. How many projects have had to dip into replacement reserves or have triggered transitional operating reserves? And what's, what's been the story? And are there, are there lessons we can learn from that? And would that in any way inform how we develop the criteria going forward? Yes, go ahead. I like where Mr. Hunter is going. Yes, sir. Um, the only refinement I would like to suggest we think about there is we're in 2018. Ten years back puts us in 2008. <laughs> we had a lot of distortions in the market at that in. point. I would just simply like to observe yeah. that the measurement period may be something other than ten years. <laughs> I'm not smart enough to know what it is, um, but I'm, I'm, it's resonating with me the idea that some kind of sampling on this I think would be of some benefit to us. I'm going to venture to guess the distortion over the next three years are going to be unprecedented. You so think so? Yeah. I think so. Maybe. So do I. <laughs> yeah. That's the only reason I'm worried, I'm worried about it. So. so before we put this discussion to rest. I, I think the last serious note is I think Ben's totally, I don't know of any project that has drawn on transitional funds. I, I can't think of any housing authority that I've heard of that's done it. So. Um, I don't. I don't think this is about you're going to find something in the last ten years. I think it's really Whatever. about. And you actually, like me, you brought up actually like the operational or capital reserves, uh, but transitional reserves. I just not have heard of it, but it does make me nervous. So, if, if I may, uh, go ahead. Sorry, if, if, <laughs> if we do, Cal does wish to pursue this through an intern or other resource. I would love to offer ACD as a partner on this because I think our, our interests and questions are the same here. And we'd right. be happy to dedicate some staff as well to collaborate right. on mm -hmm. a kind right. of joint review. Right. So uh, we have had a lot of board discussion about transitional operating reserves. We do have some very good factors that we use in our underwriting standards before it gets to loan committee or senior loan committee. We do talk about these things. I wanted the board to have a in-depth understanding about how we go behind the scenes and what we do before we bring it to you so that you could have an understanding. I think staff does a very thorough job on the underwriting side. We will continue to look at those factors, but I have to tell you, I don't want us to go in search of a problem that doesn't exist. And we've spent a lot of time on this. And so I really wanted you guys to be thorough on this and I think in our 40 year history on the multifamily side, we've not received one uh, foreclosure. We've had maybe a project or two that has had to have some workouts, but I, once again, I don't wanna go in search of a problem that doesn't really exist. We will continue to monitor the uncertainty at the federal level because we are in uncharted territories which is why we're constantly going back and looking at industry standards. We're talking to our partners. We're working with our partners, whether it's private sector or other public sector. But we will continue to do our due diligence on the back end. Good. Thank you, Tia. OK. That was nice, Michael. Thank, thank you. you. Um, do you want to bring up Tim now or go to Don? Did it? Okay, so what's, we what's did have a fantastic mid-year report with all of our projections. I, I, I believe I had gotten some uh, feedback from board members about um, uh, how we reset our business plan. Like if we, we, we set a business plan, you all vote on that business plan. 
And then mid-year, we try to come up to you all and then we tell you where we are and how, what our revenue projections are. And so that was all laid out in Don's memo. And so he did a really good job. He had a wonderful presentation, but his presentation takes about 20, 30 minutes. I don't know if you want to hear him talk or whether or not you want to just have specific questions I'm that you totally have about mid-year. I'm totally good for it. Totally good. Yeah, and it was here, and all of you read your packets before you got here, didn't you? That's right. I mean, I welcome yeah, any questions, questions you guys okay. might have. Okay, yeah, about let's go. We're going to go straight questions. to questions That's then. Good. Thanks, Steve. I'll be really brief. Um, I'm interested in the, uh, learning more, and it doesn't need to be now, but I would like to know more about, the, it says we created a naturally occurring affordable housing program to preserve naturally affordable units in communities across the state. I'm not sure if that's something you can talk about briefly or if or we can get information. Well, I, I think I'll, I'll defer to Michael when he comes up to present on multifamily, but I would say that we have closed at least one naturally occurring affordable housing project that he can probably talk a little bit about, as well as we have one in the pipeline as well. And that's really where, you know, the current market is naturally affordable and we're trying to Preserve maintain that and regulate it so that as uh, the community is maybe in the process of gentrifying or, or rents are starting to go up, that we'll have that regulatory agreement in place and be able to keep those units affordable. Okay, so I'm intrigued in hearing more than when Michael comes okay. up. Second question is about GIS mapping, just some of the uses that that is being put to. I'm curious about. Well, we're trying to get it back in play. At one point in time, the agency had uh, some GIS mapping software that we were using to to track information on the, the loans and the, our lending activities and a variety of things. And, and staff have been toying around with this for the last couple of years, and so we're going to try to uh, um, implement uh, GIS mapping internally so that we can generate a lot of maps for you guys and, and internally track um, different attributes that we're looking for in our portfolios. And so we're, we're hopeful to have that in place by the end of the fiscal year and then be able to start uh, including some maps in our uh, staff reports and, and just reports to the board in general, but also for kind of internal use within asset management or the lending groups. Okay. So. I'm really intrigued by that. Everyone's talked about Richard Rothstein right now. We just had him down at our conference last week, and we overlaid maps of current like opportunity zones, mm -hmm. current Cal and Biro screen, other things like that, and the surprising correlation between historic patterns was, was interesting. I'm just intrigued by what, what we are doing out there and, and what effects we're having. Yeah, in, internally at this point, we've been just trying to scope it out because you, you, there's almost no end to what you can do nowadays with the with the mapping, depending on what you're willing to pay for. And so I think for us, it's trying to initially implement something that we know we will use consistently and not you know not scope it to be something where it answers every possible question that's out there, and then just kind of build upon it as we go. So. Okay. And the last question is. Uh, uh, the ADU pilot program, and I know, that, I'm sorry, my head is over full today. So ADUs came up a little bit today, but can, we, can you briefly describe uh, the ADU pilot program? Well, when, I, when I, I think in my memo, I indicated that we were just doing the, it kind of completed an initial phase, and that initial phase was, was reaching out to, I think, the League of California Cities and uh, CSAC, and as well as some local jurisdictions who have been uh, mm -hmm. working in uh, the ADU space and trying to solicit information on what type of uh, pilot uh, program they would be interested in partnering with us on. Um, I, I'll, I'll let Tim talk a little bit more about that in his presentation, but I would say that um, I, I don't think the survey yielded the types of results that we were looking for, so we've sort of shifted focus. I mean, it, it assisted us, but a lot of the jurisdictions are sort of all over the map in terms of you know how far along they are yeah. in, in that space or what they actually want to do. And we thought that it may be a better use of our uh, resources to maybe partner with a CDFI that's actually lending uh, in the ADU space consistently, you know, across the state, and maybe partner with them to to actually facilitate financing of ADUs. So okay. I'll let uh, Tim uh, layer onto that when he comes. Okay, no, that's a special interest in locally in San Diego. LISC is actually f helping finance a study that my organization is facilitating to create a, a handbook of designs that they're hoping to use then to go out so that you can like more readily get them processed. Okay. Pairing that with a financing source that might help bundle together ADU uh, in underserved communities so because individual owners don't have capacity. So the capacity right. of individuals is a big issue. Uh, and then a third, I've heard of an FHA program. Someone was whispered in my ear at a hearing that was about you could buy a property that was ADU eligible and the financing would actually cover the cost of building that ADU. So I just want to throw that out there. As and Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm. Well, like, so I'm, I'm going to hear. It sounds like from three different people right. here about these answers. Uh, those are. Those are my questions. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Um, I just um, wanted to compliment um, Don on your on your format of your email. It was really helpful, and in particular the mid year update, um, where you have it, you know, by goal and accomplishment, yeah. and yeah. you know, where you highlight in blue how right. much of it has actually been done or not. Um, I guess just from an overall standpoint, um, you know, there are some items that clearly have been done, 100 percent great. Um, there's some things that we specifically uh, ran to, to, to say, you know, we were carrying it forward. Um, and then there's others where, you know, we, we um, fell short of the goal, mm -hmm. right? So is there any kind of overview that you want to give us on that or talk through that or talk I, about That would kind of require of me kind of going through the entire PowerPoint each, okay. if you want to, but I'm, no, I'm no. happy to do it. Um, no, no, I was, I was just there's kind a, of- Is there a particular an one or two that kind of you're interested in? Well, we'll hear from multifamily. So okay. I think some of the goals were associated with the special needs program of multifamily. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, okay. So I think we'll hear about that one in particular. But no, I just thought, you know, to the extent that there's um, a number four incre increase in operational efficiencies, um, that seemed to be, you know, where a majority of the carry forward to 1819 um, gotcha. plays out. I just wanted to give you guys an opportunity to kind of talk to through that. Yeah, and, and the sort of the intent on the whole blue line, in, in many cases, if it's carrying forward or it's something that we've sort of reevaluated because maybe we, the more we've dug into it, the more we think it's really not functional for us. Uh -huh. um, you know, we, we've either carried it forward or are going to be proposing to eliminate it. But the, some of the things that look like they're partially complete, it's because it's a representation of the mid-year point. And so the, in, in all likelihood, a lot of them we anticipate getting done by the end of the fiscal year or maybe slightly over that, but I wanted to give you a fair kind of assessment of where we're really at, not yeah. just claim it's finished or whatever, yeah. so. No, it's great. It's a really great uh, matrix, so I appreciate the, the work on that. Okay. Don, I just had one question. So are we all out of money with Keep Your Home? Is that, are we done now? Um, looks like. I will say that we're, 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 getting, we're getting close. I, I believe the stats that we have in here reflect a 90% utilization spend at this up point. A lot of, spend and it all. we've been in recent discussions with the Keep Your Home California staff. Tony, I believe, Sertich is here and um, he's working as our kind of uh, uh, CEO of Keep Your Home California as it's getting uh, ready to wind down. But uh, um, it's, it's doing quite well. I, I think we're very confident that we will utilize all of the initial uh, funding provided by HUD and, uh, and, and some of the uh, surplus funding as well that we've received in terms of repayments that have recycled. Um, and so I think we're on a, on a really good course for kind of having that thing have a soft landing. And, you know, uh, the, the, the neat part done of a course, great job. it is, it's a great job, is the commercials. Um, every time I see that commercial, you know, that's what we do. And I don't know if we can use that to promote the program, but they're the greatest commercials and it puts a happy face on oh, yeah. who we are and what we can do. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the staff for uh, Keep Your Home California should be commended. They've done a great job from the here, beginning here. To, to the end now, so. Good, that's great, because I look to die because I gave her so much grief. Tim, you had a comment? No, I, 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 I just okay. answered it. Jonathan, do you? Well, I was just going to jump on top of that. As a board member who's been around <laughs> long enough to right? remember right? the massive public demonstrations about the failures <laughs> of the Keeping Your Home program. Right? It's particularly nice to see how effective it has ultimately been because the staff has continued to work with public feedback to make changes that made it a very effective program. Okay, how many were here when I had that very the first, first board meeting? meeting? And the My very were here. first board meeting. Delilah, were you here? No. You were here, Teresa? Teresa was yeah. here. Yeah, we Literally, were. they shut then they shut us down. They shut us down. People in purple shirts. That's right. And we, I was at a different meeting because yeah. your board meeting, I think, was at SHRA, right? And they were in the... No, we were at the, the, we at the, we're at the, the high, Holiday Inn. Holiday Inn, oh, right yeah. here, top floor. Yeah. Oh, I thought you had protesters at... We, we did. At we did. They we came, did. They came yeah, around beating drums. Too. And in LA. Through the, the building. Yeah. yeah. And they literally shut the board meeting mm. down. Yeah. We've come a long way, board. Long come way. a long way. I, I guess yeah. if I was going to uh, summarize something operationally that I guess I just mentioned the board that's in your packet as well, is just that um, all the efforts that we've been doing internally uh, to streamline operations and kind of uh, put the, the balance sheet on as good a footing as possible and sort of growing um, the, the upside of the organization financially, I think, has paid off. And, uh, you'll note in the board packet that Moody's recently upgraded us, and those of you that yep. know the rating agencies know they're the slowest to move 
Um, not that I'm on the record. I love Moody's and <laughs> keep, keep it coming. Do. But um, you know, they they up, uh, upgraded our overall uh, issue rating from uh, from um, A positive outlook to A one positive out. Oh, I'm sorry, not I'm sorry. They upgraded us to A one positive outlook on our overall credit rating, and uh, for the multifamily indenture, they took us from an A one stable outlook and then upgrade us to a positive outlook so I, I that for them that's a huge huge jump so i just want to commend staff for that. Yeah, we'll bring tim up in, but i do want to thank don and jennifer yes. our our admin and side has done a phenomenal phenomenal job i don't know if you all recall but one of the first things we did when we um uh, came into this position and 2014 was we had an organizational assessment done and as a part of that organizational assessment they looked at um, revenues and uh, legacy funds and, and Tim had worked hard on this to see how long would could we run out before we had to turn things around and I think it was a seven-year runway and so with the efforts of this very stellar team we've done it in less than three so I'm, I'm very happy with some of the things we have done internally and administratively to get us back on the right track, to get our credit ratings up, to get our lending programs on. And so it, it's very exciting, but Cal HFA has a stellar workforce, and I'm, I'm very proud to uh, work here at Cal HFA. Here, here. Here, here. Good job. Good, nice commercial. Okay. Um, Tim, you're up next, but before that, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we, we skipped over the minutes this morning. They were included in the packet, and so unless there's any objection or anyone wants to comment, let's deem those approved. Yep. Good? All right. Perfect. <coughs> Mr. Sue. And as, as he's coming up, I did send a little note to, uh, to, uh, to Tia, kind of since on Saturday Night Live, Carly B was just there, and I just said to her, like, yeah, we don't got to dance. We make money moves here. No, so, yeah. <laughs> so that's the Tia B, no, right? No, you didn't. No, you didn't. <laughs> yes, he no, did. That's why I was over here like, Again, oh, Again, no. videoed and recorded. I know. Oh, <laughs> Cal HFA won't be the same. Oh, my goodness. Tia B. <laughs> that's a good one. Okay, Tim. Sue. And on that note. <laughs> All right, who wants to talk about home ownership? I mean, I know I, it's, it is a different topic from um, what I think we spent a lot of time talking about this morning. There was one person, I think, upstairs uh, this morning um, who talked about rental and also home ownership. Um, this is very different, I think, in terms of topic from what we've been covering today. Um, but one of the things that we talked about a lot internally is that Cal HFA as the affordable housing lender for the state of California, we have um, a need to provide tools for all housing types and for all households across the income spectrum. Um, as I go through this presentation, you'll notice that um, um, my, most of my clientele are not um, the $10,000 a year that uh, President was talking about earlier. Um, and that population needs to be served along with the whole spectrum. And this is a conversation we also had in depth in February when we had asked the board to raise the uh, maximum AMI for our home ownership program from 140 to 150. And um, there's a slide in here in which I'll go, I'm going to hark back to that conversation a little bit. But anyway, um, I'm here today to talk about why is it that we do this? Who do we serve? Where our lendings are? Uh, how much of this do we do? Um, what you know? What do these people look like? Um, and sort of the, val the value proposition that we bring to the table. Why do people come to us? Um, certainly, we don't force people to come and uh, be our borrowers. They come to us for a very good reason. Um, and to wrap it up, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the ideas that we have for the rest of this year and also going to next year as well. So to, to um, this, this particular presentation has a lot of breakdown on the, what the population of our bar borrowers looked like in 2017. So to kick off this sort of uh, data um, dive, I'm, I'd like to talk a little bit first about what we've done um, both in 2017 and since we um, launched into this uh, lending model uh, in 2013. So since we started this lending program in 2013 to the first quarter of 2018, we helped 18,491 working Californian families. Um, our mission, I think you know, is uh, to help um, Californian families um, have a place to call home. And I think that uh, when I worked in finance, we tend to round numbers 
to the millions, but I think that um, when we're talking about families, we shouldn't, um, and I think every family counts. In 2017, would help 6,888 families, and that um, amounted to $1.8 billion of lending, um, and about 70% of that, 73% um, to be precise, um, uh, was uh, using our FHA product. Um, and about 30% of that uh, use our conventional products. So I'm going to come back later on to break down what that looks like, including uh, touching on, on the point that Stephen was making about ADU. Um, and um, about this time last year, we also started thinking about um, how much of what we do is, um, how much do we do as a proportion of the marketplace? And um, for the first three quarters of last calendar year, our lending represented about 3.8% of the overall first, first time home buyer market. Um, I, I, I think that's actually, although normally, again, back in finance, we don't think that's a big number, but I think that when we're talking about how big the state is and how many players are in the, in the marketplace, that's a very large number. And also in terms of impact, uh, one of the things that, uh, that's happening right now in the purchase market, um, by purchase market, I mean that um, there's actually a lot of transactions that are done via cash. About 40% last year, about 40% of the home purchase activities uh, was in non-financed um, uh, transactions. They either did cash or any other kind of transaction. So given that the purchase market um, is, um, that, that given that the first-time home buyer market is about 60% of, of the purchase market, um, Roughly speaking, you can imagine that we did about 2.5% of all the purchase transactions in the state last year. So we, I, I like to think that's significant, and I hope so. Uh, it's about 2.5% of all purchase transactions. Um, so uh, we, we think that in, we do this, and we think we do it pretty well. Otherwise, we wouldn't have this kind of market share. So why home ownership? Um, this is because this is work for housing. This is a very different demographics than uh, rental housing. Um, I think that this morning we also talked about a, a lot about um, the various uh, federal and state uh, resources that comes into the equation to make rental housing possible. But in large part, what we do does not require any federal subsidy, or um, and it's in that way. Um, very independent of some of the dynamics that's happening um, in DC. Um, it's workforce housing, and this is a topic that I think that we've been talking a lot, a lot about, uh, not just here in this forum, but also throughout other um, forums on this on affordable housing um, for the city of California. Um, for the rest of the presentation, all the numbers I'm going to present are based on our production for 2017. So about 43% of our lending went to people who were below 100% AMI, and about 57% of that went to ones above 100% AMI. This 43%, albeit, has declined. When I look at um, what we've done, if you will, ever to date from when we started this program until now, that 100% AMI is closer to about 50%, meaning that people, um, when we look at that overall time frame of lending, um, the people who were below 100% uh, AMI was closer to 50%, and then that is declining to about 43. And I think that's that's just a different uh, um, different way of manifesting, if you will, um, some of the other topics we're talking about in terms of affordability in the state. Um, so the lower half of this chart is, uh, is a, a more detailed breakdown of the AMI picture. Uh, only 2% went to uh, below 50%. AMI, um, about 17%, one seven, seventeen percent are between 50 and 79, 49%, that's between 80 to 99, and 34% between 100 to 119. And we do have 23% um, a, a that also went to 120% plus. So a couple of things. Um, you can see that while we're really, really proud that 43% uh, of our lending to folks who are families who are below 100% uh, AMI, you can see that the bulk of our lending is in that 50 to 120 area. You see that 50, uh, the 80, I'm sorry, it's the 80 to 120, the 80, per, at 80 to 99 is, represents 24%, and 100 to 119 represents 34%. So those two segments alone represent uh, nearly 60% of our lending. 
So this is a very different demographic than I think that um, what we've been talking about this morning. The one interesting thing to know here is that you'll see that, um, and this is a dynamic that we see all the time in the marketplace, you'll see that the reliance on FHA product, you can see how that declines as the AMI increases. And on the conventional side, that's sort of the flip side of that, that it um, increases as the AMI uh, increases. So who are, who are borrowers, who are customers? Um, there are, as I've been saying, that there are a different demographic than the rental market, but they're the working families of the state. And um, as I was playing with uh, these numbers um, for this presentation, I realized that on the previous slide, uh, while it's very interesting for us to always talk about AMI, I thought I needed to do the slide because the AMI kind of gave me a, a, a sort of a layer buffer that I didn't really connect with what was really happening. When I did this slide, though, it kind of brought home sort of what, what, at least for me, I sort of have a deeper connection to this because um, only 52% uh, uh, of our, our borrowers actually make um, less than $70,000. And you can talk about, uh, uh, there's, let me see, see for myself, I think, I can think about AMI all day long, and AMI sort of turns into percentages and these fractions and all this stuff. But when I think that you know half of our borrowers actually make seventy thousand dollars or less, uh, it kind of kind of affected me in a different way, um, and and this too, um, if you look at this, you can see that the bulk of our lending is done in that fifty five thousand to seventy, that seventy to eighty five. That the bulk of our lending is still in that sort of middle from fifty five thousand to eighty five thousand uh, dollars. Uh, which is, again sort of emphasizes the point of uh, different uh, different demographics, um, but again we we feel that on the one hand we are doing really well in terms of serving the low to moderate income, but you can see where you know the bulk of our business is sort of right in that middle uh, range as well. Um, this is a chart that I should probably show the board when we're talking about that 140 to 150 conversation. Um, we rolled that out on January 16th. Um, so the next time when I have this presentation, we'll certainly have um, the experiences from this year. Um, but I, I hope you agree that this is just a different sort of impact when you look at AMI from looking at the actual income. Um, so another slide on who our borrowers are. Um, we think that we do a great job of reflecting um, the diversity that's in the state. Um, about 56% of our lending go to Hispanics. Um, this is on the ethnicity that's identified by the primary borrower. Um, uh, before I go into this, um, when we look at the, all the data, actually there are times in which we actually capture that um, a lot of households are actually multi-ethnicity. Um, but for this analysis, we're just looking at the, the self-identified ethnicity of the primary borrower. So the 56% go to Hispanics, 29 go to um, white, and 9.1% go to uh, African Americans, and 4% go to Asians, and um, less than 1% uh, went to uh, Pacific Islander and also American Indian. Uh, last year when I presented this chart, this caused a lot of conversation. Um, let me, did you have a question? <laughs> And, and it, was, it was in part because I didn't have any statewide percentages to compare with. So this year I brought that with me and you can see that um, in terms of comparing um, our client base to the statewide demographics percentages, um, we do really, really well in the Hispanics um, segment along with African Americans. We're very proud of that. Um, however, this morning, I, as I was preparing for this presentation, I thought of a complication. And I think that is uh, worth thinking about, and it's, it's, uh, it's something that we're working on as, as well. And I think the reason why we do better in those segments is that you hear a lot about how uh, African Americans and Hispanics are lagging in terms of home ownership. And since we are only in the first time home buyer market, I think it makes sense for us to be doing more business for those two subpopulations and less business for um, white and Asians, who are probably more um, disproportionately represented in, let's say, refi market. So, um, so one of the things that we are doing um, is we are working with folks who can give us better data on first-time home buyers. Um, and as I mentioned, this is just a 
a straight statewide um, percentage, for example, 39% Hispanics. This is not 39. This is not 39% of the first-time overall first-time home buyer market are Hispanics. Um, so I think that, but 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 nevertheless, I think that these are good percentages. Michael, did you have a question? It's a good chart. So where are our borrowers? Um, the top four counties represent uh, a whopping 60% of our loan production. Um, and the top 10 counties uh, represent 82% of our production. And in large part, if you look at, um, if you do a deeper dive, you can see that most of our lending are, it's, it's almost as if we carve around or wrap around um, some of the high cost neighborhoods or high cost um, cities or high cost uh, counties. Um, the next slide kind of brings this point home that uh, this slide talks about um, how much um, they're borrowing and how much are they buying. And you can see that our sales price are significantly lower than the median that you hear about in the press or uh, you typically see. Um, you can see that our average um, sales price last year was $273,000, and that, that compared to the state median last year of about 449, and I know the number that you saw this morning is even higher. Um, what I did here is that I, since all these transactions happened throughout the year, I just did a straight average uh, of the uh, median sales price from last year, which came out to be 449, but as you, as you know, that, that kind of escalated throughout the year. And then because of the lower sales price, uh, we have a loan amount, uh, an average loan amount of only $266,000. Um, again, I, I think that sometimes when we look at these numbers, it's sobering, and um, it tells us a lot about um, who we're serving. I would also like to touch on who our lenders are. Um, one of the big differences between multifamily and single family is that we are not a direct lender. Um, we have, um, now we have about 100 plus uh, approved lenders and um, our products have to compete in the marketplace. They have a lot of choices and they have to have a good reason to use our products to serve their customers. Um, the top five of our, our top five lenders uh, do about a third of our loan production. Um, Guild, New American Funding, Mountain West, American Pacific, and Golden Empire. And the top 10 lenders um, do nearly half of our production, about 47% of our overall production. So um, I mentioned this earlier, is that why, well, why do people come to us? Um, first and foremost um, is that we do have a value proposition. Um, we, um, we have certain attributes that we inherit from some of our relationships with Fannie Mae that we pass on to our borrower. So for example, um, we allow a higher CLTV, a combined loan to value ratio, um, that we allow our borrowers to have. So we go up to 105. And um, a lot of times, um, if you were a, just a conventional lender and you're doing 97% first lending, um, through Fannie Mae, um, there is something called LL LLPA, which is Loan Level Pricing Adjustment. Um, our relationship with Fannie Mae is one that's uh, termed as HFA preferred, and HFA, under HFA preferred, there's no LLPA for 97% loans. So again, we pass that benefit to the borrower, and that's not insignificant. That could be like um, Fannie Mae and the GSEs, um, are all about risk-based pricing. So um, depending on what the whole box looks like, that could be up to words of like a point and a half um, for a 97% uh, LTV first lien loan. Um, we also have, um, I think this is something we report to the board, uh, we also manage the state's um, down payment assistance um, loan program, and we also pass that program to the borrower as well. Um, in addition to having a value proposition for the borrowers to come to us and use all the things that we offer, we also feel, uh, given, um, as Jonathan was saying, that um, we um, 
have had um, a history in which we sustain significant volatility uh, because of our single family portfolio. Um, so learning from that past, we are a big advocate of sustainable homeownership. <laughs> Um, and we do that through these programmatic overlays that we have. Um, that's one thing that's very dear to Tia's heart, Tia's heart that I uh, spend a lot of time working on is that we have a mandatory home buyer education and counseling program. Um, the education is um, probably more prevalent, but the education piece coupled with counseling is something that's a little bit more unique and is something that we require. Uh, we also require a home warranty protection program for a year. Um, as you know, the customer base is um, the, the unique customer base that we serve uh, tend not to have too much money in the savings account. Um, and that's something that we feel that is a good way to protect them uh, as well um, as, they, as they sort of learn the ropes of and how expensive it is to own a home. Um, and we also feel that we um, Im uh, impose, in, depending on your view, um, impose um, prudent underwriting overlays. Um, we don't allow um, coverage ratio higher than 45%. Um, the GSEs actually allow up to 50% now. Um, we don't go over 45. Um, and we also impose a minimum FICO score of 640. Um, so, so those are those are things that we bring to the table in which, on the one hand, I think that borrowers come to us because they feel that we can help them get into the homes that they want. On the other hand, we are um, bringing certain things to the table that perhaps others are not to make sure that we are putting people into a home that they can keep. Yeah. Are any of those underwriting criteria, have any of those shifted from you know, the heyday of the mid-2000s? Um, <laughs> you mean you mean um, our when compared to our own, or yes. you mean uh, well when when we used to do that? Um, one of the things I try not to use is acronyms. So I know sometimes you hear us using this term TBA. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to use that. Okay, but so the big difference between our old lending model and the new lending model is that the old lending model was non-conforming loans. Now, that could be many things. That could mean all the way from like not, you know, subprime to ninja to whatever other acronyms that you've heard of, right? But the point being that that was a credit box that we drew up ourselves. And whether or not um, you have a view or anyone has, has a view that, that that credit box was good or not, that, that's put us aside for a moment. The key thing was that we were not able to sell those loans mm -hmm. to the GSEs and get back a mortgage by securities in which we lay the real estate risk off. That was how we kind of, that, that was the, re, that was in a nutshell the reason we got hurt because we couldn't pass that risk on when we saw the writing on the wall. And some of those loans arguably were really, really good loans. Um, and some of those loans, probably the valuation was very stretched. Um, we probably had a mix, but the, but the key thing is that we retain real estate risk. Today, our lending model, we do not do that. We don't retain any, any of the real estate risk. The real estate risk is sold to the GSEs and um, while we impose these um, overlays, which we believe um, promotes um, sustainable homeownership, the risk is not ours. Mm -hmm. But we still want to make sure that we are putting people into homes that they can keep, not just for a year, hoping that, say, real estate will continue to go up, that they can keep for a long time. So they're all conforming loans. families possibly being displaced that probably captured loans from us. 
Um, or do you see any impact on that? Or do we even have stats on, you know, these first time home buyers, whether they were citizens or not, or just immigrant families that purchased homes? Come on, we're in a sanctuary state. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, well, we'll see. Right, I, know. Um, I can't confess I thought about that yet. <laughs> um, well, let me just share it. The reason I, I, I'm bringing it up, I think it's a, it's a really critical point, um, especially here in the well, you know, Bay Area. We're seeing a lot of families, you know, um, that are the income profile that you just talked about, um, been here many generations, purchased their home, and are now being displaced in leaving their children behind, but they still have mortgages. So are we, I mean, that's a volatile market. I mean, we haven't really seen the shakeout because we are a sanctuary state, um, but you know, that hasn't really, that ship hasn't really sailed as far as the policy nationally. So I'm just curious if there is any think tank going around that, and if there isn't, I think we should probably think about it because, um, you know, how are we going to protect protect the investment and protect the family so that whatever this reform happens, people still have their homes? I don't think it's something we've thought about, board member, but I think it, you've flagged an issue that we probably should do some internal thinking about. Because I have to say, I, now that you say it, a light bulb just went off in my head, and I don't, I just don't think that that's something we had been thinking about. But. We'll be well, just given that our percentage is so high, mm -hmm. and most likely, we'll, we'll we'll definitely have to have some internal conversations about that. Right. And then staying on demographics, the I was surprised to see San Diego and Fresno both at five percent uh, because I think that there's a larger population in San Diego than Fresno, and I think five percent might be more than our statewide. I, I guess what I'd love to see is that statewide numbers are are uh, that's not the right way of saying it. Uh, I, so I think Fresno is like maybe 3% of the state's population. I think San Diego is much more than 3%. Um, so who's performing higher and, and then uh, or lower and then why? You know, so I can see that, uh, and, and is that like a function of what's the existing home ownership rates within San Diego? Is it the cost within San Diego? Well, I would love to know that, you know, a little bit more about that demographic slide. And as Tim said, we are trying to get some better first-time home buyer data from uh, some of our partners and breaking that down a little bit more. And so that's something we've been working on internally as well. Yeah, but I'm, I, well, it's not, it's really just about why do we have 5% in San Diego? I would think it would be higher or what? 8% of the population. 8%? Roughly. The okay. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then who's underperform? So LA, I, I mean, I, they seemed, are they higher as a percentage of their statewide population? Are they lower? I didn't, I just didn't quite know. And, and um, so, I, I, and, and that's some, is that, is that an issue about the local market conditions? Is that, I, and then Sacramento, off the top of my head, was way higher than its proportion of state population, right? right. And, so, and, and so, and why? He was giving, and part of that is our population is first time home buyers. And he's comparing first time home buyers to everybody, as people who aren't even home, first time home buyers. So I think what we need to do is we need to get do some thinking around getting better demographics where we're comparing apples to apples, so to speak, so that this is the population that we're serving out of all of the first time home buyers as opposed to this is the population we're serving out of California as a whole. Does that make sense? Okay. And then the other demographic that was uh, the number that uh, was interesting to me was the 150 or so individual or household buyers under 50% of AMI, right? And uh, it was a really small number, and I was just kind of curious about what was what what was their profile like? What are they buying? And and I, I was just kind of curious about them and. And uh, and I guess my kind of follow up thought is like is that if that becomes a population we want to be targeting, what does it take to help them become homeowners, or is that just not going to become a home ownership group that we work with? So that's more of a question, not like something to an not a question. It's more of like a more information kind of thing. exactly. Yeah, I think the, in terms of the, the location, I um, you, you talked earlier about the GIS. I think that. Um, 
I believe I'm not, um, not that I have any control over this, I believe that I'm, I'm not trying to compare our outcome to the population. I think there's, there, um, I have this cynical view that while we have a choice, we should continue to exercise our ability to choose. Um, that I think that people are finding what affordable housing stock is in terms of home ownership, and they're, they're going there. This conversation about um, people commuting far, far away to the uh, work, um, it's not clear to me that I have all those answers in my head right now or, or ever, um, but I think that what you're seeing is people gravitating towards the housing, where the housing stock is, and we're doing more business in places like Sacramento because there's more affordable housing stock in Sacramento County. Or, um, I'm not sure about the city, but county. Um, but I think that if we had some sort of GIS up and running, I knew who had a way to show a map of where the affordable housing stock is in this sort of band that we're talking about, maybe comparing it to that, maybe more um, apropos as to compare it to just general population. Um, that's just off the cuff answer. And, and it was Stephen who talked about GIS earlier, not me. He's much smarter. I don't quite understand. <laughs> <laughs> Riverside counties, thank you. Uh, we we don't we don't see ourselves at the top of many lists, but uh, <laughs> we're, we it was it was really encouraging for me to see so many loans go to our constituents there, um, as as exhibited on your slides. Um, one thing I did want to ask about is the uh, the partners that we're working with: Guild, New America, Mountain West, and America and Pacific, and there was another one as top part of the top five. Um, I was just curious, uh, I know that you've worked with uh, other conventional lenders, um, what space are they in on this continuum? Are they way below, or is it the focus, why, these, why, this is, why do you believe this group is so successful when I know that many of my uh, bank partners really struggle? Uh, these numbers, by the way, if you were to compare them to, to many banks, are considered phenomenal. We don't see the demographics. We don't see any of that, not even close. Um, I've worked at four banks, and I can tell you, as an example, the African-American numbers would fall way below 1% um, across the board. So just how, what do you contribute to your success there? I think that um, um, I don't want to name any of these lenders by name, but it's to say uh, there are a number of these folks who are in the top five. Mm -hmm. They have dedicated people who um, work on first-time home buyers. Mm. Um, and um, there is um, one that is uh, lo physically located here in California, but she's, she's a bit of a, um, did I just say she, she's a little bit of a, an expert in first-time first -time home buyers across um, the HFA space, um, um, our colleagues in other state HFAs. Mm -hmm. So she knows all these first time home buyer programs mm -hmm. and then she helps uh, the internal process to get um, people to understand these programs. While we do have um, uh, some of these lenders who have dedicated sort of personnel that can understand the nuances of the different programs, one of the things that is a, continu a continual friction in our space is that the lenders still would like less, fewer differences across, let's say, let's say California's program versus Washington's program versus Nevada's program, um, because they use a lot of systems and a lot, and even even in today's environment, there's still a lot of compliance needs. Um, so I would say that um, these m many of these folks on this list are successful because they have really dedicated resources and time to understand um, the nuances of um, our programs. And one of the things that we do that I don't ever talk about is that we actually have um, something that we, we, we track how many loans that um, a specific loan officer actually uh, makes in any given six months. And that's how we actually provide leads to those folks as well, because sometimes people contact us directly and say, oh, well, I saw your program online. How can I get a loan like this? Um, and then we will guide them to uh, some of these folks on the list. So there's a virtuous cycle there happening as well. Um, That's good to know. Thank you. Sure. I have a question. None of those are, are name brand names 
to me, which doesn't mean anything. I'm just curious, are those, are they, are those companies specifically, in addition to the person you're talking about, and one of them um, targeting first time home buyership away from Cal HFA, or are they just general mortgage brokers? I mean, what's their target? So yeah, these, these are definitely uh, not your, um, these folks, um, if, if all goes well, these folks should not be in the news. <laughs> Whereas, um, unfortunately, we're still hearing um, a lot of um, you know, news regarding you know, some bulge bracket uh, banks. Um, of the bulge bracket banks that you know of, only one, one of them um, actually has made like more than five loans last year using our program. Um, a lot of times I think that they have their own products that they, um, um, they advertise or promote or market. Um, so these are primarily um, mortgage lenders. They are correspondent <laughs> lenders. Um, and um, one, of, one of the dynamics that I think that um, some, you know, um, uh, some of you have heard about is that um, because of all the regulation on the banks in terms of retail lending, um, the banks have really, in large part, removed themselves from the mortgage lending area. Um, and um, away from CalHFA, you can see that the percentages of lending, mortgage lending, uh, done by your typical bulge brackets banks have really, really de declined. And in that way, um, um, some observers are getting nervous again because this, in some sense, was um, a little bit like this too, right before the last peak, um, in which um, the banks were not really competing for various reasons uh, against some of these mortgage lenders. Um, but yeah, the, but that's why I say that if all goes well, you shouldn't hear about these folks. Um, they are ne they're not your everyday banks. May I? Um, Tim, I just make an offer to you. Um, some of you in the room are familiar with this litany. The state treasurer has the responsibility to manage 1,600 bank accounts, eight banks. Um, of those 1,600, 275 of them we balance every day. 260 of them, seven of them don't matter, but the eight of them really do because that's where all the money is. Um, we sell $8 billion a year in bonds. We run an $80 billion investment portfolio. Every one of those bulge bracket banks has got a big log in our fire. To the extent that when we converse with those folks, because they all show up and say the same thing, they want a relationship. <laughs> so to the extent that uh, any of those folks uh, shows up and says they want a relationship and you need a greater degree of cooperation from them, you need to call me. <laughs> That sounds wonderful, and you have been saying that. We need to take you up on that because we've been having conversations with conventional lenders, yep. uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the only conventional lender actually that has is now actually a approved lender is Wells Fargo. Yeah. Do we have any other conventional lenders besides Wells Fargo that are approved lenders? Wow. That one might wow. be a bit more problematic. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. We keep talking to conventional lenders. Nevertheless, I have, I have an ongoing conversation with the CRA people, the relationship people, the corporate secretary, um, and the affordable housing people at Wells Fargo. So I'm not shy about an right. ask, even though there are some, there's some misalignment right now. And it's, I have to tell you, it is absolutely baffling to me that a conventional lender would not partner with us because it is immediately going to get them CRA credit. And I, it's just baffling to me. I, I just, I've asked and so yes, I would like to see some more conventional lenders on our approved lender list. Um, we have to be more in sync about not disclosing names, but in any oh. case. <laughs> yes, um, however, I do want, since, since, since it was divulged, that um, I want to clear Wells' name. What I, what I said earlier was that of the bulge brackets, only one, which is Wells Fargo, who has made more than a handful of loans with us last year. Okay, so while their name has been mentioned, I want to make sure that it's actually, from my vantage point, a good thing 
because they're the only one who actually played with us, and the others, um, not to be mentioned, um, have not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if I can add one more thing on that, because yeah. I don't want to leave this in a, in a way that would leave anybody that's listening and thinking that I'm being flippant about it. Um, the treasurer has taken a point of view on Wells Fargo Bank that there are some behaviors that were going on there that were injurious to Californians. Mm. And within his authority, he's taken some actions to respond to that. Now, having said that, there are any number of other agencies that interact with the state treasurer's office who make their own decisions on who they bank with and who they purchase credit products from. And I'm involved in that conversation. I'm acutely aware of um, the many other points of intersection that Wells Fargo Bank has with the state. And um, I think that it is that if some of those other agencies were sitting here, they would be quick to point out that, um, that they're uh, uh, quite happy uh, with the way Wells has chosen to interact with them. And I don't mean to suggest for a moment that I, I want to uh, cheapen that uh, in any way. ADUs, did you hit on ADU? I, I will soon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I weaved a narrative here. Um, so so the, a very important thing to our lending program is this um, pot of money that we administer for the state for down payment assistance. And last year, uh, we made this point that we'd like to have a dialogue with the state about um, creating more money for down payment assistance. And um, I think that uh, fair to say that the conversation went well, and now um, as part of SB3, there um, should it pass in November, there's $150 million of additional down payment assistance um, that would um, come to CalHFA to administer um, for future um, first time buyers. I would add that, um, well, let me touch this when I move on. So um, that, I think, is a, a deep dive into some of our activities last year. So now I'm going to go into some of our ideas for the rest of 2017 and also 2018. So many of these ideas um, um, complement or enhance our existing menu of loan products and clients. So in a way, um, the, the the, um, the dream that we're chasing is, is sort of the one I said very early on, is that we want to have a solution for, for every housing type and a solution for the whole spectrum of um, income um, as long as we can also achieve some of our other goals in terms of risk management, in terms of scalability, and in terms of sustainability. Um, we talked to the board. Um, um, back in February about um, also expanding our program to disaster victims. So this will be truly our first foray, if you will, into the non-first time home buyer space. Um, we are um, targeting this launch in June, which is uh, Home um, Ownership Month, um, and um, it's, uh, it's under programming. There's some systems that need to get enhanced in order for us to do this. And again, um, we are doing in such a way that we feel that um, um, we can accommodate um, future disasters. Um, that, not that I wish for them, but we all know that they will come. And we're doing it in such ways that uh, once um, it comes, we can always just add those uh, folks who are affected to the list, and we can serve them faster than I think that we're doing this first go around. Um, we're also going to um, create a loan product uh, for lending on Indian reservations. So this will be, in some sense, a subset of our lease um, program. And um, we think of that as both a loan product and also, also in a real way, expanding our client list. Um, we're also working on a refinancing program. And um, Fannie Mae, who's our key partner with the GSEs, um, they are under a lot of scrutiny to expand um, what they do under duty to serve, and to the extent that their duty to serve mandates um, uh, align with the things that we're doing, we would do everything we could um, to also add those mandates to our offering. So, Tim, what would that look like under the duty to serve? So, so, um, um, so for example, um, so um, this here is a 
uh, a very sort of bird's eye view of our menu, especially things we added recently and things that we're thinking about. So for example, you'll notice that under Fannie Mae, um, uh, and Fannie Mae manufactured housing, we don't have anything right now. So one of the things that they're working on right now is manufa manufactured housing under duty to serve. Um, and most of that is on real estate, on foundation versus chattel. Um, so there's um, manufactured housing, it's uh, self-help, um, it's um, Indian reservations as well. So um, for us, um, the, um, well, for us, the, when we talk about in, uh, lending on Indian reservations, at the moment we're talking about that under the FHA side. Um, I think that Fannie Mae is working on uh, lending on Indian reservations um, under duty to serve, and then the last up, update I got it was that they're, they're, they're negotiating MOUs with the tribes. Um, so, but I fully expect that to get done, um, hopefully before the year is out. Um, so anyway, so we track their beauty to serve very carefully and to the degree that it's something that we find can be useful um, and also serve to that goal that we talked about of adding housing solutions um, for different housing types to serve different income um, along the spectrum um, and it's scalable and sustainable, we would, we would add it. So on, on the top of this chart, which I'm just, uh, retracing a little bit of the things that we did um, recently in terms of um, pro you know, loan products we added or clientele that we have uh, starting to serve. Um, we we uh, added manufactured housing under FHA in October. We did um, VA in November last year. And we also added um, in February, um, I call it home improvement, but this is uh, the FHA 203K simple. So what this allows uh, <laughs> folks to do is um, um, add a $35,000 addition to their first lien loan, so when they move in, they can do some home improvement. So it's part of the first lien loan, it's not a second loan, which is typically what people think of home improvement. Um, we, we also started um, making our products um, be usable by um, folks who are working on community land trusts and also leaseholds. Um, and I believe that this whole Indian reservation um, lending is, is, is kind of a subset of the leasehold world as well. And some of the things that we're thinking about, uh, which I covered briefly in uh, the last slide, is um, here on the bottom half of the chart in terms of timeline. Uh, we will um, do the disaster victims um, before the quarter is out. Um, the Indian reservation lending is something we're thinking about for the third quarter. And sort of the second half of the year, there's going to be a lot of thinking about uh, refinancing products. And again, we're tracking the duty to serve um, mandates, uh, which are very fluid on, in certain areas. We're tracking those very closely, and um, we would we'll implement them, uh, implement them um, when we see um, the time's ripe. But last but not least, um, ADU. So um, this here is a chart on, we talk, sometimes we spend um, a lot of time talking about uh, um, the um, specialty products. Uh, that, that's not a, a word I'm using disparagingly, um, um, but it's not, they're not products we do a lot of, but they're still important in terms of having another tool in a toolbox. Um, so this is a quick summary of um, all these specialty loan products we've done ever to date. So this is not, again, since this is not just for last year, this is ever to date. Um, we have an EEM, this is an energy efficient mortgage uh, under FHA. Um, we haven't done a lot of these. There's um, a lot of reasons for this. Um, uh, what, what, uh, one of the things that I think Don and Tia both mentioned earlier is um, rationalizing our workflow and streamlining our work. Uh, I think in terms of uh, streamlining our work on EEM, we have one final thing that I want to accomplish, and hopefully after that, um, we can do more of these. Um, ADU, you might recall last year, we came to the board and talked about um, cha CalHFA changing our guidelines in terms of allowing ADU rental income to be included as part of the qualifying income for loans. Um, we changed that and we actually got nine loans that have folks who are moving into properties that have existing <coughs> ADUs. These are not new construction ADUs, but um, that small change did, um, you know, did make a difference for nine households. 
uh, manufactured housing, something which was launched um, back in October last year. And already we've done 55 of these. Um, when I ran these, um, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, and VA is something we launched back in November, and we also already done 10 of these. Um, the stuff that we launched in February, um, I think that next time when we look at this, we'll probably uh, see a few uh, of these um, come up. I'm hoping that um, we can actually partner um, in all sorts of creative ways under these community land trust programs and also leasehold programs. Um, these are sort of ways that we can connect with other nonprofits out there or locals out there in terms of what they could bring to the table. That's all I had. Was that a, I think Stephen was talking about an FHA ADU product, or what was this, it? That this was uh, uh, describing me conversationally, and I have too many of these conversations. So, but what I recall about it was that they, he was describing an FHA product that allowed it to be underwritten, assuming the income from a yet to exist ADU, so that the cost that it was actually a home improvement and purchase loan that would allow you then to build and then use generate income on the ADU. Have you encountered that? I haven't. We haven't heard that. Is that um, on the FHA side? That was the that was the conversation. So again, okay. like I said, there's too many rooms, too many people, too many conversations sometimes. But yeah, then let's look into that. Let's let's look into that. I mean, um, in a way, um, in a way, I think that that that's very. My guess is that that would be very lender dependent in terms of who would do a loan like that, because if there's a, a construction piece like that. Um, there's, a lot of risk. You know, there's some risk and also there's some disbursement issues, um, some compliance and monitoring mm -hmm. issues. But we can look into that. I mean, I think that on the ADU side, um, I, I totally agree with what Don was saying earlier. Um, um, when we started down the ADU path in terms of partnership with the locals, we were um, uh, somewhat tentative in terms of getting involved in funding the construction because we thought that that was not terribly scalable in terms of the amount of money that we had on the table. Um, but it seems like um, in the surveys that we came back, um, there was not enough emphasis on, um, there was a, well, there was a lot of emphasis on this education. Um, and we, 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 we do not feel that uh, we make a huge difference, I think, in terms of the dollars we have on the table. So we're going back to this idea of partnering with CDFIs who are doing the actual lending and actually putting up real units. Um, but I, we can look into that. Okay, because yeah, there's also state legislation that would change the fee structure, significantly reducing the cost of producing these ADUs. Uh, we would view them not as new construction, but as, as kind of a remodeling. Uh, so we could say, so we're expecting, you know, if the economy holds up to support this, we'll, we expect to see a flood of these things coming up. Any other questions? Tim, thank you. Great thank presentation. You. Thank you. Thank you. So, right. Mr. Chair, Michael has a multifamily presentation, but we did a lot of deep dive. Come on up, Michael. We did a lot of deep dive on multifamily earlier with some discussions. So, I, I don't know if the board wants to hear a long presentation from multifamily or whether or not. Michael can just give us the highlights and then we can have him available for specific questions that the board has. So that's my cue to you, Michael, to keep it really, really high. <laughs> nice to <laughs> receive. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I was going to say that um, I had three things on my agenda and, and fully one third of them you really did, did a lot of discussion around. So I did want to introduce the staff that, that are here today that um, you don't get to interact with them every meeting. Um, we have um, Ruth Fakili, one of our loan officers. Um, Deborah, you met Deborah, our credit officer. Um, next to her is Rose McAuliffe. Um, we were talking about asset management earlier. She just got reassigned to work with us um, to head up that asset management division. So some of those data queries that we were talking about, Rose, I hope you take, took notes on that. <laughs> um, and we have Cara Kunze, who is, um, does a lot of work around policy. And, and so when we're researching um, programs and products, he, he's, he's good with that. Um, did Sabrina, well, you met Sabrina earlier, and uh, she was here to talk about one of her particular deals, and then Steve Lyerly, is he? Oh, okay. Well, they got, the, they got some exposure earlier. 
Um, so I did want to talk a little bit about our current lending and this year and then uh, future. And uh, as I said, we talked about underwriting standards already. So first of all, the, the, who, are our, who are our borrowers? Um, we work with developers who are serving uh, pro or producing projects that target people 50 to 120 percent AMI and uh, traditionally more 50 and 60 uh, as we get into the missing middle and NOAA that's expanding out to a 120 is, is uh, happening more. Um, of course, we partner with HCD and, and Tax Credit Allocation Committee and SIDLAC um, and particularly HCD and the tax credit equity uh, tends to produce the subsidy that can target lower income. So they're in that below 50% AMI territory that we typically don't serve unless it's part of a larger project. Um, since, since 2014, since we've uh, ramped up the multifamily, we've done about a billion dollars worth of lending for about 100 units, six, 100 projects, 6,000 units, pretty evenly divided between north and south. Um, although it, it is primarily urban, we do probably less than 10 percent in rural places, and that's something I think we should be working on. Um, in terms of concentration, L.A. County had the highest number of projects at 20, um, followed by uh, San Diego with 10. Um, we, pr counties like Orange, Alameda, and Santa Clara had eight each. And then we're going down to the counties where we had one project each, like Shasta, and San Luis Obispo, and Santa Barbara. F for the current year, the kind of the product mix, you'll see that our, our largest uh, product type is the permanent takeout. And that's that's really a good thing. That's where we I think we need to be. That's our our uh, our sweet spot, if you will, um, followed by refinance loans. Um, as we again, as we were ramping up multifamily, there was a decision that uh, we should take advantage of opportunities to look at our existing portfolio and help them to recapitalize and refinance. So. That was our second highest lending to date, uh, followed by ACK Rehab, small loan. And then the conduit program separately uh, doesn't go on our books per se, but we've done 121 million this year to date. Um, and then MSHA, special needs, we're at about 15 million. So why do borrowers come to us? You heard our, our panelists this morning talk about our terms. The 40-year term is very attractive. Um, they also like the fact that we can be both a conduit and a lender. Um, and then the subsidy is something that, um, you know, we don't market because it's a very limited resource. But um, our repeat borrowers know that we have it and we've used it to fill gaps and to experiment with uh, missing middle and NOAA. So uh, it's, it's very much something that will become enhanced as we get into next year with the SB2 money becoming available. As you recall, we will have 15% uh, of the proceeds from the recording fee will come to us uh, beginning in 2019, and it's for the purpose of a missing middle program. So we'll be more public about having subsidy available to us, and, and we are working on program design, and in fact, uh, probably next month we'll be go out doing listening sessions with potential uh, borrowers and local partners to flesh out some of the program design issues around that program. Um, the rate advantage we, that we've enjoyed with the Federal Financing Bank program, as, as you know, is, is going away. Uh, but that was something that really was a competitive advantage for us. And we are uh, kind of in a new era as that program folds up or, you know, has not, re has not been renewed at the federal level. Um, but it, we enjoyed a 50 to 60 basis point um, discount from, uh, from what we could normally achieve on rate for our borrowers with that program. So that means we're in a new era of, you know, in a sense, maybe back to the future of uh, capital sources in terms of issuing bonds to raise the, the, the funding for our, uh, mm -hmm. our loans. 
is that a final? Is that just? Yeah. Well, Mr. Carson did write me a letter and said. Okay. He said no. <laughs> so many words. Yes. <laughs> Um, oh, I'll, sh I'll share the letter with the board no, members. Do. We're continuing to push for the extension of the program, but as it stands now, we were allotted 26 projects. We've committed those 26 projects. They've put in an additional 500 million to deal with pipeline projects nationwide, but they don't ex they don't want to extend the program past 2020, and so um, we'll continue to advocate, but. We're going to have to come up with some alternatives. Yeah, we have to sort of plan for the worst case scenario. Right. Um, so, reserves, I think you've probably want, heard enough about <laughs> reserves. Skip um, all that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping. Uh, uh, in the reserve discussion, we did talk about equity cash out. Um, uh, just very, very briefly, um, when we do look at an equity cash out, we, we, we only do it for performing projects. And we limit the, the, the loan to value at 80 percent. Where in other cases we'd go 90. Um, and then we we look at what are we going to get for providing the the additional financing, which is additional extended affordability. Um, and of course, if there's a uh, project-based subsidy involved, we're going to make sure that that is covered um, before before equity leaves the project. Uh, so. In terms of the rest of this year and into next year, um, mentioned the FFB going away. So we are, we have released new term sheets with, which reflect our current pricing. Um, still kind of testing the market to see how that will play out, but we, we continue to have a healthy pipeline. Um, but really, time will tell how that those increased fees, increased uh, interest rate spread is going to affect us. Um, we are starting to design and roll out of SP2, which, well, the rollout will be next year, but really in the design phase at this point, we'll be looking for public input. Uh, we're, with our financing uh, department, we're looking at new capital sources and partnerships. Um, you know, we, College of A is using the Federal Home Loan Bank right now as a source for the single family side, and we've been in active discussions with them about extending credit to us for the multifamily side. Uh, Freddie Mac, we've engaged in discussions with them about a program or a partnership, which probably would not look like us becoming a Freddie Mac lender, but rather helping um, them providing guarantees to bond issuances that we might, you know, maybe we could, uh, you know, in a, bundle up uh, loans that we make, wrap them with a Freddie guarantee, and, and get better pricing on the market. So that's something we're exploring. Um, I, I, something we're proposing for next year is to really increase our rural lending, um, figure out how we can be more uh, responsive in that market, and then, of course, uh, continued efficiencies in asset, asset management. We talked about that at the last board meeting, so we're going to continue on that, on that process. And that, is that quick enough for you? That's <laughs> and I want to I want to give a shout out to uh, Michael and the asset management team, and expressly Rose McCullough, and uh, who, uh, which is why she's temporarily assigned over to get help us with our policies and procedures. But you all recall that we had um, several um, findings in on the asset management side over a number of years, and we did bring in the org uh, uh, the consultant who then gave us a plan. We uh, initiated that plan. We've implemented that plan. They've come up with their policies and procedures, and they had that the policies and procedures completed by April 1st. And Rose kind of led that team and made sure that they were continuing to get those things done. So thank you, thank you very much. And so now she's going to help uh, 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 make sure that as now that they have those policies and procedures, making sure that those get implemented. So that's why she's going to be overseeing asset management or temporarily until we can get a deputy director to help Michael out. So I do want to give a shout out to Rosen for making sure that we're on the right track on our asset management side. Um, also, if you recall, uh, 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 Mr. Carter said for us to be looking on the multifamily side is one of his ideas that the college of a should look at it as multiple executions on the mul on the multifamily side and so um, Michael hit on a couple of those but we will be continuing to explore either partnerships with Freddie or Fannie uh, uh, federal home loan bank and looking at different executions on the multifamily side similar to how we've done on the single family side awesome. 
Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Michael. Before you leave, Michael, let's make sure we don't have any questions. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Too anxious to leave. Hey, hey great, presen <laughs> great presentation. Thank you. I totally support uh, Fannie Freddie. Home loan banking, that's absolutely the right place to go. I'm just curious about the sort of front end relationship building. I know you talked about uh, trying to increase the share of rural, so small small buildings continues to be an area. For me, that, that takes me right back around to relationship building in the CDFI space and, and trying to work to harness their uh, capacity, their business relationships, their uh, ab ability to deploy time bound, short term capital, um, and, the, and the ability of, of us to come in through Cali yeah. and be a takeout on that right we, we can you talk a little bit about what we're doing just from a sure. relationship perspective sure. are there specific cdfis where we we really are, are building um, out strategic relationships here what's 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 the opportunity set and what progress have we made we we have been reaching out to cdfis and as you know i come from a cdfi yes. so <laughs> exactly I, uh, I uh very comfortable with that concept and uh in particular um the the space where i think it, it, it would be particularly uh, effective is as we try to do these NOAAs and missing middles, mm -hmm. um, you know, as the market, the ability for us to deliver acquisition financing to a, a hot market, today's market is, is, we're not really able to do that quickly. So having partnerships with CDFIs that um, can be more nimble in terms of bringing that acquisition financing to the table um, is, is something that we did with our first NOAA product, uh, pro project. We did a, uh, a project called Inglewood in uh, Stockton, California, and the, the developer uh, working with us and Century Freeway, CDFI, um, Century provided the acquisition financing. We came in with subsidy financing at the time of acquisition, and then eventually our perm loan will come in when they've stabilized the project. So uh, Century's the one we've talked to. Um, we. In, in terms of the city of LA, we are creating a partnership with the city also around the NOAA program, and they've identified uh, Genesis LA as a potential partner in that effort. Um, we will be reaching out to other regional uh, CDFIs like NCCLF and, of course, the statewide ones like LIF and um, RCAC on the rural side um, and a national. CDFIs like LISC and Enterprise because they have a big presence here in California. But there's more work to do there for sure. Thank you. Any others? Okay. Thank you Thank now, you. Michael. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay. Anyone need a break? Yeah. That's why I thought so, huh? <laughs> Why don't we take a five-minute break before we move into the next session, which will be closed session. So let's get back here at 2.10. I'll give you three extra minutes. Okay. Oh, okay. Back? Now we're on the record. <laughs> I think every time my mic lights up, it should just be off the record. <laughs> There's a comment in that. Um, <laughs> let's welcome everyone back. Um, I think we had a very great, good session this, this morning into this afternoon. Um, we are now going to go into closed session to evaluate the performance of a public employee. Um, so unless, Tia, you have anything? Anything? We're going to close the session now. Thank you. Okay, we are back in session. The board heard the report from the Executive Evaluation Committee and would like to recommend a 3% increase to the Executive Director effective immediately or upon this date. So are you taking up item 9, which is the resolution 18-14? Thank you. A resolution 18-4? 14. 14. And so the board feels that a merit-based increase of salary by 3% effective this meeting.
No, the resolution is um, drafted as in a way has okay. a, as a percentage. You. But you do need a motion and a second. I've moved the item. Second. second. Can we show like a united second on it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's called the vote. Yeah, it's <laughs> called the vote. Well said. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded. Seconded. Roll call. Ms. Gallagher? Yes. Ms. Gunn? Mr. Hunter? Ms. Johnson Hall? Yes. Mr. Metcalf? Yes. Mr. Prince? Yes. Ms. Von Kuglieber? Yes. Ms. Sotello? Yes. Mr. Russell? Aye. And Mr. Gunning? Aye. Resolution 1814 passes. Good. Oh, thank you. Board thank members. You Thank, thank you, you for your you. confidence in me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Right. Um, item 10, reports. Is there anything we need to do with this here? If they're available, should anyone want to take a look at them? And if they have any questions, they can contact the staff associated with the report. Great. Is there any other items by other board members? <coughs> Is there any public testimony? Is there a motion to adjourn? <laughs> <laughs> so moved. moved and seconded. We're adjourned. Thank you, people. Thank you.